Hi, my name is Katherine Schroeder. I'm um, just wanting to introduce you all to the JOLT Symposium, Technology Innovation and Modern Lawyering. Um, a few tech reminders. So in the chat box to everyone is where you're going to be asking questions. We also have updated a lot of CLE materials over the past 24 hours. So at the beginning of each talk, I'm gonna be sharing those CLE materials with all of you so that you have what is most up to date. Um, and so before we get started with Mr. Sam Glover, I'm going to want to introduce Professor Jennifer Erickson at the Richmond School of Law to introduce and kick off the symposium. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. It is really my pleasure to welcome you to the Richmond Journal of Law and Technology's virtual symposium. So as many of you may know, this symposium was originally scheduled for March 27th. And I remember an in mid-March as the world was rapidly shutting down, talking with the editors at Jolt about what they planned to do. And it wasn't surprising to me or the rest of the faculty when the editors said, no problem, we can take it online. It doesn't surprise, didn't surprise me at all that this particular journal would rise to this particular challenge, but I am so very proud of what they've been able to put together over the last month. The topic of today's symposium, technology, innovation, and modern lawyering, is one that is near and dear to the hearts of those of us at Richmond Law. The faculty here recognizes the importance of training our students to be innovators when it comes to the law. We want our students to be prepared to think differently about how to deliver legal services and how to solve complex legal challenges. And we, when we say that we want these skills for our students, we're putting our money where our mouth is. Next month, we will launch a new signature program. I'm sorry, next year, we will launch a new signature program on legal innovation and entrepreneurship led by our new faculty director, Josh Kubicki, who will be joining us this summer. Through this program, we'll offer our students an array of courses and extracurricular events focused on what it means to be an innovative lawyer today. We see this symposium really as the start of our work in this important area. With that, I wanna introduce our first speaker. Sam Glover is the founder and editor-in-chief at Lawyerist.com. Through his work with Lawyerist, he helps lawyers understand the economic, demographic, and technological changes shaping the present and future of small firm legal practice. He's also the author of The Small Firm Roadmap, a survival guide to the future of your law practice. And he co-hosts the Lawyerist podcast, which I'll say personally was my first introduction to the world of innovative lawyering. His talk today is entitled, Moving a Small Firm into the Technology Age. Welcome, Sam. Hey, thanks everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, sorry, I was jumping in a little bit late because for all my tech savviness, uh, I did a bad job of keeping track of where the recording or the, uh, <laughs> the Zoom link was. So my bad, sorry about that. Um, I'm thrilled to be talking to people today and um, uh, and just just to be clear, um, I, if she hasn't gone over it, um, if there's if you want to use the chat or um, if you're able to ask questions, feel free to ask questions during my talk. Um, I may sort of leave them to the end, um, or or just answer them sort of in the course of when I get to that topic. But um, but I'd be happy to do that. Uh, you've uh, you've got in your materials to a collection of um, of materials from our website. Um, which are some of the pages that we put together to help lawyers who are um, finally trying to do some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, and by which I mean, we have the resources to help people go paperless, to go remote and all those sorts of things. And, and I've included some of those materials um, for you and hopefully that will be helpful. <clears throat> um, so this, this talk is kind of a, um, I've been giving a, a version of this talk for probably 13 years. And it's interesting to be giving it now in the way that I'm giving it now, um, because in some ways, uh, the trends that I want to talk about, the traits that I'm going to talk about are, um, have all of a sudden become more um, pressing and obvious to everyone. Uh, for example, uh, I feel like uh, when in, in 2005 is when I opened my solo practice, um, which I no longer have, but, um, but as part of opening that, I, I went paperless. Um, so whatever that is, six, 15, 16 years ago. Um, and then ever since then, I feel like I've been trying to 
persuade lawyers that they can go paperless and that's a real thing. And there's always all these objections and, and among them are, I don't have time. And, and now uh, everybody's doing it, obviously, because you have to, there's no, you don't have an option. Um, if you want to stay in business right now during the pandemic, you have to be able to function without shuff, pushing paper across the desk to your colleagues. Courts are finally going online. People are finally learning how to work from home. And so a lot of the but, but, but objections that I used to get are now off the table, which is refreshing. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to try to incorporate some of that, uh, some of that, the presentness into what I'm going to talk about today, because it, it definitely influences whether or not these feel like trends or whether or not they have arrived in everyone's mind. Um, because everyone can see some of these things as clearly as I can have been able to now. Um, so let's, let's start with that. Let's start with those, those trends in the background. Um, the, the first set of trends that I've identified, let's call them maybe meta trends, because they're sort of, um, they're trends that are in, in society, right? They're influencing the practice of law. And I think these were laid out better than I could by Jordan Furlong, who's, um, he tends to be focused more on, on large law firms and medium-sized law practice, um, that, that sort of more traditional big law. But he did a really amazing job of laying out the, the market pressures that are impacting the practice of law um, at all levels, I think. And so um, he identified three, and I'm, I'm going to touch on each of them briefly and try, I think some of these are uh, in, in the current circumstances have gotten interesting. So, um, so the first one he talked about is downward pressure on fees. And, and this started um, about 12 years ago. Am I doing math right? I think so. In, in about 2008, when the economy tanked, um, you know, in 9-11 happened, um, and there was sort of a succession of things leading up to, in 2008, what I think we call the Great Recession now. And um, which people of my age remember like it was yesterday, and um, those of you who are students, it feels like history, I'm sure. But, um, but what happened as a result of that is the economy kind of tanked, and the inf impact that it had on the legal profession were, was pretty profound, actually. And, and ever since 2008, it feels like we've been sort of been on a ride on the from the consequences of that. And, and that's where these three things come from. And the, and the first one is very obvious, which is downward pressure on fees. And initially the downward pressure on fees was primarily because people didn't have so much money. <clears throat> and by people, I mean corporations in this case as well, um, all kinds of baggage on that. But, um, but and, and what we saw as a result of that was a number of other changes as well. But the bottom line was people were looking at their legal spend, whether it's for their whether they're considering getting a divorce or they're looking at what they're paying their corporate counsel and they're saying, you know what, why do we treat this special? Why do we treat this different from the other ways we spend money? Um, you know, com corporations started looking for ways to um, inject efficiency into their legal spend. Um, <laughs> uh, couples started looking at things like collaborative mediation. And in general, people just wanted to spend less on legal. So, um, so there, there's been downward pressure on fees across the board, and it's kind of continued since then. People wanted, um, people just wanted to pay less, and and it's related to the two other meta trends. Um, the second of which is changed consumer expectations, and I'm not going to recite the litany of technological marvels that often comes here. So just insert you know, iPhones, Amazon, blah, 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 Uber, blah, blah, blah. But some, some in the law have generally behaved as if those don't, that were special and they don't apply to us. But in a world where you are used to doing so many things at the click of a button, through the phone, having things delivered, sound familiar, um, law really stood out as being unwilling to go down that road. And what I think lawyers maybe are less aware of is what was fueling a lot of the technologies that we now take for granted. Uh, there's, there was a great, I, I can't remember if it was Seth Godin or Clay Shirky or who, but somebody gave a great presentation about how technology doesn't really become interesting until it becomes boring. 
And I was just, um, <laughs> I was actually just working on a chapter for, um, with a company that's doing a book on artificial intelligence and the law. Um, and I was trying to explain this to them that especially when it comes to small firms, small firms are very pragmatic. And um, the phone, the weird, <laughs> the weird zoom background is blocking out my phone. But like the phone is, is now really interesting and transformative because it's boring. We all have one. Um, so for example, we can definitively say that aliens have never visited Earth, right? Because everyone is carrying around a record keeping device at all times. And um, if, if you had been visited by aliens, the very first thing you would do is pull out your phone and take a video or take a picture, right? So, um, so we know that aliens haven't visited Earth. We can, we can now profoundly, we, we can easily answer a question that has bedeviled humanity for, for generations. Um, and, and in all, all sorts of other ways, right? Google is, in, in most ways, some of the most advanced artificial intelligence technology um, that we have, and the Google search algorithm is. And we all use it every day and it's fairly boring and it's completely transformed the way we do everything. It is a, a massive answer machine. So we expect that kind of stuff to be normal today, right? We expect amazing stuff to be boring. And yet in law, there hasn't been much changed there, right? You still do, do law in almost the exact same way um, you, you still engage with your lawyers in almost the exact same way that you have for generations. Um, and the present circumstances are obviously an exception. Everyone is learning different. Um, and, and some people are really excited about this. In our lab, um, one of our lab members, um, this is our, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want it to sound like a sales pitch, but we have like this premium community of, um, of lawyers who we we do one-on-one -on -one coaching with, and we have a curriculum for them, and, and we do peer masterminding and stuff. And so we know, we know their practice pretty well, is my point. And several of them are like, you know, I, I got rid of my lease, or I'm letting my lease expire. I love working from home. Um, we've figured out how to be so efficient, we're never going back, um, which is cool, um, because we're all being forced to try these things right now. And I, I think, I forget the exact number, but there's some numbers that every time there's a massive societal shift like this, um, about five to ten percent of people will decide they like it better and won't ever go back. And so, both on the consumer side and on the lawyer side, um, this may be finally we may be finally changing so that the way lawyers are are doing business is getting closer to what consumers expect. Um, I kind of stopped in the middle of the thought, but what was fueling a lot of these technologies is that um, the way technology is built and designed is built around the idea of a customer-centered um, design. You, you may have heard client-focused design or client-centered design or customer-centered design, whatever. You, you're, you're trying to build products in the way that people um, need, want, or expect them, not in the way that benefits you. And so apply this to law. Um, let's say you wanna meet with a lawyer. What do you do? You, you call them during their business hours, during the lawyer's business hours. Um, you go during their business hours to their office, wherever they've chosen to locate it. Um, you have to pay for parking at their office. You have to go up and wait in their waiting room and read their boring bar magazines um, while you wait for them to be ready for you. And then you go into their intimidating office across their oak desk and blah, blah, blah. Consider how you deal with everything else, right? Amazon doesn't ask you to do anything other than click a few buttons and then they drop it off on your doorstep. Um, Uber just shows up and they don't even take your, you know, you don't even have to exchange a credit card with them. Nobody's using Uber, or Uber right now, but, um, but so it goes. Um, and so I think um, when, you, when you consider how almost everything in our lives work, that, that we do transactionally works versus the way people deal with lawyers, there's been a real disconnect. Um, right now, we are in this weird phase where um, everyone is doing things in the exact same way with everyone, right? We're all on Zoom. We're all getting things delivered. Nobody is doing face-to-face -face stuff. And so it's forcing lawyers to try this. Um, and yeah, some lawyers are having fewer clients, but those who are not having fewer clients right now, those who are just riding this out or even figuring out ways to take advantage of the present circumstances um, are discovering that there's other ways to do things and that they can get closer to aligning consumer. Their, their practices and the way they do things with consumer expectations. And then the third major meta trend is the rise of lawyer alternatives. This is something lawyers hate to talk about. 
we treat lawyer alternatives like the boogeyman. But let me start with one that we don't often think about as a lawyer alternative. And so back in 2008, um, the economy crashes, corporations start thinking about legal spend as just another expense item that they wanna try and minimize. And they, you know, you know what a great solution is? Let's start bringing the lawyers in house. And this has happened across big law, right? You, um, if you're 3M, you realize, you know what, we're gonna take, um, we're gonna take all of this outside counsel that we've been hiring for so long, and we're gonna bring them in. And now um, we have an alternative to a lawyer. That's one way to think about lawyer alternatives. There, nobody's hiring, corporations don't need to hire a lawyer if they have that work being done in-house. And that's happened a lot. The flip side is, and this is where lawyers really get upset about thinking about lawyer alternatives is if you're at the consumer level, obviously. Um, and if you're at the consumer level, um, you have access to Google. You have access to things like tools like LegalZoom and Rocket Lawyer. You have access to Craigslist and things like, and Avo questions and answers and things like that. Here's the thing, as lawyers, we immediately go to, but those aren't any good, which is true, right? A lot of those are terrible options and taking that advice is just going to get you into trouble. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter in the sense that if somebody has solved their problem with an alternative to a lawyer, then they don't need a lawyer. They're out of this marketplace. And some lawyers say, yeah, but we've got a monopoly. Screw that. We, I mean, yeah, fine. It's, it's a meaningless monopoly at this point, um, or it should be. Um, and the, so the reality is people just have alternatives to lawyers. Here's a, a fascinating way to think about the practice of law that um, ha blew my mind when I heard it. And I feel like it probably, um, maybe it's so mind blowing that we don't talk about it just because, um, because we don't know what to do with it. But we, we, those of us who are in law think this is law, right? If you have a legal problem, you have to engage with this. This being courts and lawyers and negotiations. And we're even willing to say like, you know, we don't like legal zoom very much, but that's law. But the reality is that, um, of the people who have a civil legal problem, only 20% of them get involved with courts and lawyers in order to solve it. So in, in the market, the, the healthy market leading, before the pandemic happened, lawyers were one of the least popular ways to solve legal problems, which blew my mind when I heard it from Rebecca Sandifer, who's a researcher and a professor of law, no, uh, not, not a professor of law, I think she's a sociologist um, um, who works with the ABA on trying to understand the access to justice gap. And um, she did, she's done some really big studies of civil legal needs. And, um, and this, is, this is what she's come up with. And, and sure, some of those civil legal needs are the kinds of things where you would just go talk to your neighbor and solve the problem. But not all of them are. Like there is a surprising number of problems where people are like, got hit by a car and just deal with it. Um, we are the least popular way to solve legal problems, which I think is not how we normally think about what it means to be a lawyer or be involved in the legal system. So downward pressure on fees, change consumer expectations, the rise of lawyer alternatives are kind of the meta trends that Jordan Furlong outlined. And I've tried to, tried to connect those up a little bit to where we are today, because who knows how much longer this thing goes on, maybe a while in the likelihood that this leaves lasting impressions on, on our market and our economy and our lives is quite high as well. At Lawyerist, um, when we put together the book, The Small Firm Roadmap, um, we started thinking about, okay, um, we, loved, we loved Jordan's book, um, and, uh, um, and we, but we also wanted to say, okay, but what are some more of like the, the, the trends that we see that are lower level trends, more granular, you know, like day-to-day -day pra practical trends that are shaping the legal profession? Um, and so we came up with another five trends that we think are more, um, a little more sort of, I don't know, tactile trends. I don't know, like the, this, whatever. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what they are. <laughs> um, the first is demographics. Um, demographics in a number of different ways. Um, but one of probably the most obvious ones is law is by and large a profession of people who look like me, right? Um, Middle-aged or older white guys. That is, that is largely who constitutes the, the legal profession, which is 
weird, right? That's, a, that's actually a profoundly weird thing because uh, the majority of law school students for years now have been women, slight, a slight majority. Um, half of the people in the world are women and there's no reason why law should be so skewed towards old white guys, but it is, but it's changing. If you look at the demographic trends over time, that's changing. And so if your firm is a bunch of old white guys as partners, you are looking increasingly anachronistic. And if you're going to be building a firm that doesn't look like any of the people it serves, then that's probably going to cause you to have a lot of blind spots when it comes to your strategy. And it's probably gonna make you not very attractive to the people you're trying to serve. But both in the profession and in the, in the world, um, demographics are changing in a way that law firms need to be at least thinking about. Do you have a strategy for making sure, like, I believe strongly that diversity, inclusion, and accessibility are important things for a number of reasons. Um, but one of the reasons why they're important is that you cannot be competitive if everyone at your firm has the same viewpoint because they all were raised in similar backgrounds. You just can't. It's you'll you have massive blind spots when it comes to marketing strategy, when it comes to pricing strategy, when it comes to a litigation strategy. Demographics are important to, for all of those things. So demographics is the first trend that we've identified that we think firms need to be thinking about. The second is economics. When I when I used to talk about this, I would say um, since 2008, the U.S. has been largely in free of recession, and that means we're due. It's one of the longest. So that that spread was one of the longest recession-free periods in U.S. history. Not anymore, obviously. Um, it'll be interesting to see, um, is this the kind of recession that um, we just spring back out of and the world all goes back to normal or not? I, I suspect not. And I think sensible people um, are mostly in agreement that this is going to, the pandemic and the change in, like, like lots of the jobs will reopen. Um, but there are going to be massive reverberations over the next years and decades, potentially, as a result of this. Um, so that's one of the things. But, um, but another thing to think about when it comes to the reason why economics is a trend worth paying attention to is um, you've probably seen these charts, but the way wealth is distributed in the United States means um, that the middle class is shrinking and the middle class the reason that this is important like i'm 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 probably in the category of people you'd call a social justice person anyway but um the reason this is important for um for your profession for your practice whatever it might be is that the middle class is by and large the legal market right those are people who can afford to pay lawyers and so when it comes to thinking about the access to justice gap um we normally define the people the gap as people who are um, who can't afford a lawyer, right? Who are and and are above the threshold for filing uh, or for getting legal aid help, even though you know eighty percent of them don't actually get the help they need because legal aid is so underfunded. Um, and so the the number of people who can afford legal services is obviously shrinking as wealth moves out, well moves up um, and out of the middle class, and more and more people are either impoverished or um, or just fall into that category of people who don't we don't think probably can hire a lawyer, don't have enough savings, money, whatever, to hire a lawyer when they need one. Um, so how do you appeal um, when the number of people who can afford your services are fewer and fewer? How do you change the way you practice in order to meet those needs and still make a profit, if you're in a for-profit practice at least? Um, the third is climate change. Um, in a weird way, the pandemic is kind of an example of how this might play out, even though it has absolutely nothing to do with climate change, as far as I can tell. Um, I live in Minnesota. It is not apparent from my cartoon background, but um, uh, I decided to embrace Zoom backgrounds and not even try to fake that I'm in an office. Um, but uh, but last winter in Minnesota, because of the spikiness um, of our weather related to climate change, um, there were weeks at a time where none of us could go into the office. And we, we had an office. We, we have still have an office, I guess. We're, we're moving out because we've always been fairly remote and remote capable in any way, and some, lots of us are remote, have always been remote, but, but there would be weeks at a time where we just, commuting was not a good option because it would take us an hour and a half to get into work, even though it's 15 minutes away, 
it would take us an hour and a half to get home. And so why spend half the day in the car and risk accidents and getting stuck when I can just work from home and be fine? Well, the pandemic is a great litmus test for things like that because that those are just going to increase, right? As climate change worsens or increases, however you want to describe that, um, we are just going to have more and more episodes where our lives are disrupted in ways, our work lives are disrupted, and our ability to serve clients is disrupted in ways like that. Um, if you live on the coasts, there's the, you know, California's on fire most of the time, um, seasonally. Uh, Florida is is either in North Carolina or whatever, are um, evacuating for hurricanes or underwater from floods half the time, um, it seems like. And so you might as well take that into your business planning. <laughs> um, the fourth thing uh, is the nature of employment. Uh, we've seen this shift right now. Um, well, <laughs> the nature of unemployment right now, right? 22, 24, whatever million people are out of work right now. And that's only the people who managed to get through all the state's terrible websites for filing unemployment claims. It's just going to keep coming for a while, I think. Um, but even before that, right, the economy was transitioning to um, the employment economy was transitioning to a place where a, a huge number of people are mostly employed in gig work. And this does happen in law too. Um, lots of firms of all sizes have always used contract lawyers. Like big firms have used it for contract lawyers for document review. Small firms have had less access to it until recent years where services like say Law Clerk, um, that name sounds generic when I say it to a bunch of um, people who probably have different experiences with law clerk. The name of the company is Law Clerk, and what it does is it connects lawyers who have, um, who want to sell their time to lawyers who want to buy their time. And so, like, if I have expertise in uh, appellate work, and another lawyer has an appellate case and they need help with it, then they can ask for my help um, and pay me, uh, a, pay me whatever my contract rate is, um, mark it up to their clients, and essentially expand their firm on demand. And that's then that's sort of gig work for lawyers. Um, we're also seeing much more part-time work. Uh, this is, I don't know, you, if you don't know the inner workings of our company, you probably wouldn't know this, but Lawyerist has grown largely as a result of um, people who have great skills, but have decided to stay home to take care of kids. Um, and so they don't want to commit full-time and they don't want to come into an office and commute. And so, um, the parents who've come to work for us have these have amazing skills that we are able to take advantage of because we are willing to be flexible on things like location um, and time commitment. And companies that are willing to take advantage of that will find themselves with huge potential that they don't necessarily have when you insist on um, people showing up full time in the office every day. Um, and then fifth is, I, I've mentioned it already once, but it's kind of an obvious one is AI, artificial intelligence. Um, and I don't mean robot lawyers, just to be clear. I love talking about robots and robot lawyers and technology generally, um, but I don't think that lo robot lawyers are a real threat. Um, but AI is super important and transformative, and um, the biz there's an easy business model for every technology right now, which is just to strap some AI onto the back end of it and see what happens. Um, and that sounds like I'm being goofy, but it's true. Like. AI is transformative, right? Why, why, why make decisions for your software when you can just ask the software what the right decision is? And so um, we're seeing that, we've, we've been seeing that for a while now in all kinds of technology, but it's beginning to come to legal technology as well. And um, a great example of it is case text. Um, I disclaimer, I'm an advisor to case text, but, um, but their CARA tool is an amazing tool um, where, if you've got, if you want to start drafting a brief, just upload your opponent's brief into case into Kara, and it will spit out a list of the cases that you should be paying attention to. Um, I think they're even working on a way for it to like pre-draft a brief for you, um, which Ross, the Canadian legal research company, will already do too. Um, you can plug a brief into Ross, and it will spit out um, sort of a draft of the legal section of your reply brief. Um, this is neat, cool stuff. And right now it's pretty cutting edge and it doesn't always work great, but it's just going to get better until it gets boring and then we'll all be used to using it. Um, one of the one of the company that I'm working on this book about AI with is Kira Systems. And Kira Systems, um, uh, Noah and I were having a, 
conversation years ago, a few years ago, where he was showing me kind of what things can do. Um, or maybe it was maybe it was one of their competitors. Maybe it was Lex, Lex Machina. Um, I think it was Lex Machina. And he was showing me like, so let's say you're doing a huge document review and you need to find all your choice of law provisions across thousands of documents. And so he clicks a button and, and it generates a report that shows me all the choice of law provisions across thousands of documents. Um, I was like, yeah, okay. I mean, I'm used to Google doing that all the time. If I want to know the choice of law provisions across every website, you know, end user license agreement, I can just find that on Google. So I'm used to that. But then after a minute, I realized, you know, the way law firms are getting this information right now. This looks like, like my, there we go. <laughs> um, the, way, the way law firms are getting that information right now is they employ an army of contract lawyers to review documents one at a time. So if I want to know what all the choice of law provisions are, um, I have to go down to HR and we hire a bunch of document review lawyers and they spend three months um, going through thousands of documents. And at the end of it, I get the same report. And so it, it was, I'm totally, you know, it's boring. I'm used to clicking a button and getting an answer, um, but that was transformative. And that is an, those are a couple of examples of how AI is going to sneak into the legal profession and change probably everything. Um, you know, cause, cause that one tool means now you no longer need dozens of contract lawyers to, to find out your choice of law provisions, which is huge. It, his estimate was that it does away with about two thirds of your document review army. Um, if you're a big firm and if you're a small firm, it'll be useful once you don't need any of that document review army. So those are the five trends, demographics, economics, climate change, employment, the nature of employment, and AI that we've identified. So we're about halfway through. We've talked about the meta trends, the, the big kind of, the big thematic trends that are shaping all of the economy and the market that also impact lawyers. Um, and then some more granular trends that are definitely specifically impacting legal businesses. And now I wanna talk about, okay, so here we are in a place in a pandemic where, um, in a place where, we're, where there is a pandemic that we're all dealing with and we need to figure out, okay, so what do we need to do? And this is a pretty, this is obviously a pretty pressing concern for just about everyone right now is everything changed and now I've got to try and figure out how to adapt to my practice. How do I keep practicing? There are definitely firms that have just given up and they're just on pause right now. Um, I don't, that's not a plan. That's not a strategy. Um, there's definitely no need to do that. It's not like people are gonna have fewer legal needs right now when their lives are being ridiculously disrupted by everything. Um, there's still plenty of need and, and lots of people need help and they need reassurance that you're on it and that you can handle this. Um, but in order to build a business, a law firm business, I usually say this at the outset, but I didn't, but, um, I have no patience for the argument that law is a profession, not a business. Um, it is both. And if you consider like, if you look at, uh, if any of you have ever been to an ethics CLE where they talk about what are the most common ethics complaints that the ethics board gets, they're things like, my lawyer doesn't talk to me enough, um, my bills are all screwed up, um, or um, trust fund problems, you know, misappropriation of trust funds. Um, none of those are legal problems, right? None of those require legal thinking. Those are all business problems that lawyers, and the fact that lawyers are bad at business is why these things are problems for them. Um, you have to be a good business person as well as a good lawyer, as well as a good manager um, in order to practice law. And I just don't, so I don't have much patience for the argument that it's a profession, not a business. If you treat it that way, you're probably not a very good lawyer, um, unless you don't have to run a firm or you don't have a role to play in running a firm. And if that's the way you're thinking, then you can be an associate forever. Um, and that's fine if that's what you are good at. And there's no, like I, the way I said that made it sound like maybe that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's a perfectly fine thing. Um, but for lawyers who want to be partners, you need to be thinking like a business owner. So anyway, and, you, and right now you're probably thinking about, okay, so, so what do we do? How do we stay afloat through the pandemic and are there, I think if you're really thinking smart, you should be thinking about, okay, so we have a strong incentive to make changes to our firm right now. And if you're the kind of person who's been pushing for changes to your firm right now, you, now you've got the headroom, right? You've got the will to make changes. You've got a lot of, um, 
you're going to you're going to meet more tolerance to change right now than you probably will at any other point. So what changes should you make? <clears throat> what should you be doing? Uh, we tend to focus on the the tactics, right? The the bottom level stuff like well, we need to go paperless. We need to be able to function remotely. By now, you've probably figured how to do some of those things. <laughs> but simply learning how to operate Zoom does not make your firm a healthy remote workplace. Um, simply learning how to operate a scanner does not make you paperless. Um, so I'm going to talk more about the, the, the changes you need to make to the way the firm operates, not technology. Um, this is a flaw in the way I think a lot of lawyers think they're like, I need law practice management software. And the way I respond, you know, what should I get? And the way I respond is usually annoying, I think, to lawyers, but it's, well, what are you trying to accomplish? Like, why do you think you need it? What is the problem you're trying to solve? The work I do is mostly design now, not lawyer lawyering, but I think design is just the, the exact same thing as thinking like a lawyer and thinking like a designer um, is right there. They're, they're almost identical things. Um, it's just one is applied to problems, different kinds of problem solving. The other is applied only to legal problems. And I wish lawyers would expand their idea of thinking like a lawyer to all kinds of problems because it would make us all better at what we do. Um, so I think the firms that are open to making these changes are, or, or have made these changes, firms that look like what I'm about to describe are the firms that, this is the difference between firms that are optimistic right now and firms that are giving up or failing. Um, because I don't, I don't think you can just put your practice on hold right now and survive unless you've done very well beforehand and you realistically think that you can just pick up right where you left off in a few months or year. That feels unrealistic to me, but maybe that's the plan some lawyers are operating under, I don't know. Um, but obviously you can't just keep up with business as usual. If you've been operating a traditional law practice, um, it doesn't work right now. And so you have to make some changes. And, and so here's what, here are the changes that I would suggest firms need to be thinking about right now. Um, We've identified six. When you write books, you have to come up with numbers of things, lists of things. Um, we did not try to shoehorn this into six. We just, these were the six trends, or the six traits that we came up with. Um, uh, we call the first one being intentional, uh, which feels kind of woo woo stuff. I am not a woo woo person, um, but I really like this trait because it is, it means just deciding why you're doing what you're doing and then doing it. Right. I, I think um, I think one of the one of the problems with when lawyers go out and start hang a shingle, start a small firm, is that they um, they just sort of copy the existing business model, and and then months or years later they find themselves feeling like they're just sort of spinning their wheels. Um, I just work more and more and more, and I don't seem to be able to make more profit. Um, I was there at one point, and I think many lawyers probably have been. Um, and one of the ways out of this is just deciding what do you want your firm to look like? What do you want your practice to look like? What do you want, um, what do you want today to look like, right? And, and deciding what you want to do before you do it and what you expect the outcome is going to be before you do it. Um, and, and by doing that, your firm will have, it will begin to take shape in the way that you want it to rather than just the natural way that it does. So just I guess I'm, maybe I'm trying to make that sound like it's more, it's, it's actually not all that profound, right? It's just like, think about what you're doing and then do it. That's what intentional is. Um, second is entrepreneurial. Um, what defines entrepreneurism, entrepreneurship is taking risks, right? Um, and lawyers do not do this, <laughs> not naturally, right? We are, we are always thinking about what can go wrong and trying to avoid it. Um, this does not mean, mean being risky, that's different. Um, but it means like gambling on some things, right? You know, I think, I think if I do this, it will be better for my clients is, is deciding to take on a type of risk because there's a risk that you'll be wrong and it will be worse for your clients. But I can, there is absolutely no risk in staying the course, right? Operating your business, I can guarantee you that if you continue to operate your business as it is now, nothing will change. And if you aren't happy with it right now, as many, many lawyers aren't, 
um, and or or if, if you're in in a world where you can't do things the way you've been doing them, then then that's going to be a disaster. So, um, being thinking of yourself as an entrepreneur is just a really important mental shift that I think many lawyers need to make. If you have an equity interest in a firm, you need to be thinking about yourself as an entrepreneur because that is the role that you have. Um, your your partner your partnership is not merely your permission to take profits away from the firm. That is, you own a, you own a company, right? And so you need to be an entrepreneur with it. Um, for people who uh, are, well, number three is being empathetic. Um, and those who um, have had some exposure to design thinking are gonna be familiar with this, but um, understanding your clients, both in a, in a legal dispute or a legal matter, a legal negotiation, whatever, and in, in, in the large sense, understanding who your clients are, what they need, um, how to talk to them, how to, how to serve them um, is really, really critical. You know, I talked about um, client-centered, client-focused design. Um, that's something I care about a lot and I think is part of the key to building firms um, that are healthier for the lawyers, but also more attractive to clients. And this isn't a marketing exercise, this is a design exercise where you're actually trying to build a better firm that does things in a way that clients are happier to pay for. Um, the fourth trait is being self-aware. And this is one I think is really important to get to. Um, I observed on Twitter the other day, something that's been bugging me for a while, which is in, in the world of legal tech, which some of you may not be all that exposed to yet, but in the world of legal tech, um, one of the most popular marketing messages is that this software or this whatever it is, this gizmo, um, will help you get back to what you do best, practicing law. Which is very attractive to lawyers who just want to get back to what they're doing best. They do best, practice law. But also, I find it extremely problematic because legal tech is bought and sold usually by the owner of the firm, in the small firm world at least. And the owner of the firm is somebody who should be the CEO of the firm, right? Somebody needs to be deciding on the strategy for this law firm, which is a business. Somebody needs to be making decisions about um, what is the appropriate level of data security for our client information. Are we going to go paperless? Are we going to be remote? And somebody needs to be making those decisions and guiding those projects. If the firm is bigger, there may be a team of people, right? Those decisions aren't all made by the leader, but Somebody needs to be in charge of those decisions. Somebody needs to be in charge of the company as a company. And if the message is get back to what you do best practice law, who is running the ship? Who's steering the ship? And so when I say self-awareness, it's understanding what is your role in the company? And is that a role you're comfortable with? This is one of the first things we do with a lot of the lawyers who join lab or want to, is we talk to them. We talk them through this, like, do you want to own a company? Because if the answer is no, stop owning a company, right? Go work for somebody else. Um, because if you don't want to own a company, you're going to be bad at it. Unless you really decide that, no, I can get my head around owning a company and I can enjoy it. And that's, yeah, I want to. It's the same way, like people who start their solo practices out of desperation rarely succeed because they haven't committed to it. They're not, they're not both, you know, they're not all in, they're just half-assing it and you have to full asset in order to make it work. Um, so that, that level of self-awareness of what is the role that I'm best at? Like I, I've gone through a number of phases. I realized while running a firm that running the firm was the role I was best at, but at a firm of the size that I had was sort of problematic because like somebody else needed to do the work. I'm really good at legal writing and arguments as well, um, but somebody needs to like do the management aspect of the firm and I'm, that was not my forte. And that's one of the reasons why I wound up doing lawyers because I love, um, I love those pieces of it. And now I do more, you know, coding and, and podcast hosting than, um, than running, running lawyers because those are skills that are, I'm good at and that I like doing. Um, having that awareness of what you're good at and what you should be doing is a really important piece. Um, the fifth one is being adaptable, which um, feels like duh at the moment. Um, <laughs> The, frust the thing that is sometimes frustrating to me is um, now everybody gets it, right? The world has changed. We're all being forced to adapt. But there have been amazingly good reasons to adapt for over a decade at least now. 
And for some reason, most firms aren't adapting. Adaption, being adaptable is the way to gain a competitive advantage. It's the way to make sure that you're the most successful, you know, divorce lawyer, business lawyer, personal injury lawyer in your, in your small market. Um, and that adaptability is really key. And it, it's what I think it's one of the large things that has defined the attitude of lawyers um, going into the pandemic. And if you are the kind of lawyer who's adaptable, you welcome the opportunity to change. Right. I know lawyers who are like, you know, my unavoidably my business is slowing down because I'm, you know, m people just aren't calling. And I'm grateful for this chance to work on my business because it gives me more time to do the kind of thing I want that I need to, you know, to do the business thinking, the strategic thinking and make the changes that we need to make. <clears throat> and there are lawyers who are just like, I can't do things the way I've been doing them. So I'm not going to do anything, which is just giving up. And that's no good. Um, it's you, you have to be adaptable. I don't know how you're going to survive the pandemic if you're not, but I also don't know how you're going to be competitive if you aren't adaptable. And I think, um, I think, you know, this plays out all the time. And when people look at it, they're like, yeah, but, you know, traditional firms are doing just fine. Yeah, sort of like, I don't think the law disrupts all at once. And neither did Blockbuster, by the way, like Blockbuster didn't go out of business all at once, Blockbuster went out of business gradually over a period of years as more and more people shifted to Netflix. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's slowly and then suddenly, that's how disruption happens. Um, I don't know if law is ever gonna have that sudden spike at the end. I, I'm, not, I'm, not that, I'm not an advocate for that idea, but, but what I do know is that law changes gradually. And firms that are, that are not adaptable and that are traditionally minded are constantly going out of business while firms that are more adaptable and less traditionally minded are coming up. And so, yeah, there are always going to be, not always, but for a while, there are always gonna be firms that think that the way that things have been always done are gonna be okay. And there's gonna be sort of a constant current of change in the industry. And I think what's gonna happen, I think what's likely to happen as a result of the pandemic is there will be more of a shift where we come out the other end. And I think there'll be very few firms that are, that look as traditional as they did on the other end of the pandemic, we'll see. And number six is you have to be tech enabled. I don't, I do not support the idea that you should adopt technology just for the sake of technology. Like in writing this, in writing this book chapter about AI, um, the idea of an AI strategy came up. And I think it's great to recognize that AI is going to be the kind of thing that transforms the world and that you need to understand how it might impact your firm and what you might do about it. But what I, I think it, the idea that you should have an AI strategy at your big firm carries with it the assumption that like AI is just good technology that you should adopt. And I, I reject that. Technology has to prove itself, right? It has to have a practical use. You don't, you don't seek out opportunities to use technology just because it's fun, although I'm kind of a person who does that. Um, but that's not sound business strategy, right? Sound business strategy is figuring out what is the problem that you need to solve that technology can solve for you. And, and when you approach it in that careful way, in that pragmatic way, you have, you're going to find that you have to be tech enabled because there are no non, there are no good non-tech solutions to a lot of the problems you have. Um, right now is a great example. I, I, I can imagine a firm that continues to function primarily with phone calls and emails and paper, right? You just allow extra time for things to get through the mail. You do conference calls, you maybe use email, <laughs> you know, to stay in touch. Like, but that firm is going to be, feel so clunky and hard to work with compared to a firm that is able to FaceTime and Zoom and use email and chat and, um, and shuffle paperless documents around, right? And do, on the, do e-signing and things like that. Like the difference is gonna be so massive that it's hard for me to imagine you could be competitive with that, with that non-tech enabled uh, approach. So you, have, you just have to be tech enabled. Um, I, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's a good way around that. So, so those, those are the six traits that we've identified. You have to be intentional, entrepreneurial, empathetic, self-aware, adaptable, and tech enabled due to the weirdness of Zoom. There, there you can see most of my fingers. Um, so those are the six traits we've identified. Um, 
I think my time is almost up, but I think I have a few, a little time for questions. Um, I know Zoom has a tool for asking questions. I don't know if it's been turned on or enabled, but um, but if people have questions, um, I'd be happy to address them. Um, while while folks are figuring out how to ask questions or whether or not to do that, I'll just say, um, because I dropped in towards the end there, um, I didn't hear my own introduction, which is totally fine. Um, but I've been doing lawyerist for, uh, I'll just say a little bit about, about who I am and what I do now, just because I think when I get introduced, it often tends towards things that I used to do. Um, and I, I think it's interesting for people to understand maybe that um, as a podcast host, that is the main point of contact that I have with the legal industry right now, right? I'm not, I don't practice law anymore, just for the record. Um, and day-to-day -day work that I do is either the podcast or coding. And what I think is great about the podcast is, um, and why, um, why I've enjoyed it is one of, that I, I used to do something that I think everyone should do, which is I would have coffee with as many people, as many lawyers as I could, and just pump them for information. And that's what we've done with the podcast too. Uh, just because it's a popular podcast, I get to have those conversations with um, bigger names than I would otherwise. And I, I think this is something that just about everyone should do is um, learn as much as you possibly can. You know, I, I get the sense that people come to one of my presentations and they either get inspired or they get pissed off um, and then they go home and that's it. But have more conversations about this stuff. What are your colleagues doing? Get on, get on a Zoom chat with them and have coffee over Zoom and, and ask them real questions and try to get to the bottom of what's working for them in their practice and what's not. That's what I've always wanted to know, what's working and what's not in your practice. Um, and I think that one of the best ways to do that is by talking with other people. And one of the best ways to solve the problems that you're facing in your firm is to, is to get that meeting of the minds with other lawyers. Um, I, hate, I hate the term mastermind, but I think the concept is really powerful of having a group of other business le leaders that, can, that, that help you solve problems in your business. Um, most lawyers have colleagues that can help them solve legal problems in their law practice. Um, but I think it's really important for you to have somebody who you can go to and talk about business problems. And that's one of the things that we've provided at lab. That's one of the things we do now. That's where I started with. So um, we try to bring together both um, lawyers who join Insider, our, our, our free community, um, and then we bring them together in a group where they can bounce ideas off each other, ask questions. And then we have lab where we work with lawyers um, who want that help you know, who want to take their practices to the next level. And as a piece of that, they want access to the brains of other lawyers who are thinking similar about that. Um, we, one of the things we found that's really, really profound, and, and maybe this will resonate with some of you, is that when you take ideas to your local groups um, and you say, you know, I've really been thinking about doing subscription fees, or I wonder about going paperless. You just get people saying, but I don't see how you can do that. But, you know, ethics. Lawyers tend to, ethics are really important and being an ethical lawyer and complying with the rules is really important, but lawyers have a tendency to just say ethics as if it were a boogeyman that just shoot, to, to shoot down ideas with. And, um, and I think what, one of the things we found when we started doing our TVD law conference, which is what sort of morphed into the lab community and our lab con conference, is that there's a, there's a real power in, um, in having access to other people who are not those kinds of naysayers. And that's the kind of community that we've tried to bring together. And so if you feel like you've been missing that in your life then, um, and in your practice, then you might find, you might find a home with us. Um, so check out Lawyerist. If you've never been to Lawyerist before, I think it's worth checking out. Um, there's the address on the shirt. Um, and uh, you'll find all kinds of information there. There's a ton of free stuff. There's a ton of, and then there's some other stuff that you might be interested in as well. So I'll leave it there. I think that is the end of my time. Um, Thanks everyone. This is weird because no, nobody can like smile back at me. I can't tell if your heads are all down or not, but thank you. <laughs> there you thank go. Thank <laughs> you so much, Mr. Glover. <laughs> yep. So we are just gonna be waiting on Ms. Bassley to join. Um, if anyone has a question for Mr. Glover, feel free to go ahead and ch chat right I'm now while we're waiting on Ms. Bassley for a couple here. minutes, but um, we will I'm introduce here. her once she signs on to the Zoom meeting. Lucy, um, Miss Bassley here. I can see her. <laughs> he can see me. <laughs> Hi, 
time has passed. So sorry about that. <laughs> oh, don't worry. And also, um, before you start, sorry, this is Carl. I'm the tech support guy. If you're on an iPhone or Android, I just need to make this clarification. Um, I didn't realize when we were planning this that uh, iPhone users can't see the polls through Zoom. So if you're attending on an iPhone and you're still concerned about CLE credit, follow the instructions I'll be posting in the chat box. Basically, I'll post a four-digit number and you can email that four-digit number to my direct email. I'll send that in the chat box. Thank you. And that's only for iPhone and Android users. Sorry for the interruption, Ms. Bassley. Go ahead. No worries. Um, Catherine, I'm going to go ahead and jump in unless there's anything else that needs to be said. So um, I'm happy to, to do that. So um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I will share in a minute uh, a little uh, presentation that I'll follow through and, and walk through. But first, just a minute about myself. Um, I started my career in private practice with a law firm in the Seattle area. Uh, called Davis Wright Tremaine. Uh, after several years there, I went in-house to Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Corporation, and I was in-house there for over 13 years. I was assistant general counsel. My er main area of focus and practice was commercial contracting. I was um, the attorney that supported all of our procurement purchasing um, business, and, and uh, in the role of being the legal uh, advisor to that function, I realized that there was a um, opportunity for some efficiencies and it, uh, my job sort of morphed into a bit of an operation without my knowing it um, and then my last uh, time at Microsoft my last bit of time was in heading up the legal operations function across the legal department which was just a uh, an evolving and budding new uh, new role uh, at the time and then for the last uh, couple of years I've been uh, out on my own I have a consultancy uh, in the law firm combination where as part of my consultancy, I work with corporate legal teams uh, and law firms on modernizing their practice. And that can mean a host of things from innovating at a law firm and how the legal service is delivered to a uh, corporate legal department, rethinking how it manages its workload, how it uh, manages relationships with law firms and, and a whole host of um, operational aspects of, of the law department. So I am uh, really grateful uh, to be here, grateful for the invitation and uh, very happy uh, uh, to join. And I will do my best to make sure that I am effectively sharing and clicking through slides. So thank you in advance for bearing with me. Um, I will now uh, share my screen and make sure that you are seeing the correct screen. Hopefully everybody uh, is now seeing a slide with a uh, fabulously philosophical question of what does innovation mean to you? Yes, I'm seeing that. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Appreciate the validation. Um, okay, we're going to spend a little time this morning uh, demystifying this buzzword. And, oh, you know, I'm okay calling it a buzzword. Uh, I actually just published a book on it. It's called uh, Simple Guide to Legal Innovation because I'm trying to simplify uh, what it means to innovate uh, your legal practice. And Yes, it's a buzzword. There's a reason for it, though. There's a reason it continues to be used because um, it's, uh, it's really the best way to compile so many different aspects uh, of what we hear going on today across the legal industry. So let's jump in. Uh, and we'll first start with a very uh, simple definition. So first and foremost, to ease everybody, uh, there's no one definition for those of us who love, uh, you know, black and white answers. I'm going to pull an it depends since uh, we're all amongst attorneys here. and We love that answer. Um, there, there is no, no one answer. That's the beauty of it. You know, there are some great answers out there, but I'm going to give my own. Um, and my own, I think, is the one that really creates the best opportunity for any of you to start innovating in your own daily practice. Um, if you do something a little bit different today than you've done it in the past, and that difference changes your experience, which will likely change your client's experience, I think that difference, that was your innovation. It's very easy for us to fall into a, this is how I've always done it routine. Um, in fact, lawyers are a little bit notorious for, uh, you know, being backwards looking and, and, you know, we're precedent seekers. That's who we are. That's how we're trained. Um, and it's very easy to fall into a comfort zone of this is how I've always done it. This is how it works for me. 
uh, and that prevents innovation. That mindset, that static mindset is definitely one of the challenges as a profession that we need to overcome. So really thinking about better solutions is the way uh, to innovate. In fact, you know, that's my, uh, my favorite part. I'm sorry, I might um, monitor over left. I'm not sure if you even see my, my video or not, so I'll just keep, keep talking. Um, yeah, we, we still see your video. Also, okay, so you've got both me and the, and the slides, which is the combination. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, let's talk about better solutions. Uh, when and how do you find better solutions? Best place to start for you or for your client. When I think about solutions, it's not just solving a client problem. It um, could very likely be solving your own, you know, ways of doing things, the problems about your um, operation of your practice. Um, operation of your, oh, looks like I, something jumped ahead, sorry. Um, you know, thinking about um, challenges within the way you do your, your legal business today, whether it is challenges in finding documents, whether it is challenges in communicating with clients, um, managing your own bills, whether you're, you're billing clients or, or you're paying clients if you're in-house or you're paying law firms. Thinking about those everyday frustrations is the first place to start. I mean, that is how innovation occurs. Even if we think about um, just general innovation outside of legal, right? We always hear that, you know, this frustration is, I think, the, the mother of an, um, innovation or, or there are these uh, sayings out there. So think about, you know, why do you do something a certain way? Why? Ask why. And sometimes when you ask yourself that, it's a, a little bit less intrusive than when somebody else asks you. And sometimes somebody else asks you, I mean, the problem's gotten to a point where others are now being impacted. So step back and just ask yourself why you're doing things um, in a certain way. In order to minimize the feeling of being overwhelmed with some of the problems you might find, which we all, you know, some, most of us are very self-aware. We, we know where there could be improvements, uh, but it could be overwhelming and not know where to start. First and foremost, consider the changes that you can implement to control yourself. What are the things you can change where you aren't dependent on either other departments of your firm or your, or your corporate you know, entity, uh, maybe even other, other people that aren't directly in your line of you know, uh, command or in your chain of command or in, in your own team? I mean, what are the things that you can implement that are really squarely within your own control? Something as simple as how you manage your email how you manage your intake of work, you know, the, the steps you go through, um, all of that's within your control. And we'll dive in a little bit deeper into some ideas there of what can be innovative. When we think about innovation, uh, I like to always create, um, you know, the three core buckets of areas in which you can innovate. People, process, and tools are the core of any, um, any, anything you're trying to change, change management, project management, um, you know, even tech implementations, everything comes down to kind of these three core buckets when you're thinking about improvements uh, or enhancements and certainly innovation. It's a little easier to digest if you start separating out where that problem lies, what, what, you know, which aspect is it that you're trying to impact because they are interrelated uh, and it's very hard to change one without impacting the other. So first and foremost, I want to demystify the fact that innovation necessarily means automation. I am the first to tell you that I embrace technology. I love it. I spent the bulk of my career at a tech company. Um, I wasn't just a lawyer there. I drank the Kool-Aid. I, I am absolutely comfortable and enjoy technology and always look for the latest and greatest, but I'm also the first to say that's not the right place to start. And uh, attorneys may be a little overwhelmed by everything we're reading in the legal press. Uh, Robo-lawyers, AI, machine learning, you know, our time is up, computers are taking over. That's just not true. So let me, let me uh, uh, say the, the concerns there right away. It's just not true. Robo-lawyers are not taking over our jobs anytime soon. There are aspects of our jobs that they are going to take over. Um, we'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about technology. But first and foremost, being able to innovate does not mean you have to automate. So let's start with the people. Let's look at some of the key questions that you're going to want to ask yourself. Um, the answers will be very different, and even the questions may or may not be applicable depending on the size of your team, your organization, your firm, you know, kind of where you're sitting. 
And I'm assuming that the audience is a combination. We probably have in-house lawyers, we have law firm lawyers, we may have uh, lawyers at nonprofits or lawyers in legal aid or even court systems. It, all, it doesn't matter uh, where you all sit. Um, it doesn't matter even what your practice area is. If you start asking the basic question are, first of all, who is it that is touching the work? The, and, and the work is the legal work. It is the whole bucket of what we would call legal work today. What are their natural skill sets? Are they being fully utilized? Is their potential being fully, fully utilized? Some of this sounds like core human resource type questions. And the reality is some of it is. We forget as attorneys uh, and legal practitioners that um, there is just some basic kind of HR questions we should be asking. We think the title lawyer uh, implies this basic set of skill sets that's common amongst everybody with a JD or anybody practicing law. We all, we know that's not true. Uh, we have kind of this assumption, but it's just not true. And we all know that. There are attorneys with different types of skill sets that should, should be leveraged and maybe aren't. There are attorneys with different types of interests that should be leveraged and should be uh, what's the word, enabled, right? empowered, skill sets that maybe they want to develop that aren't traditional skill sets. I think I heard the, uh, my predecessor on, on, um, on the panel, or, or sorry, the, the speaker just before me mentioning that, um, you know, there's a list of skills I, I heard in summarizing. I was only able to join at the end. I was very happy to hear about because I do think there is a whole new um, skill set that needs to be injected into the legal practice. And it may not be within every attorney, but it's a skill set that needs to be brought in. And maybe that means leveraging other people, leveraging people with other backgrounds, other skills. And I'm going to beg us all to stop saying the word non-lawyer. It's actually not a word. I think lawyers must have created it. Uh, what I'm talking about is all of this uh, huge community of business professionals that are enabling the legal professionals to be more effective, to be more efficient, and not paralegals alone and not legal secretaries alone. I'm thinking about technologists, uh, business analysts, financial analysts. Uh, they're likely part of your broader organization. Or if you're in a small firm, you might be doing a lot of that yourself. Uh, but those are skill sets that now you've either had to embrace uh, or, or you've gotten somebody to help you with it. So I want to take a little bit of a deeper dive to talk about what I think are uh, the skill sets of, uh, of the future. I've labeled them as legal ops skill set, legal operations. So I want to take a minute and talk about legal operations and the role that it's playing right now in the evolution of our legal industry. And then we'll dive into the skill set specifically. Um, legal operations um, has been a, kind of an exploding um, set of capabilities, let's say, um, or, or a set of functions that have gotten a lot of attention in recent years thanks to the rise of industry groups like uh, the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. If you haven't heard of CLOC, C-L-O-C, I suggest you look it up. Uh, it grew from a handful of people in the legal operations roles in corporate in-house departments uh, in the Bay Area. A handful of people getting together to share best practices around how to run a legal department um, to an annual conference of over 2,000 people. That growth occurred within about three years' time. Obviously, setting aside conferences in our current climate and, and the one we're all a part of right now, um, the point of those, of those numbers, the point of my reference, is that there is a growing thirst, need, and demand for legal operations functions at corporate legal departments. What that means, that demand that's growing internally within legal departments is also pushing a demand of, of similar skill sets on the opposite side of the table at the law firms. Law firms are finding themselves sitting across the table, not just from assistant general counsels, deputy general counsels, general counsels you know, at the corporate legal team, but they also are now having conversations with people in legal operations roles in the, inside the corporate legal department. The legal operations role looks very different at every corporate legal team. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we think of it as broadly as possible. There are um, several, um, uh, uh, let's see, 
views on, on the definition of legal ops. And I mentioned already CLOC, Corporate Legal Operations Consortium, uh, another very big defining um, industry player in this space is the Association of Corporate Counsel. Um, they have launched also a legal operations chapter or, or um, division. And the focus there is also on these other business professionals that are not practicing lawyers, but that serve this very much business-minded role inside the corporate legal teams. So these um, functions, as I mentioned, are very, very uh, multidimensional. There are legal operations uh, teams that are very heavily focused on technology or infrastructure. Some are more focused in really just, you know, running the department's business and strategy, rhythm of the business. Uh, others are project managers, and, and I'll divide, I'll go into some of those details in a minute here. I've divided uh, basically this combinations of skill sets into four key areas. Uh, this makes it a little bit easier to digest. If any of you do some research on clock site, or uh, the Association of Corporate Counsel Legal Operations site, you'll see that they have 12 to 15 to 16 um, functions, core, core capabilities that they have used to define legal operations. I'll walk through these four quadrants fairly quickly here, um, but just wanted to give you a sense of the skill sets that are definitely growing and evolving inside law departments. They're also growing and evolving now in law firms. They look a little bit different because obviously serving a slightly different purpose, um, but these are definitely now opening doors also for recent graduates. Um, law school graduates that are coming out may not want a, a kind of a traditional legal job, and these are fantastic areas for, uh, for those graduates to be looking, at, and it's frankly in high demand. Uh, even notwithstanding the current climate, there are opportunities in these areas because these are enabling um, you know, efficiencies, and, uh, and, and cost savings, and that's obviously top of mind right now in today's climate. So first starting with technology and infrastructure, this, this might be an obvious one, as you'll see that there's a blank in the upper left-hand quadrant of what I, I say, blank management systems. Some of you who have been doing some research perhaps in some uh, technologies will notice that there is no end to the types of management systems that are available uh, document management, information management, knowledge management. Uh, my favorite is enterprise legal management, which is, my goodness, a little bit of everything. Uh, I don't want to be flippant on the topic, but I do feel like there is a bit of a flood in the market right now of um, tech solutions that may not be clearly articulating the, um, the value proposition to, to the purchaser, and the purchaser in this case, the corporate legal department likely, uh, and sometimes law firms as well. You know, spend management systems, that's a key. Matter management systems, there, there's tons of them. Implementing any one of those uh, can be a challenge and oftentimes not something that a practicing attorney is very comfortable doing on their own. I will go even further to say they shouldn't do it on their own. This is where somebody with technical project management skills, um, technical solutioning skills should be engaged. So technology and infrastructure is a general area of legal ops where the corporate legal team has people that are dedicated to managing their infrastructure, whether it is something as simple as their video conferencing needs, as we now know we all need, and I am secretly happy that we are being forced into this sort of re uh, remote capacity in many ways to enable us to collaborate uh, more easily. I think this is critical for the legal prof profession and we've been behind. Um, so the technology uh, enabled skills um, help with things as, as kind of basic as really that core capability to communicate all the way through to really complex implementations of contract management systems where you're automating the build of contracts and terms um, to you know, um, IP management systems where um, you're really trying to automate how you know, how you're managing an entire portfolio uh, can get very complex. So core area of skills that really um, are necessary at most uh, firms and legal departments today. Moving over to the right, business strategy and planning, something that legal departments um, traditionally haven't done was, you know, create, uh, create five-year roadmaps, three-year roadmaps, uh, strategic goals, things that the corporation that we're sitting inside of usually does but legal departments on their own um, weren't typically doing these kind of exercises. 
This is becoming much more common now as legal departments are being asked to operate like a business. They're being asked to operate like the other departments of a corporation and they're not really special anymore. Uh, they need to have key performance indicators. They need to have goals, success measures, strategies. Uh, and that is becoming, again, a common need across so many departments that people are being brought in to do specifically that. Managing that rhythm of the business, managing budget, right? That, that again, is something that lawyers kind of fell into um, but not necessarily something we have deep skills in. Uh, moving around the radio dial to the right, lower right, data and insights. Data is king. Again, uh, the law department is no longer uh, okay to say um, it depends or I don't know how much budget I'll need next year or we're doing okay. Uh, you know, let's see how the year goes. It's just not okay. We need to be predictable. Uh, that means the data and insights has to be both at the law firm and the corporate legal team. Or again, if you're in a nonprofit and you're managing spend, if you're in a legal aid uh, role um, and you're engaging you know, uh, lawyers that maybe aren't performing uh, their duties uh, pro bono for you, managing um, that kind of data and having the insights to seeing what's coming down the pipeline um, is now becoming also a key, a key need. So uh, what we're seeing here are skill sets that are very deep in um, financial analysis, spend and analytics, business analytics, uh, data science is popping up in some of the more advanced corporate legal teams as well. The data and insights isn't just about numerical data of spend, for example, which is very um, clear that that would be one of the first places you start. We're now looking at data-driven legal decisions being made, tracking compliance across the globe, trying to monitor and um, forecast compliance issues, claims, understanding, you know, volumes and trends, it, it, data really becomes um, so important to making decisions that you can justify to CFOs and CEOs in-house, in um, as well as managing your own resources, again, whether at a law firm or in-house. So um, I like to say data is part of the expression, a, uh, it's a bit of a gateway drug for lawyers, where once we get a little taste of it, we, we really want more. Uh, it's not something we're trained in, but once we get a sampling of the value it brings, it's very hard to not continue to, to expect that kind of insight. Uh, and then finally, to round out the skill set of our project and program management, I, uh, I kind of save it for last because to me, a good project manager is worth their weight in gold. A lot of what lawyers do is manage projects. We don't think about it that way, but that's what we're doing. We're managing documents flowing back and forth, dates, timelines, deliverables, uh, budget. We don't think of it necessarily in those terms as project management, but project management is its own core skill set. There are people who are trained and certified in project management. Um, the way they're able to approach a project can make or break the experience for an attorney handling a big litigation matter, a multi-month you know, contract negotiation, um, a global research project. It's, uh, I can't under, underscore how important project management skill sets are. Uh, you've probably seen there are CLEs for legal project management, really even helping lawyers become better project managers. I'm not sure I recommend it, uh, any one of you having to sit through an eight or 10 hour uh, project management class, unless that is an area that you're interested in, but having somebody with these skills on your team or accessible to you in some capacity uh, can be absolutely priceless, very, very valuable. So this is an overview and a summary of the skill sets that I think are critical to any corporate legal team, any law firm, really any attorney who's even running their own law firm, and maybe it's a smaller firm, um, being able to leverage some of these skill sets, even maybe on a temporary basis from some external resources, um, I think it really helped improve uh, the, the way you're running your business. One thing I will note also in the program and project management uh, quadrant, thinking about process improvement and process optimization is something that comes with a um, skill set that usually is found in good pro project managers. Uh, and process improvement is, uh, my segue to my next, um, next favorite topic <laughs> in innovation. So as I mentioned to you, we talk about people, process, and tools when we think about any kind of approach to innovation. And um, process is so key because 
uh, again, a lot of attorneys don't think of the job that we do day to day as a process. Um, in fact, a lot of what we do, I'm going to say most of, depending on our practice areas, are a series of tasks. They're a series of steps we take. We have gotten so comfortable with taking those steps over and over that that process is just so natural and inherent to, to how we work. That's what process is, by the way. It is how. How are people doing their jobs? That's, that's the question that this process um, review always answers. How are things going? Is the time being well spent? Um, that's a question that a lot of us ask ourselves. Uh, we wonder when we find ourselves spending uh, hours searching for documents, hours trying to find an answer to a question that isn't a highly complex legal question, but something uh, more administrative maybe, something tactical, and yet time disappears uh, in, into these uh, gaping holes when we are searching searching for documents, searching for the latest version of something, uh, searching for when is the last time I exchanged an email uh, you know, on, on something. And so thinking about how we spend our time is a great way to assess process. The first step to assessing a process really is to map the process um, that you are looking at. It's hard to think about the day job overall as a process. So my recommendation to you is to start by dividing up the bulk of what you do over the course of a day, start thinking about which maybe a uh, sub process is uniquely uh, frustrating perhaps, or a process that maybe others have complained about and map it out. So I'm gonna take a few minutes to go into an example that I like to use that I think is relevant to, to hopefully all of you who are participating today. The intake of work, is something we are all uh, so used to and we have our way of doing it. Most of us probably take in work or receive work uh, through email. Oftentimes it is a new ping, it is a thing that uh, appears in our inbox and it now somehow um, forces us to do work. It, it, uh, it alerts us that it's time to take action. That's a very passive approach to managing our own work. And that passive approach creates for us the sense of being overwhelmed. Um, it definitely creates inefficiencies. It uh, makes it challenging to prioritize. We're often prioritizing on the fly based on the email, the contents, the person it came from maybe. Does it have an attachment? Does it have an exclamation mark? Suddenly we have let the person sending us the email prioritize for us our day job. That might be a reality. There are people that when they send us an email, we're gonna prioritize. Uh, maybe it's your chief, your main client. Maybe it's your, uh, your immediate boss. Uh, maybe it's a family member and it isn't work that you need to prioritize because something else just happened. Uh, whatever it is, I like to use intake as an example because I think it's relevant to all of us. I think intake is a perfect place to start if you're thinking about um, optimizing how you spend your time, optimizing the resources you have available to you. Creating some sort of a basic approach to triaging your intake can, uh, can, can improve your experience so monumentally uh, that it's hard to even appreciate until you start thinking through it. Let's, let's give an example. I come from a world of contracts. I'm always going to use it as my favorite example, uh, not only because I'm most familiar with it, to be, to be candid, but also because uh, every company has contracts. I'm going to go so far as to say every entity has contracts. All of you probably have had to somehow deal with, uh, with a contract. And the reality is there are very complex contracts and there are not so complex contracts. There are contracts that probably can be handled by somebody else uh, in your department, in your team, in your organization. And yet when they come into our inbox, they all look the same. Uh, so we have to do prioritization on the fly. We, we have to immediately decide just based on that email if we're going to look at it now, if we're going to look at it later. If we're going to look at it now, what do we do first? Do we take it over ourselves? Do we assign it to somebody else? Do we have a way of assigning or do we just forward it in an email to someone? How do we remember who we forward it to? How do we follow up with them? Do we expect them to take it on completely from here or do we still have to be involved? I just threw out probably 10 questions in, in the span of 15 or 20 seconds. Um, 
that's an example of the kind of exercise you need to take to improve your process. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. It's also though probably not something you wanna take on on your own. Uh, there are people who can help with process optimization exercises. They don't have to be long, they do not have to be expensive, but what you can come out with is a new process map, a new set of rules of how you want to operate certain aspects of your day job. I'm using the word operate intentionally because becoming an operationally minded attorney is critical in the new world of where we are heading as a legal industry. Again, I'm not referencing specifically this, this current time of the, the pandemic and, and the new normal or the new way of doing things. Let's set aside um, a lot of the sensationalism that's happening right now as well. Let's just step back to what's been happening for the last few years in the legal industry. There is a push for efficiencies. There is a push for process optimization. Everybody needs to do more with less always. That's been a theme forever, but globalization, the new workforce, the gig economy is forcing uh, lawyers and our clients even to ask, is there a better way of doing things? Process optimization is the only way you're going to figure out if there's a better way of doing it. You have to map the current state. You have to map how you're doing it now in order to get to how you want to do it in the future. Uh, and as I mentioned, that the how you want to do it, it can be something as narrow as your incoming workload, it can be some as something as broad as the life cycle management of a contract from start to finish, or of a relationship with a client. If you're at a law firm, the intake, you know, from from the minute you first talk to a client through when you complete your first piece of work for a client and work product, uh, there's opportunities to improve all of those different processes. Um, and again, a lot of what we do is a process. Um, I've had attorneys you know, really push back on that. Uh, it does not minimize the quality legal work that we need to do. What it does is highlights that we should be spending our time on that highest level quality legal work and not some of the functions and tasks that we find ourselves losing time. So um, needless to say, I'm a big proponent of process optimization and process review. Uh, and as I mentioned, there, there are people who can help attorneys with that. It is not something that every attorney needs to do on their own. With that, I would like to shift to um, technology. So people, process, and tools. Technology is the third uh, leg of that three-legged uh, innovation stool. It's important. Um, I save it uh, you know, for last because I also don't want, uh, I, I, I do want to spend some time on it. <laughs> you know, I start initially by talking about how uh, you, know, you don't need to automate to be innovative. That's absolutely 100% true. Um, but then once you uh, have reviewed the people, the who, who's doing the work, what kind of skill sets do you have, who can enable you to be more you know, efficient in your legal work, uh, and you review the process of the how all of that work is being done and how that work is flowing, technology is really the best way to enable efficiencies once you have optimized your processes. Um, there is a lot of technology out there. If you're struggling with how and where to start, and, and again, you want to be innovative, you're reading so much in the legal press about technology, where do you start? First and foremost, I say pick something you're curious about. And if you're not naturally curious about it, it's gonna be a little hard to, uh, to digest it. Some of the technology is complicated. Um, it, it may not seem that way at first, but once you get down a journey of implementing new technology, it can get, um, it can get a little complicated. So what you wanna do is pick something you are curious about. Uh, if you aren't necessarily curious about any one thing, but you've identified an area that you think automation can really help, um, find somebody that is curious about it in your organization, in your team, in your firm, in your department. Um, you're gonna want, again, somebody's gonna come along that journey that has a natural interest in what, what this is and isn't uh, just an assignment. It's very hard to implement technology without a little bit of a natural inclination to, towards, again, that, that curiosity. Um, the next thing I like to recommend if you are really trying to find where's your innovation sweet spot and how, how to innovate, um, I would say you probably have access to technology that um, you aren't optimizing. You probably do. Um, some of you, maybe when I don't have anything at all, I have is email. I would say start there. Uh, there's a way to enhance your email experience, very likely. 
if you are using a Microsoft Suite. And I'm not here to pitch any one particular technology over another. I, have, I do have favorites, and I will be happy to take a, a conversation offline with you if you'd like. I'm not shy to recommend what I think works best. Uh, but whatever you have at your fingertips, I say start there. It is very likely that you can optimize your own email experience. If you use Microsoft for email, if you are using Outlook for email, there are plugins that you have available to you that might make things easier. I'm going to give you a couple of examples just so that, again, I, want, I really want you to walk away with something that is tangible for, for each of you and, and trying to cover the spectrum uh, of everybody that's a part of this conversation. Um, create a shared mailbox with um, others on your team. If there's only two or three of you in your office, create a shared mailbox so that you can intake work and easily see it all. Uh, everybody can decide which piece of work they need to pick up pretty quickly. You can cover for each other on vacation. Uh, it gives you immediate visibility and access that you don't have today if you're each managing your own inbox, if that's helpful. If you're in a larger team, a larger department, create inboxes for particular practice groups so that you can share as a group, as a team. Lawyers need to start thinking about teams in a different way, okay? The way we engage, especially the law firm, there's not really a team dynamic all the time. There's oftentimes the hierarchical partner and associate, uh, but there's better ways of enabling and engaging people with different skill sets if you're thinking of a team dynamic. A team should be leveraging certain email capabilities together. So creating a shared mailbox, super simple, easy step. Everybody has access to that, no matter what technology you use today. If you're on Gmail, also create a shared mailbox. Um, another example uh, that I'm familiar with, in this case, it's an Outlook. I I'm sure this exists in, in other mails as well. Um, creating quick parts, little quick insertion of things into your email that you're used to besides a signature block. We've all learned how to do signature blocks. You can also have a quick part that if you find yourself retelling the same um, piece of advice or maybe you have an introductory response that you like to use for new clients or similar you know, kind of frequent answers you find yourself giving, maybe you've even stored those answers in a Word document somewhere or you have a draft email always open that you like to copy and paste from, there's a way to create uh, an insertion of quick parts, they're called. And you click the one you like and boop, it goes into your email. So that might seem super, super easy and, and very uh, basic for some of you on the phone, uh, on the call, uh, and some of you, you know, maybe this is a great place to start. So I, I offer it as an example that the spectrum is really, really broad of what you um, can do with the technology you have at your fingertips today. That was just email. Let's move on a little bit to um, really where I think every lawyer needs to be at this point. This is kind of uh, the new, I would say basic requirements and, and new, probably last year or two years old even at this point. Um, everybody should be leveraging the cloud for storing documents. I'm gonna go so far as to say it's not okay to put documents on your C drive. I will go so far as to say that if you are, it is just a ticking time bomb until your C drive crashes, your laptop falls, you spill a drink on your laptop. If you haven't yet, for those of us who've been practicing more than a handful of years, it happens. That's the reality. Um, the days of crashed laptops are over. They should be over. So you have to put your documents into a cloud-based solution. For years, we heard resistance from law firms, lawyers, is the cloud safe? Data, data security and privacy. I'm not minimizing those questions. I'm not saying they aren't important questions to ask, but I will pretty much guarantee you that companies like Microsoft have solved this. Um, again, if you're using Google, ask them those questions. Dropbox, Box, these are all very well established and secure places to store your documents. Um, please look into it if you, if you aren't there yet. If you're there, again, let's move along the, uh, the spectrum of technical capabilities. If you're there already, don't just store them there. Share your documents through the cloud. Uh, save people's inboxes. So let's not keep sending huge files as attachments to people's inboxes. Share them in your cloud-based solution. Not just for access for people to view, but let's go a step further. Let's collaborate online. Those are not just for technologists and technology companies. That is for every profession should be 
collaborating online on documents. If you are within the same organization and you are collaborating as a team, even two or three of you are drafting in the same pleading or you're drafting the same document, memo, uh, contract, there is no reason to be sending draft versions back and forth via email. The most basic online document system, not, not even document management systems, let's not go that far. The most basic um, document storage online, whether it is OneDrive through Microsoft, Google Drive, Dropbox, or a box, the ones that I've just mentioned, uh, have capability to access documents simultaneously. So you can edit simultaneously. You're watching each other make changes. Nothing gets lost. Nothing gets missed. I I'm pretty sure most of you are um, frustrated with having to create new file names that are this long. If you can still see my video, I'm showing you about a foot length uh, where we put things like master service agreement, underscore Lucy, underscore April 24, 2020, underscore revision five, underscore, you know, we get really creative uh, because we feel like we've had to and we're so used to it that we stop to think my God, there's got to be a better way. So, so please explore those, what I think are basics, online you know, file stories. So these are just examples. There are millions more. Of course, technology and automation goes all the way through the most creative and latest and greatest artificial intelligence solutions. Um, that is where I'm going to say, you know, learn something new if you're curious at all. There are solutions out there that are very interesting. There aren't magic bullets. They're not going to the magic buttons and, and, and you know, solve things immediately for you, but they can certainly make you more efficient. Um, artificial intelligence is proving to be, and I, I say proving because it is a growing area of technology. It is constantly learning. That's the nature of the machine learning aspect. Um, it is learning how to read your contract faster than you can. It is learning how to read your contract in a more consistent way than you can. I'm not saying it is better, but it is faster and it is more consistent than attorneys can be because we're human. So it takes out the human error. Now, it doesn't have judgment. That's the beauty of bringing AI into your practice areas is it supplements attorneys. It doesn't necessarily repre replace us. Um, so I would love to um, just propose that you, you learn something new um, and it can be bite-sized. It does not have to be becoming a technologist. And I'm going to answer the uh, question that uh, sensational legal press loves to ask, does every lawyer need to learn to code? The answer is no. I'm single-handedly here telling you, no, you do not need to learn to code, but you need to appreciate um, that there are benefits of technology and bring in those people that could help you become a little more uh, comfortable with technology. We don't all need to be tech savvy, but we, we, we need to get comfortable. Uh, again, it's a very, this is a very big topic, and I'm just touching the, the tip tops of it uh, and how you can be innovative today with the basics that you have at your fingertips. If you want to go further, there's a lot of runway there. Uh, and again, there are people out there who can help you with, with this journey. So in summary, uh, and I definitely want to leave some time for Q&A. Uh, we'll, we'll do the best we can in, in, in this environment with the number of people we have, but I would love to have some time for Q&A. So let me, um, let me summarize with, again, a couple of places to start. And uh, you may be anywhere along the spectrum, so figure out a way to make it work for you. It's kind of like um, maybe taking a yoga class, and there's always the, uh, you know, the basic pose, and then they'll give you some variations if, you want, if you're a little bit more advanced. So I'm going to treat this uh, like yoga. I think that's a good analogy. I, I am no expert, but let's start with what excites you. You have to ask yourself what excites you. Hopefully there's something about innovating your practice that excites you. Um, some of it might be a little bit of FOMO, a little fear of missing out. Uh, that is definitely happening in our industry. I, I deal with a lot of clients who are feeling that they need to catch up. You know, if that's what uh, prompts you to innovate, that's okay, I'll take it. Uh, but don't feel that you're missing out. You're, you're not, you just need to find your place to start. So let's use a couple of examples of things that I think uh, all lawyers have to deal with in some way or another, and um, some of these might be an area of interest for you, and you can innovate in there. So working with clients, if that's something you enjoy, I hear lawyers over, you know, all the time, my favorite part is working with the clients. 
And, you, and, and oftentimes they're not even getting into the actual practice area or the subject matter that they're experts in. They really just like that relationship feeling, the, the engagement, the um, learning from clients, you know, solving client problems. There are a million ways you can innovate the way that you engage with your clients. Some of it um, can be using technology. Is there a way to work with your clients to collaborate with them in a new way? Collaborate with them online? Can you delight them by saying, I'm gonna create a shared workspace for us online. I use Microsoft Teams, I, I use uh, a Slack. Uh, I, 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 there's again, million technologies and I, um, there's not one necessarily that, that you have to try, but think about what you have access to. Would a client be curious or delighted by an attorney who says, hey, I, you know what, I don't want to send you email anymore. Let's share a document online. Um, how about, I want to be able to message you instantly, client. Do you use an, a messaging service uh, already? Let's see if we can both you know, message through, through that so that if you have a quick question, you can just ping me. I'll guarantee that there are corporate lawyers, uh, in-house lawyers, I'll say, I'm gonna put my hat on for a minute, my in-house hat and say, I'm not gonna call an outside firm an extra time because I'm afraid I'm gonna get billed for it. There's relationships I've established where I knew that wasn't the case, but there's some I wasn't sure. And if it was an expert, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh God, here comes a 0.6 or a, you know, a, a 0.3, sorry, where I should say 0.1 or 0.2, in six minute increments. Um, if I you know, call a lawyer or if I send them an email and they respond and the response is likely gonna be pretty voluminous if I ask a substantive question. Wow, wouldn't it be nice to send a quick message? Not seeking advice maybe through messaging because we know there's of course privilege confidentiality questions lawyers would raise if that's the right medium. But I, I, I show it as a way of saying, wow, goodness, couldn't that be an easier way for a client to feel open to asking a question from, from a lawyer and not feeling that their outside counsel is gonna charge them for it. Furthermore, uh, the new workforce is used to instant messaging everything, or they're used to texting. So many of you are probably receiving questions from clients via text. I'm sure you don't like it. I'm, I'm gonna guess you're not a big fan of it, but you like the feeling of being able to respond right away. You wanna be available. So if that client interaction is what gets you excited, there are some fantastically easy and fun technologies that your client might already be used to that you can um, entice them with. And again, show that you are open to innovating your practice. My next example is around crunching numbers. Uh, yes, there are lawyers who like math. I know you're out there. We are maybe fewer or far between, but I also think for too many decades, we've been hiding behind the, we don't do Excel, we do Word. But we're, you know, we're word people, we live in MS Word, we, we don't do uh, graphs and PowerPoints. Um, I think those days are also coming to an end and we all have to become comfortable with data. We have to become comfortable with numbers. We have to be comfortable with at least absorbing the data and reading a chart. Well, I guarantee you that if you are interested in numbers and you're, you, know, you like crunching them, your clients, they'll benefit from it. They'll love to see a beautifully color-coded uh, report with a couple of pie graphs and a couple of bar charts that summarizes for them some activity that you've engaged in with them over the past. Um, guarantee that's gonna delight them because they wouldn't expect that from their firm or their, their outside lawyers. So think about where are those data points that uh, would be useful to see in a visualized kind of way. What can you start tracking and measuring that you don't today? Is there something you do that's of a repeatable nature over and over. Not because that, again, not judging the, the ease of the work and if repeatable doesn't mean it's easy, but if you have recurring work with a client of a particular type, it would be great to start summarizing how many of those pieces of work you've done over the past X number of months or a year. Think about those data insights that a client would say, wow, I never knew you did X many, or, or I didn't know we sent you, you know, this many types of things. So, Think about what you can track and measure um, and how that can be valuable for a client to see in a summary view. So if you're already inclined to, to data and reporting and metrics, um, there's a ton of opportunity in your practice today, guaranteed, no matter what practice area you're in, um, to do something you know, measurable or, or trackable. Um, and then finally, you know, does it excite you to write? Are you really a person who just loves the writing aspect of your job? 
Well, there are ways that you could put those writing skills to use that, again, can delight your client in a way that maybe you didn't anticipate. Putting together frequently asked questions to enable the clients or the business to move faster, to get access to information uh, rather than having to always contact you is a huge step and it shows a different level of relationship than maybe they're used to. Because now you're telling them, hey, I don't have, to have that need for you to call me every time. I want to empower you and enable you to move faster. Um, that creative writing though, you know, that's where you have to move away from your legalese. And probably you enjoy the writing because maybe you, you enjoy creative ways of uh, relaying your legal principles that moves away from legalese. We've been talking about plain language drafting for years, if not decades as well. This is the time, if you haven't done it, you can start. You enjoy writing, uh, put together FAQs. Think about pictorials, think about infographics. There are easy to use products that you can use to explain. I saw something that I couldn't believe uh, a corporate team did, an in-house legal team, a client of mine, put together uh, patent processing FAQs in a pictorial. They showed flows of if you don't, then this. If you do this next, then this happens. Uh, and they posted that to their inventors internally, their engineering teams. Um, and this is not a tech company, by the way. But it shows, again, the creativity of the legal team of saying, oh, we need to relay our information and communicate it in a different way. Uh, so they really, really honed in on their creative writing uh, side of their of their brain and um, relate information that otherwise lawyers we might tend to write it up in a lengthy memo and it could uh, be full of words that just aren't easy to to comprehend and we know we've been accused of that right we write words for for lawyers by lawyers so there's huge opportunity to innovate in the way that you relay information uh, and communicate all of these are examples of innovation so innovation does not have to be overwhelming. Uh, it does not always mean technology. Um, and if you are you know, still not sure where to start, I am more than happy, of course, to, to chat with you further uh, anytime. My contact information is on the screen, but I'd love to open up the conversation to questions. Uh, if we can, I would be happy to take some. So, we can see if they come in through chat. Uh, that might be the easiest way. And, and maybe Catherine or, or Carl, I'll ask you to manage, manage this for the program. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bessley. Yes, we'll be taking questions through the chat box. And I believe instructions have been sent out on who to send those questions to. I think they're sending it uh, or posting it to everyone and then starting your question with the word question. And they're moderating the questions and they'll be reading them to you. Fantastic. In the meantime, as those questions start to come in, uh, you know, I think I might be able to view them myself. Sorry, uh, I'll leave my slide where it is, uh, and I'll just I'll be prompted, and I'll I'll stop talking when a question comes in. Um, you know, another uh, you know one question I, I do get um, quite a bit, uh, and, and I will let me make it applicable to the current climate that we're in. I, I've been speaking a lot generally, and, and almost trying to you know uh, stay away from the realities of where we are today. Uh, as we're all adjusting. No, no doubt we're still in the adjusting stage. Um, we also probably can agree that there isn't a clear end to the current environment and uh, it will be a slow move back into some version of whatever that new uh, normal will be for us. Um, I did just get this question from a client that was really, really um, worthy of discussion. We had gone through, uh, have more than halfway through a journey of reassessing uh, the corporate legal team's operations. And we were looking for efficiencies, we were looking for opportunities to leverage technology, we were looking at maybe opportunities to outsource or leverage lower cost resources, which goes to the who uh, question I, I addressed earlier, who should be doing the work. And we got to a point where we, we have good recommendations, you know, we know what the next steps are. And all within the last, of course, month, uh, you know, everything changed. But but did it. Uh, and the general counsel asked me, okay, well, should we, should we start making some of the changes? I want to, I kicked off this project with the goal of having clear recommendations and roadmap to then start implementing changes. But should we start now or should we wait? And it was a really great question. Of course, as the, you know, as the advisor to, to, to the general counsel, I had to be careful to say, well, I had to weigh the answer of, 
well, of course we should go because I'm excited about the changes and I'm gonna help them and enable the changes. But I had to really step in the shoes of being empathetic. And we all have to be that. That's the number one uh, skill set I think we all need to be honing right now. So what does it feel like for them to make changes? What, what is it gonna feel like for his team? Um, after a very transparent discussion, you know, he came to the conclusion that there is no benefit to waiting because we didn't know what we were waiting for. There was no timeline. There was no uh, time at which suddenly, oh, now we should start. Um, so, so I thought that was a, a really interesting conversation. And if any of you are struggling with that right now as well, I'm going to go ahead and say that there is nothing to wait for. <laughs> there is not going to be a time when innovating will be a good time to start in light of the pandemic today. Nothing's changed. We should have been innovating all along. Um, there's ways to innovate from your current situation, whatever it is. Even if you're worried about where your next client, you know, work may come from, um, that's the time to reinvent. That's the time to reinvent and, re, you know, innovate uh, your, your service offerings and, and what you want to provide to clients. So with that, I hope that that kind of also helps make this all relevant to, to the current environment we're in today. Are there by chance any questions that have come through? Yeah, there is one question. Um, I can read that one and then I, we're supposed to uh, wrap up for a break after this. So um, for Ms. Bassley, looking for advice about what business and technological deliverables should one achieve before starting a new firm i.e. there's so many things to consider and improve, but one cannot perfectly prepare everything ahead of time. However, one does not want to, quote unquote, pull the trigger prematurely before a core set of systems processes are in place. So what should this core set be, question mark? Okay, if I'm understanding the question, we're talking about in advance of starting a firm? I, I'm, I'm yeah, before. Before starting, a, opening up your a firm. Okay, a couple of basics. Let's think about first of all, um, money's going to flow in and out. <laughs> uh, you're going to want a way to track the you know the invoicing and the billing. It needs to be the latest and greatest. You need to capture data you can share with clients, um, and it needs to be easy to use. So obviously, billing and invoicing system number one. Number two, some form of document management. It can be super simple. It does not have to be a full blown document management. A specialized solution, but thinking about that core suite of your productivity services that you are going to buy, I will say I still think um, the Microsoft suite of services is probably the best for the legal profession. Um, I don't work there anymore. I don't get paid by Microsoft, uh, but I've had my share of testing the others, and um, th there's very few that can compete with that full suite of um, you know the email and then the document management and sharing capabilities of good old SharePoint, which is now improved and become much easier to use. So depending on the size of the firm and the nature of the services, a good suite of productivity, uh, obviously some, some billing and, and, and invoicing are gonna be your, your two key, key places to start. Um, I think the suite of services, frankly, the, the productivity suite for, for the office is going to give you almost 90% of what you need uh, to function on day one, I, I would say. So, Again, a shout out to, to my alma mater, but, but not because I have any uh, remuneration from them at this point. Well, thank you, Ms. Basley, so much. We're gonna have to um, go ahead and wrap up and Great. we're gonna give everybody about a um, five minute break and we're gonna start uh, Mr. Burton at 11. But thank you so much, Ms. Basley. Thank you very much for having me. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. And this is just a reminder and also a, an apology uh, on behalf of the technical specialist here, I'm Carl Ham. Uh, with the polling that we've been using, if uh, certain users have complained that they haven't been able to see the polls, that's why I sort of on the fly came up with the email method of, of uh, emailing me the code. But um, if you do see the polls and you're responding to them, which will appear at the beginning of each presentation, then you don't need to email me the code. Um, so thanks for your patience, everyone. And again, you can chat me directly uh, if you have any more questions. And we'll be back soon.
Hi, everyone. I would like to introduce Chad uh, Burden. He's the CEO of Curo Legal, and he'll be speaking to us about the innovative uses of technology and everyday practice. Hi, everyone. Uh, Chad Burden. Really excited to talk to you today about the concept of technology, innovation, and modern lawyering, which is what we have named this segment of the talk. And, and thinking about it, you know, today, obviously, we're supposed to be together in person in Virginia, but we're not because the world is melting down and we get to do it this way. So, there is definitely you know, a different flavor to how this discussion needs to go uh, today versus um, if the past you know couple months hadn't happened. So, but at the same time, it's real fascinating because a lot of the core concepts we're going to talk about today are applicable regardless of whether you are stuck in your home or you were in your office thriving like you were before. Um, so a little bit of uh, background, um, the, uh, as far as you know, where I come at this from is that I, um, you know, when I was practicing, I started off in a you know, traditional big firm type world. Um, I have, uh, then I went out and started my own law firm when I was a solo and then grew uh, at the time, what is known as a virtual law firm, meaning that my team worked remote uh, in four different states uh, at different times. So, um, the you know, and at the this is 2011 when I started that firm, and at the time we were leveraging the cloud. People were working from you know, mostly from home and remote. Maybe we would use. Uh, like Regis temporary office space, but, um, and then we would communicate with chat tools. Um, so it probably sounds very familiar to what we're talking about or what we're experiencing today. And, you know, at the time when I would talk with people in other industries and explain to them that what we were doing was considered kind of edgy and, you know, I hate maybe innovative is too strong of a term, but uh, other industries are like, well, we've been working remote for years. We've had that, but you know, obviously within our industry, traditional law firm models are brick and mortar. Everyone's you know, in the same office space with some exceptions. Um, but at the time, a lot of lawyers looked at it you know, as if um, you know, all of my team were sitting like in their parents' basement with like you know, Cheeto crumbs all over their face, uh, and, you know, hoping clients are going to show up when in reality, we're representing like massive multinational companies, oil and gas tech companies, things like that. And it was real law firm model. And so that, you know, and so for years we, we operated under what was called this virtual law firm concept. And as I would write and speak and talk about this uh, concept around the country, I was trying to get us to move from this label of virtual because it, it sounds, has that connotation of fake or something's off with it to this is how we practice law and try it like this is just going to normalize it because you know, there's a sliding scale of what it means to be remote pre-pandemic when you're forced to be in your house. But, you know, it ranged from you know, firms that were wholly remote where it didn't have any office space to those that would mostly do a hybrid approach where you have some office space, not unlike what we had, but people could work from anywhere, which meant that you had to prepare yourself or the firm had to be prepared and have the right infrastructure, both from like a, a technology uh, a processes and procedures perspective and your team trained to thrive in that type of environment. And you know, so today, we, what we've seen over the past, you know, month and a half, especially when the state shuts down, shutdown started to occur, was that law firms had to figure out, okay, we are, you know, either partially equipped to go remote or not at all. And, you know, I've, I work with law firms across the country and have, I spend 
this is not bragging because it's freaking awful, but like I'll spend six to nine hours a day on Zoom talking with lawyers across the country. I like talking with the lawyers part. It's the Zoom part that's wearing on me. But um, but the uh, so but the conversations are so fascinating and being able to see the and this may resonate with a lot of you uh, be, as wherever you're sitting today is that watching the you know the flow and the transition of how people are adjusting to this is really interesting because when it first happened most you know, you would see some firms thinking okay we have to do this we don't want to um, and we're going to go kicking and screaming some embraced it quickly and said let's jump in and do this um, and uh, it just was one of those things that like it, you, you see this wide range and now that we're a month and a half into this uh, we're also seeing uh, and maybe some of you are experiencing this where some people still have that drive the hardcore drive they had before some it's waning and so trying to get your head around what it means to run a modern law firm in April 2020 is very different perhaps than you know February 2020 and so this discussion of what it means to innovate in this uh, scenario is is going to vary per firm. There are, I'm sure, some of you right now that are um, thinking, okay, how do we survive this? You know, I need to be in survival mode and focused on that. Others are thinking, let's build. Maybe our, our leads are down and the client work is down. Let's take this time to put infrastructure in place. And that's a lot of what we're gonna go through today. And so I think right now, um, if you're trying to get your head around, you know, when you've walked your dog for the eighth time today uh, to get out of the house, uh, when you're thinking about, okay, what mode am I in? Am I in, you know, an innovative mindset? Do I want to come out of this concept after this pandemic and really be in a position where we're going to thrive and be ahead? And you know, to do that, and there's so much chatter on you know, social media within the legal tech and innovation space where people are trying to figure out what does the future of law firms look like? What does the future of delivery of legal services look like? And I think it's too early. I think that's the general consensus now. There's lots of hot takes and thoughts on you know, what this means, but what we can do is take where we are and figure out how do we build going forward and think about how are we going to be very practical about our law firms going forward? And that's really what we can do right now is put protections in place. So hopefully you've you know, applied for your PPP loans and you've got, you know, you're getting funded or you're going to do it for this next round and thinking about, you know, financially, a financially strong firm, but then the, you know, and what I want to dive in today is how do you, um, build out an infrastructure right now and you know, starting even today if you wanted to in a meaningful way so that when you come out of and we come out of this whatever that means and I, I hate talking so vague about it because you could read I read at least like 8,000 news articles a day that say maybe it's 2022 you know, I watched some like ridiculous interview with the mayor of Las Vegas this morning that she wants to open all the casinos up right away. You know, like, so we've got all this stuff going on. So what we can do is work where we are right now and think through how can we position our firms to uh, be strong, as strong as possible now, but also as, you know, ready to hit the ground running when you know, some sense of normalcy returns. And what that means, and we'll talk about that today, is like what you know, normalcy means is gonna be really interesting coming out of this. And so how do you position your firm with tech to you know, thrive in that environment? So before I jump into that, uh, one thing I wanted to mention was that if you have questions as we go, I can see those pop up and we'll try to field those. I have no problems. Um, trying to uh, do that as we go. And so if it turns into more of like a town hall -y discussion on what is pressing for you, it's probably a pressing issue for everyone else.
So with that, um, how do we implement technology in uh, this environment? And how do we look at, you know, how do we put that infrastructure in place? And it really, and this applies whether we are, you know, the world feels like it's ending or not. Before you, you know, buy technology, you really need to look at uh, what you have in place. Because, and, and figure out also what problems are you trying to solve? Everyone's got a little, you know, a different uh, flavor of what you know, your particular issues are. And when you go remote, it starts to highlight that dramatically. If you were cloud-based before this thing happened and your documents are sitting in Dropbox or Box or a cloud-based practice management system uh, and you can access your information just like you're sitting in the office, that's great. Maybe you had a server in place and you, you, it's always been a challenge to effectively access those documents remote so people went into the office all the time because or they were emailing themselves and now you have all these different versions because you can't access the information. Well, you're gonna to start to identify those problems. And what is it you're trying to solve before you get into any kind of technology? Um, so, the, uh, so what I would encourage you to do is start with what you have. Um, most of us have core technological solutions in our firms. Um, I'm making this up, but it feels like it's a number that should be correct. Probably like 90% of law firms are either using um, Office 365 or G Suite to run their email calendar and contacts. Um, that's, you know, maybe you know this, you know, maybe you think, well, I use Outlook. Well, what's behind it is probably one of those two solutions, especially in a smaller firm environment. Um, yeah, there's other options out there, but most small firms are using those tools. I would start there, and this is super easy because uh, the tools that exist within these you know, Microsoft and Google packages are really robust. Um, they have, uh, we're using Zoom and the world has learned how to use Zoom. I have helped my 12 year old create a Zoom account. We're using those, but maybe you know, you're a holdout on it or have concerns about security, which may or may not really be an issue, but look at your existing infrastructure. Google has Hangout or Meet or whatever they call it this week. I'm not kidding, they change it. I feel like they change it every month, whatever they're calling it. But they have a chat and video feature, uh, video conferencing built in to uh, what you're paying for already. So you're paying like $10 a month per user, most likely. You already have video conferencing built into it. The same with Microsoft Office 365. Skype is included within that suite as well. So you have tools in place already to communicate with your team. Another thing to look at is, you know, if you're having problems with you know, accessing documents, both of those systems have document storage within it. Um, they may not be the best and they may not be the most ideal, but if you need something now to make your world easier, to get your documents in the cloud, You've got Google Drive. You've got OneDrive in, um, in uh, Office 365. So you've got all of these tools in place for a low cost. So if you're thinking, look, I need to you know, tighten my belt on from a cost perspective. Tighten, that's an awful, especially with the amount of food that's being consumed right now, at least by me, tightening the belt doesn't really work. But that phrase in the money concept, concept works. Um, so if you're looking at cutting costs, you've got tools already there. Can you go outside of it? Absolutely. Um, uh, you know, Zoom is there, you know, Slack uh, for uh, communication. Whatever it is you need to, um, you can add on smaller options and, and, and still be able to have that core infrastructure. But look at your technology that's already there and make sure you're leveraging it to its full potential. Uh, case management software is another common area where there's so many opportunities. Uh, most firms, if, if you have something in place, it's very common for law firms to have bought software and started to use it in some capacity. Case management software is often purchased because you need a better invoicing um, uh, functionality to it and you get in you create matters client matters and you uh 
send out invoices and you don't, that's about what you use it for. That's a great area to look into uh, making sure that you're leveraging all the functionality with your case management software that you have in place because um, most of it is going to have opportunities for lead tracking. So important nowadays. It, it, it was pre-pandemic, but understanding where your work is coming from. I understand the phone may not be ringing as much as it was before. Some practice areas have been hit harder than others. Criminal defense, you know, personal injury with courts being closed have really, you know, taken hits on uh, the ability to um, you know, get a lot of new clients coming in, but it's coming back. The courts will reopen. Uh, bars are going to reopen, so there's going to be plenty of DUIs coming out of you know, the post-pandemic life. Uh, family law lawyers you know, experienced uh, downturns and calls, but being stuck with that significant other that you probably didn't even like before the pandemic is going to help uh, you know, drive leads. But right now, what you can do is look at the software that you have and say, okay, how are we tracking our leads? Are we leveraging those, fun those features um, uh, as strong as we can? Because the more information you have about what's coming in the door, the more educated you can be. We're seeing a lot of, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, law firms are experiencing people that are calling that just don't feel like they have the money. Um, not, I mean, that's just maybe the most obvious statement out there. But then, you know, we're also seeing uh, law firms that do estate planning and business planning that are thriving and doing well because people are focused on their own mortality or they lost their job. So now it's time to you know, make that, you know, side hustle of, uh, a, you know, a hobby and turn it into a real business. Uh, family law. Uh, we're seeing people that may you know, be concerned about the money piece, but then, uh, but they're also worried about perhaps like disrupting their lives more than they need to. Others are looking for solutions to say, hey, how do I move things forward with the courts being closed? And you know, smart law firms are figuring out how do you leverage work that can be done now, uh, even though there, there are certain limitations on how you can execute outcomes such as leveraging courts. But so having you know, your technology that's there to be able to uh, track that information and understand what types of leads are coming in the door is a great opportunity. And you probably have that already within it. Some other opportunities within your, um, your existing case management software, most of them have some kind of document automation talk with firms all the time. And this has been going on for years and years and years. Always front and center is we would like to automate our documents uh, because we know that if you can leverage automation in an effective way, then you're going to create efficiencies within your firm. And that you know, now is a great time to look at that. Maybe you have that software in place already uh, or it's something you want to add to the process because people have time. Maybe the, you know, your cases are still down. So you have team members who are at home you know, balancing you know, lower amounts of work, but also kids and things like that. This is a great time to focus them in on projects that have been sitting there. And you probably already have the tools in place to at least start doing it. A um, couple of other areas that you know, with technology you already have that are helpful, like custom fields. Most case management software allows you to customize so you can track information and, and get more, more out of how you are taking care of your cases and tracking what's going on with them. Uh, integrations, most, uh, unless you're using you know, closed off software, most of them have integrations that exist with other technology. And so that, and where the benefit of that is, I mean, yeah, some, integrations are for show just to be clear and if you look at them and say what is it really doing I mean, it's smart from the standpoint of you know tech companies will often leverage and market integrations as a way to get attention because they tie it to bigger uh, other technologies and get the marketing uh, so you need to look at it as to whether it's effective or not but uh, 
if it is something that can reduce uh, duplicative efforts, that's awesome. So you enter data into one you know, application and it pushes it to others. So now your team is not, you know, they're, they're focused on other projects or tasks versus putting the same client information in three or four systems. So if there's ways to automate, that's something that you could look at too with your existing software. Another topic that's related is you know, we often, especially now, if you're thinking about uh, introducing new technology into your firm, and it's not a bad time to do it uh, for lots of reasons we'll talk about here in a bit, but before you jump in to um, new technology, and what I, one of the things I said up front is what problems are you trying to solve? Look at your existing workflows. Look at you know, like a manual, uh, you know, manually how you're doing it. So if you're a uh, one one thing that's super common is that um, uh, new leads that come into the firm. So, so many law firms have you know a green or pink or blue piece of paper where the intake person writes down the data related to this potential lead. Uh, it will maybe get handed off to the person doing the consultation or it gets stuck in a drawer. Um, not unusual. And you know, so looking at something like that with your existing processes and seeing how you're doing it and understanding um, how you want this to look is smart to do before you actually get technology uh, as a, a fix. Because sometimes what happens is that when you are trying to, you, know, you see you know, a cool new tech and you're like, hey, that's what we need. Well, it may not be the right fit for your firm. It may be too complicated to set up. It may not actually fit your workflows. So understanding your workflows, the manual version of it, before you introduce technology and automation is huge, and it will save you so much time. Because right now, we're all frustrated about the world. And so why introduce something new to your firm that's just gonna make everybody angry or frustrated that it's not doing what they wanted it to do? So understand what you're doing first and how you want to look and then search for the technology that matches up what you need from a, a law firm perspective. Now, when you, to kind of wrap up this little part of the topic, um, when you think about processes and procedures, uh, it's good to document these. And you know, so many of us have ways that we do things. Um, I was working with a firm last week where uh, we were talking about intake and sales uh, process. And the intake person was given uh, criteria for how to vet these potential clients. And said, oh, can you share it's a scale, a 10 point scale on it? It's like, oh, can you share how that works? You know, send me the document where it's written down and uh, it's not written down. She did it by memory each time. It's like, oh, okay, well, let's give me it out loud so I can hear what's going on, and then I'll write it down for our purposes so I can help advise on it. And she couldn't articulate it, and it's not, she wasn't doing anything wrong, but like, the only way she can articulate it is when somebody, and think through it, is when somebody's talking to her. So if she goes out and gets sick, or quits, finds another job, that's a that's the, it just walks out the door with her and so you need to document these things and now is a great time to document your processes that are there um and that you're creating because it's going to make you stronger going forward when you're now tweaking those processes and procedures that are in writing um it will be much better than you know coming out of our current environment saying okay we changed some things, but we didn't really figure out how to capture it, so we have this knowledge share. And just to highlight a couple tools that you can use for this um, uh, that are flexible and to some extent free, or you can upgrade them. Trello is a great one. Many people will use that for um, project management, but you could also use it to capture information that is more static on a Trello board and have cards for each topic so people can reference it. Um, another one is called Tetra, T-E-T-T-R-A. 
um, it's a it's a knowledge based tool, uh, cloud based knowledge based tool where you can create pages and link them together and share them with the team. Um, if you are using uh, an application such as Slack uh, for communication within your firm, both of those tools integrate nicely. So if there's updates on it, the team will see it and get notifications on it very quickly. Um, the, and then if you don't want to introduce that kind of technology, again, go back to what you already have. If you're an Office 365 user, uh, document it in Word document or a PowerPoint presentation. Just get it down so people can review it. If you're a G Suite, a Google for work uh, type user, make a Google Doc, make some slides, do something like that so that people can visually see and have that information captured. And it's going to be, it's super important because it creates uniformity, it creates the continuity, and it will just make your life easier as you go forward. Because if you are looking at how to build what your firm looks like going forward, the more of this infrastructure in place that you have, the better. Another important concept when you're thinking about this model of introducing new technology or leveraging existing technology is involving your team. Uh, many of us that are at the you know, law firm ownership level will, uh, especially now because you know, you've watched you know, all of Netflix and you're trying to think, okay, I need to you know, go research some tech. The, uh, you go out, you do the research, you figure out what you want to use with the firm, and then you tell the firm, hey, we're going to start using X software starting Monday. Let's get ready. That pre-pandemic or during the pandemic has caused, uh, you know, is always an issue with law firms that you know, don't effectively roll out new concepts or new features that are being used. So involve your team. And it's especially important now. And you know, this, is a, this is related, but a bit of a tangent. Like, you know, all of us are going through some form of uh, shut in fever people are frustrated and i've seen some of the most badass like lawyers just starting to crumble because their world is upside down and while the firm may be functioning well being stuck at home you know is just not there the way they're going to thrive and your team is going through that too with you know and some of us are, are you know schooling kids while trying to work and all this stuff is happening and and especially if work is down and maybe some people's jobs have been altered, this is a great way to engage them. Engage them in the process of, of building out technology that you know, already exists or helping vet new concepts. It creates ownership and it tells them, look, you know, you're important to the future of this firm. We're going through a lot of stuff right now, but I need you to help build that infrastructure. And so it, um, it's a great, you know, and it creates ownership over it. And this exists no matter what the, uh, the situation is. Um, the more you have your team invested in the tech that is going to be used, the more they're likely to use it and buy in on it. So that's huge. And so now is a great time to do that because um, maybe a person was your, you know, receptionist and you've changed so that they're not answering calls live because it's virtually impossible because they have three kids running around and a significant other who is also working from home and but they can do things you know other things like help with the research and then once you make decisions help with the implementation of it as well now is a good time for doing this because of not just having the the time available but it allows you to focus on um a more meaningful deployment perhaps because we are you know becoming hyper focused on what does the future of our business models look like it's a great time to be doing this and uh, the implementation process, yep, you need to involve your team, but I, wanna, I want you to think about how you implement software in a way not unlike how people develop software, how companies develop software. Uh, there's two primary modes of software development. Uh, this is relevant, don't worry. This is not a weird tangent. Uh, one is waterfall. 
uh, the waterfall methodology is that you scope out the tech and you build it all out and you don't start using it till it's done. All the features are in and um, you have it ready to go and it, it's, it, is a, it doesn't get rolled out until it's basically perfect. Um, that's oftentimes how law firms will uh, roll out technology or initiatives. They want it to be perfect and you know, working on all cylinders before they introduce it to the rest of their team. And oftentimes the reason for that is they don't trust that their team is gonna be able to handle it. They don't think that they're flexible enough uh, to be able to learn things on, in an iterative process. So you need to like just put it all in front of them right away. One thing that I think all of us are learning that even people that seem that they are the least flexible now are forced to be flexible because that's what we have to do. And so, um, so the, and the build out model like that, the waterfall methodology right now is just not necessary. The other main um, uh, tech development model that is useful here is the agile method, which is where you, you know, get core concepts in place, but you iteratively roll out features and functionality in the tech development world. The same thing happens here. So if you are sitting on technology and you listen, you, you took what I suggested earlier and said, hey, like, let's look at our case management software and see what else we can do with it. And you look at it and say, oh, we're using about 10% of it. Let's ramp up the 90 and, and roll it out. You don't have to do that. One, that's gonna be overwhelming for you know, whoever's the point person as well as the rest of the team. So, you, so think about how you can, you know, what's most important. Is it, you know, we need to uh, start using the intake portion of the software. Whatever it is that is solving the problems that you have that you, we identified up front, start rolling it out in phases. That way your team gets used to new things and it's a lot easier for them to learn. And so that agile method will, will serve you really well as you're implementing these new tools or existing tools that you know have opportunities for uh, more rollouts okay so once you've thought about solving problems uh explore new technology or existing technology oftentimes when people are thinking about this and this is where we kind of get into this you know i'm trying to get to the innovative part of this which i i don't we're not like, yeah, some firms are thinking about artificial intelligence and going down the path of machine learning and all that, but I, it's just not necessary right now. So the, you can implement things that are, um, that you know, may take you outside more of your comfort zone that may feel more innovative uh, that are supporting a future business model. But once you get to a point where you are, uh, feeling comfortable with the tools you're using, then get into like the automation piece of things because we all want to automate our world. Um, and there's so many tools out there to help automate uh, either within the existing technology that we have or third party tools. Uh, one that's a lot of fun, fun, sure. Uh, Zapier, Z A P I E R. What Zapier does is it connects multiple cloud based tech tools to push information back and forth or to uh, execute tasks or actions uh, in other tech when certain things happen. So for example, like you, know, you put a calendar appointment for initial consultation on your Google or Office 365 calendar, you can use Zapier to create a new matter in your case management software. One you know, calendar invite goes on your calendar, all this other stuff happens automatically. So a lot of that is uh, the advanced way that you can start looking at how to really streamline your processes. And I would look at that once you, um, kind of like what we were talking about up front, which is where you, um, you get your core processes in place and then you start to automate from there. So don't jump in too early on it, even though it sounds so much fun because it is so much fun. 
but get the infrastructure in place before you start going down that path. Um, so I want to think about uh, the what are we going to do going forward? How do we innovate law firm models going forward? As I said earlier, a lot of this is unknown, uh, and and that's completely fair. And to pretend like we know what uh, law firm innovation you know, is going to be going forward is just not fair to anybody, and we're going to be making stuff up. But what we do know is this. The way we deliver legal services are is going to change. It's going to change in some fashion. Whether it's dramatic or not, that's the fun part we don't know yet. But here's what we do know. We do know that people can work remote and survive and even thrive. So the idea of, uh, and I've talked to so many law firms about this, they're giving serious thought as to whether they keep their office space or not when their lease is up uh, because they've realized maybe it's not necessary or they need other, like they need a smaller option. A lot of firms, and it's not, yes, it's about cost, but it's also about use where they just had too much space or the existing space was fine, but now knowing going forward that we may have ups and downs in this pandemic where people have to work from home uh, at different periods of time, the need for that space isn't there. So we know that the way we work is going to continue to change. So that having a tech infrastructure in place is going to allow you to be flexible and allow you to be able to uh, continue to roll with the punches that the pandemic provides. So that's one thing we do know. We also know that with an economic meltdown, clients you know, are gonna, we're gonna have to approach costs perhaps differently. And this comes up every time, like, you know, every 10 years when we have recessions, um, trying to figure out, okay, how do we serve people? Um, there are going to be people that are going to still have money that will pay for high end services. That's not going to go away. You can still provide that. Where the opportunity though is, uh, is to figure out how do we serve this other component? and this is not new, this access to justice concept and that 85% of people that are on the sidelines because they can't get access to legal services. Um, maybe they don't have enough money or they're scared of the process, whatever it is, that number is still there <coughs> and probably growing right now. If like one out of six Americans or whatever the number is that are, are, are unemployed, they're still going to need help, but how do we go there? And if this is a demographic that you want to serve, you need to figure out how you're going to deliver those services. And everything we've talked about so far goes to that. Document automation, streamlined processes, <coughs> excuse me, so that you can um, serve you know, clients in different ways. It may be that you've avoided fixed fees for years, but the way that you're going to thrive in your market is figuring out how to uh, create some fixed fee model. Maybe it's a hybrid approach. Uh, one thing we love is like the idea of like menued pricing on certain tasks. You know that preparing a petition in a certain case is gonna cost X number of dollars and you fix fee it. Same with discovery and certain things. But then other issues like trial and mediation are gonna be hourly. <coughs> Looking at that, um, and the only way those concepts will work is if you have this infrastructure in place now. So when we're talking about innovating law firm models, a big part of this is gonna be figuring out where, where, where do we need to go to meet these clients? If we're gonna do it, we need to figure out how we're gonna serve them and serve them effectively. And so having those efficiencies in place now is gonna give you more options. It's going to give you the ability to experiment because with any type of innovation, you have to experiment. You're not gonna get it right. Lots of firms are doing that now. Uh, one area uh, that I think is interesting that most of us, you know, pre, you know, when things are fine, we think of full service representation, we're going to enter an appearance. Um, 
a limited scope is not something that is on a lot of uh, um, people's minds. And so um, the concept of uh, that model is something that, you know, is, hasn't been front and center, but firms are already experiencing that, experimenting with this right now saying, look, we're not going to enter an appearance on your behalf, but we're going to coach you. We're going to prepare documents for you and we will uh, be there for help. And if you need to step it up later, we'll jump in, but it allows people to get help. It allows people to, uh, the law firm, to have work coming in the door, even though courts are closed and you know, we're going to be backed up when things kind of get back to normal. And um, it's this, you know, experimenting with different models now with an infrastructure in place is a massive opportunity. And it doesn't sound like it, innovation right now, I believe is going to be in small iterative processes and in small concepts that you can do to either, you know, maybe survive from a firm model perspective or figure out what it is you want to be when you come out. Uh, some of us, you know, some firms are thinking, look, we don't, we're going to keep, um, we're going to keep uh, going with our high end clients. We market to those people and that's what we're going to go with. Uh, others are just taking the approach now of like, we're going to try to get anything we can get, you know, come in the door and that's the path we're going to go. And to do that, you're going to have to deliver services differently. There's just no question about it whatsoever. Um, last thing here uh, to maybe hit on uh, as a, we're running out of time uh, and something that you can start working on today. I've mentioned the idea of tracking leads. And um, what we have found over time is uh, uh, that the more your intake process is streamlined and, and is functioning in a way that you have lots of data around it, you will make more money because you know where your leads are coming from. You know referral sources that work and don't work. And so you stop spending money on, we had a client that thought all of her work came from Yelp. So she was dumping all this money into Yelp. And it turns out that none of her clients were coming from Yelp. So she stopped spending money there and then invested in something that was actually driving leads. So if there's one thing you can do today that will also help you prepare going forward is making sure you know where your work is coming from. We have a question. Um, can you please talk about how to encrypt documents in a new and innovative, in a new innovative environment? Um, I think from an encryption standpoint, it, that's a broad topic, uh, but at its core, there are you know, most cloud-based solutions that are um, serving the legal industry are going to have levels of encryption either at rest or in transfer when it's going back and forth. So it's probably built into your, your software that it exists already. Um, so I think most of the time that's gonna be there. If you have, this is a good example of if you have very specific uh, situations that you're looking to encrypt information, um, then that's that goes back to what's that problem you're trying to solve and what's you know, what tools may be out there to do that uh, but most of the time like if you're using um case management software that that has a client portal on it those documents and information is going to be encrypted uh just as naturally as part of what you're paying for um even i mean google microsoft that's built in as well so I think we're at, I don't know if we have any more questions. And I think we're at our time. Am I correct? Yes, I believe you're correct. Thank you so much, okay. Mr. Burton. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, Thank you all for having me. Uh, best of luck with everything and uh, have a great day. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Burton. Uh, I'd now like to introduce um, a crash course in legal marketing, content marketing, and the client cycle. Um, and this will be done through Jacob Tingen, a uh, managing partner at Tingen and Williams. Hello, I'm, I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Am I being broadcast or? 
Yes, we can hear and see you, Mr. Tingen. Thank you. Oh, okay, great. I will get started. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, so my topic today is going to be more focused on um, legal marketing, uh, legal marketing online, um, primarily content marketing, and how you can kind of get organic search results working in your favor and bringing leads to your firm. Um, we've had a lot of success at my firm, Tingen and Williams, doing that. And I'm going to share with you some interesting results, some anecdotes, and I will start sharing my screen here in a minute so that you can see what I'm looking at. Here we go. Okay. So yeah, so a crash course in legal marketing. This is a presentation that I worked together on um, with one of our employees who does marketing for us via our firm. Uh, so I'm Jacob Tinton. I'm the managing partner of Tinton and Williams. I also teach a course at UR. Um, and then this is Andrew. He's our content marketing specialist that we have at the firm. Um, and you know, for the longest time, if you're starting small and you're interested in content marketing, this is something you can do uh, on your own. Uh, so don't worry about that. But at our firm, we've developed it out where we actually have a full-time person kind of helping us with our content marketing strategy at this point. Um, so we're Tingen and Williams. Uh, we practice in immigration, some family law, some criminal defense, um, expanding to personal injury. We do some business things. Um, and, and we stay busy. Uh, it's fun to have, you know, a cool marketing strategy that, that have, for us has worked. Um, so let's see. I wanted to focus my presentation on the content marketing aspect of, of these materials. So here we are. Going to come down. Yeah, forget PPC for now. All right. SEO and content marketing, optimizing for user intent. So what is content marketing? If you've ever looked at marketing online in the past, you've probably heard the term content is king. Um, and so what that basically means is that content rules all. Nobody comes to visit your website if you don't have anything to look at. Uh, nobody's going to come and visit you if there's not something cool there for them to experience, for them to consume. Um, and so that... Is, is what content marketing is about, is creating value for, for audience members to come and, and, and visit with you. I keep having polls pop up in front of my <laughs> screen here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I think you can just move that to the side, but we yeah. have, we have yep. to poll, sorry. We're good, thanks. Um, so content marketing is, is basically the process of creating content, uh, distributing valuable, relevant, and consistent content to attract and retain a particular audience. So in our case, as lawyers, that audience is going to be um, you know, leads, client leads. And then you want to convert them into clients. Um, so there's kind of a cycle in content creation. And it's not just, I'm going to write a bunch of content and put it on my website. And it's not, it's definitely not, I'm just going to copy this other blog post about legal information that I found on somebody else's website and copy it onto mine so that my website is complete. Uh, not only is that a copyright violation, but Google will punish you uh, for, for copying content. And we've actually found lawyers who have copied articles on our website and put them on their website. Um, and, and we know that they've copied them because they'll even copy links back to our website. Um, so not a great idea for your marketing efforts. But the, the way that you should create content is you should create original content. Um, and you should also try to do it in a way that fulfills Google's kind of latest requirements. Nobody really understands perfectly how the Google algorithm works. Um, but we do know that particularly for YMYL websites, your money, your life websites, law websites are included in that category, that... Um, Google is looking for people who can fulfill what they're calling EAT requirements. And EAT stands for expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness. So basically, Google looks at your website, and I'm going to use Google. I mean, all search engines use something similar, but I'm going to use Google generally because that's, that's where we get most of our data, and I'm sure it's obvious to you why we would do that. So um, 
Google uh, looks at your website and after looking through things, they kind of can get an idea of how legitimate your site is. Do you have attorney web pages? Do you list your credentials? Did you graduate from an ABA approved law school? Um, and if you don't think that Google can figure all of this out from your website, they absolutely can. Uh, it's pretty incredible. So they look at these EAT requirements and you've got to make sure that um, your website at least proposes that you have the expertise to talk about the topics you're writing about. Uh, typically graduating from uh, a law school and, and being admitted to the bar is, is going to be good enough. Um, but of course you want to link to other places like, um, you know, AVO or, or other places where you might have an attorney listing that can kind of verify that, that you're an attorney and you are who you say you are. Um, second, you want to write organic content that people are actually looking for. And we'll get into that a bit, but um, my presentation is going to focus primarily on written content, but there's a lot of space and a lot of room to also talk about um, other kinds of content in addition to written content. So there's, you know, podcasts and audio content, there's video content, uh, vlogs, right? So there's all kinds of content that you can create. Um, written content tends to dominate online. It was the first kind of content that Google could index, meaning that it could read it, dissect it, and understand, you know, what is this about? You publish that content after it's created, uh, and then you kind of figure out, um, you know, ideally as in your step one, you've kind of planned out, well, what do I want to accomplish with this piece of content? What kinds of clients am I trying to draw in? And then you analyze um, that content in the context of, of your original goals. What are my key performance indicators, my KPIs for this content? And, and then I track how it performs. Um, and then I, I can make changes to my content over time using that data analysis so you optimize the content. So maybe you go through the content, you say, you know what, um, the keyword I was trying to get people here for was this. I'm going to start using that keyword a little more frequently in this article. We'll make some minor adjustments. Um, and then we'll get into this a little bit later, but we're seeing that Google looks at a variety of factors, not just the written word, but images and pictures, video, um, infographics, all kinds of things. They look at all that you've done structured data. They look at all of the aspects of your article or your content, and then they decide how they're going to rank it. Um, and so just doing one kind of marketing or one kind of content isn't going to get you the results anymore that you want. Um, so we'll, we'll come down here to the content marketing spiral. Um, so essentially, yeah, we'll create the content, we'll optimize it. And then after we've been through one round, we'll start to upgrade the content. And that's what I mean by adding newer kinds of content. We'll add images, we'll add videos. Um, and then there are two kinds of long form content that I want to just address briefly is evergreen versus skyscraper content. These are terms that you might see uh, people talk about. So Evergreen content is this idea that I'm going to write a piece of content that is going to be good for a long time. Um, so one of the, the aspects that Google looks at when it ranks um, a website's content is it will look at freshness. So that is a ranking factor. But some topics never change, right? Um, some topics uh, just aren't likely to change haven't changed in years. And if you write the comprehensive article about that topic, you might have written an evergreen post and you put it on your website and it might persist in Google's rankings for a long time. And if you study some other evergreen posts, you can figure out how to do that. And then of course you can always go back to a piece of content that's performing well. If you see it start to dip in its search results, well then you can go back and upgrade it and make it evergreen content if it's performing in the way that you hope. And, um, I'll touch on a piece of evergreen content that we have here in a bit. The other strategy for long form content is called the skyscraper method. You might have seen, uh, if you're into marketing, you might have seen uh, this discussed on, on blogs like Backlinko um, or other places. But it's this, this idea that I'm going to create just a massive, almost an ebooks, ebooks worth of content and put it in a blog post or an article on my website and it is going to be the ultimate, just overdone source of content for this topic. 
skyscraper content, the idea that it's so high uh, or so deep into the topic that Google can't help but recognize you and notice you. Um, so before I continue, um, does this work? Uh, well, so I wanted to show you a couple of things. So I'm gonna change the screen that I'm sharing. Um, let's see here. I wanted to show you uh, our evergreen content that I was telling you about. Let's share a new screen. Here we go, share. So if you're, if you're following along here, um, Andrew, our content marketing specialist, wrote an article and and so what we do is we work with um contract writers they write the articles and every article is reviewed by an attorney before it's published to our website so andrew had an article written called a brief overview of virginia tree law and we've been looking into you know personal injury and insurance and those kinds of, of, of areas of law and expanding our practice and i said why tree law and he said well it'll be evergreen he joked to me um and i said you've got to be kidding me uh, so I looked at the article and, and believe it or not, if you Google Virginia tree lawyer, uh, we're the first non paid result. This is a, an ad. This is a paid result. Um, and, and you can see that our article is relevant. Now, if you click the link, uh, this is our website. Um, and it has, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. There's a table of contents at the beginning that actually links to places below and covers the topic pretty in depth. Um, and as an additional tweak, we also include structured data on this web page, and that's another kind of content upgrade in our facts section. So frequently asked questions, and Google picks up on that, and it provides these drop downs to these frequently asked questions that we know that users have, because when we look into the topic and we analyze the topic, we, we see uh, what people are searching for, and we can directly address their issues and their questions. Um, and at this point, you might be thinking, well, this sounds expensive, um, or maybe it doesn't sound like something that, that I could do. But you need to understand that um, all of these tactics, most of them are free. I mean, Google Analytics is the analytics tool for understanding uh, the data of traffic coming into your website. And anybody can look at this data and, and get a, a good sense of, of what's happening and, and what the user intent is. And so after you look at that data, you can then create content for visitors to your website, answer more of their questions, and they're more inclined to reach out to you and become leads, more inclined to become clients and users of your services. So. As we go down, um, let's talk about how you would use a tool like Google Analytics. There's also the Google Keyword tool. Um, so you want to write for an actual visitor to your site. You don't want to just write random stuff. Um, your content should have a purpose. Um, and, and when I first started, I literally just wrote content. I was just like thinking, well, I know that content marketing works because um, I've, I've read a bunch of stuff. And I knew that, um, I just wanna make sure if there are any questions. Okay. Uh, I knew that content marketing works and I knew that um, if I created content, people would come, you know, if you build it, they will come, fill the dreams kind of thing. So we put out just tons of content and we didn't research the area very much. When we first started, we started making a ton of content about K-1 visas and we thought we're gonna get all these young couples, uh, you know, people study abroad and getting married and doing immigration uh, K-1 visas. We actually got a lot of old men marrying women from the Philippines. So surprise, surprise, if that surprises you. Um, so, you know, it didn't quite go how we planned and the traffic didn't go up as quickly as we hoped either until we started to use a more focused approach which means that we, we did a little more keyword research and we, we learned a little bit more about how to optimize for the right kind of keywords. Um, so find your niche and target high value long tail keywords. So long tail keywords are different from short tail keywords in the following way. Um, to give you just a brief example, a, a short tail keyword might be shoes, right? 
Uh, a short tail keyword might be in, in, in our context, immigration lawyer, right? The problem with those uh, keywords is that if somebody types them into Google, Google doesn't really know what to give them. And we see this that in search intent and user intent, people will search, they'll start searching for broad keywords. And as I talk about this, you'll probably realize this in your own uh, search habits, that um, you'll start broad, especially if it's a new topic. Of course, everybody knows about shoes, but I'm gonna stick with that example. So let's say you say shoes and you get all results. Um, well, then you might refine your search and say, well, I was actually looking for running shoes. And then you type in running shoes. And maybe that will help you see other things that you're interested in finding. Um, but then you'll remember, oh wait, a friend of mine told me he had a good pair of Nikes for running uh, and that it had an app with it. So then at that point you adjust your search and you say Nikes for running with app um, or Nikes running shoes with app. If you're a retailer who's selling Nike shoes, even if the Nike shoe has a specific brand name, you would be dumb not to create a page that's titled what people are searching, Nike running shoe with app, right? And then of course you can tack on the brand name as well of the shoe, but, but that's how you get those visitors to your website and sell them exactly what they're looking for. So the short tail keyword in that example is shoes and the long tail keyword is Nike running shoe with app, right? Um, so it's the same with legal marketing. So there's immigration lawyer, but then there's also immigration lawyer with experience in H-1B visas, right? If you have an article titled that specifically, your chances of performing for people who are searching specifically for someone with experience in that service much better than if you just keep going and writing tons of articles and tons of content um, under the heading immigration lawyer, immigration lawyer, immigration lawyer. Um, you know, and, and we've had experience with this immigration lawyer in Richmond, Virginia, of course, is going to perform better than immigration lawyer, even though Google is figuring out better how to like tailor results geographically. Um, you know, figure, making it easy for Google is going to help you out a lot. <laughs> um, so here are some examples of high value short tail versus long tail keywords um, and, and that we've seen. Um, so I want to talk about content marketing versus PPC. And PPC is, is an acronym that stands for pay-per-click. Um, I feel that when people and, and lawyers in particular and other professionals, when they think about online marketing, they think about PPC, um, which again is pay-per-click, which is this idea that I can buy on Google AdWords the top spot and then um, I'm, I'm free to get as many clients as I want and this will help my firm grow. Um, and, and I'd say generally that that's incorrect. Uh, the reason for that is that, um, first of all, it's very expensive. Uh, so content marketing as free PPC is the heading of this particular slide. Pay-per-click can be cost prohibitive after a while. We typically recommend pay-per-click as a short-term strategy to see if a keyword is worth it. Um, so um, if you feel like you need to do that experiment to determine whether a keyword is going to bring the kinds of clientele that you are interested in, by all means run a PPP, PPC campaign. But as we've looked at certain keywords, um, you know, in Virginia, personal injury attorney, uh, Virginia divorce lawyer, um, those have a very high value per click, like $60 per click or $100 per click. And so you're paying for people to click on your, your, your ad but then you don't know if they're going to convert. You're, you don't even know if it's the right kind of traffic. Uh, where are they in their search process? Did they find your ad when searching for a short tail keyword where they're not really ready to buy and they're just still learning about the topic? Or did they find your ad when they searched for a long tail keyword and they're actually ready to buy and they're specifically looking for an attorney? And then even if you do get the attorney specific keyword and you're paying for that, um, at $100 a click, you know, Google is going to shuffle you in between the top four results. And, and, you know, personally, and I think that this is true for many in the younger generation, I avoid paid ads as much as possible um, just because I'm not interested in ads. And yet at the same time, I am very much aware that search results on the internet is advertising. 
Um, you know, even, I, I, I guess I just prefer to reward the first organic result over the first paid result. So, um, so PPC is pay to win content marketing. Content marketing is when you actually create content tailored to a user, you, you address user intent, you answer the questions and frankly, you build brand loyalty over time. Um, sometimes we'll have clients come in to us and they'll say, you know, we looked at your website and not only did you answer a lot of our questions before we even walked through the door, but we were impressed by, you know, the attention you paid to that issue. So, um, on, on our website, uh, we know which pages have the most visits. This is data from, uh, our, our firm's website. And then we've also tried to do our best. And I, I assume this is, this is more of a rust, rough estimate, but we've tried to figure out our value per case. Uh, we've tried to figure that out. You know, what is the value per visit? Uh, and so for us, this is kind of just a numerical guideline that we use when we look at our content creation to see it, is this worth it for me? And so for our top 10 articles, uh, in terms of the traffic that they drive to our website, we estimate that it probably creates an additional value just from our top 10 articles of about an extra $15,000 per month uh, of clients that come to our office that wouldn't otherwise come to our office. Um, and so this metric shows the equivalent value of organic search traffic uh, if we'd acquired it via PPC. So maybe we'd have paid a lot of money to get those clients, um, but we don't have to because we, we wrote the article once and we don't have to keep paying month after month. I actually was just talking to a friend yesterday who, who launched a, a new product for, it's doing really well for, for local search uh, that he calls Jozu Post. Um, and it helps you automate a lot of social media postings. But he was telling me that he had a new client dentist office that came to him and um, they were paying $16,000 a month to an SEO who was running a pay-per-click campaign. So they were also paying the SEO an additional $4,500 a month and $16,000 a month uh, in PPC. And I said to him, geez, like if they paid me 16 grand a month, I'd get better results for them after three to four months just by doing content marketing. Cause PPC is not when used correctly, it is not a long-term strategy. So we'll move on. Um, like I said, content marketing is more than just written content. Uh, although that's been our focus. But again, we're seeing that Google is, is the, they don't make it easy on us, right? And I guess it really is just a response to how the internet is evolving. Um, so content is more than just written content. Uh, video is huge. Um, and, and, you know, infographics and images are also very important. So we have our articles, which are our short blog posts, they're three to 500 words, which is when we see that the user intent is for a specific keyword, they just want a quick and dirty answer. And when there's a time in the law that you can give a quick and dirty answer, uh, we have a couple of articles that are like that. Uh, our longer form articles are between 800 to 2,000 words. Um, I'd say the majority of articles are in that area. And then skyscraper posts or evergreen content tend to be between 2,500 to 10,000 words, uh, which is, which, you know, is long. Uh, but what's interesting is when they're well-written, you can look at the Google Analytics data and you'll see the site visitors come to that post and you can see how many minutes they're there and you can see that they read through the whole thing and that they come back to it and that they come back to it. And it's typically when you write those kinds of skyscraper posts that you start to get links from outlets like Forbes and other places um, that can also give your site an additional boost through backlink building and those kinds of things. So then there's eBooks and lead magnets. I know that many lawyers are familiar with eBooks. I see them all the time. Uh, typically you give them an exchange for an email or that kind of thing. Um, video content is something that we're exploring and we started exploring kind of in earnest uh, last August. Um, I started a podcast as part of kind of a video stream that I'm doing on YouTube uh, called Nation of Immigrants, uh, where I essentially Google the news and then um, talk about how terrible the current administration is for immigration laws. Um, but, uh, but also go in depth onto some legal issues. Um, another area where we're kind of upgrading our, our image online is using custom visuals and graphics on our website. Um, for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing, you can go to Design Pickle. And for like $400 a month, they'll give you unlimited graphic design. They won't do logos and stuff for you. I'd recommend Fiverr for that if you're looking for cheap logos. 
Um, and, and by cheap, I mean affordable, not necessarily cheap. They, they do pretty decent work. Um, and then, you know, in terms of content, you just want to create things that provide value. Now, why are all of these kinds of content important and why should you do more than just written content? Um, and this is why you need to have a content marketing strategy and it's feel free to start small. Again, some of this might seem overwhelming. Um, I started this in 2013 and, and we started working on our website. I'd say that in earnest, we started content marketing 2015 um, where it really started to make a difference and we doubled down on the strategy. Um, but these, nobody knows how Google search algorithm works. So the next five minutes are kind of an advanced topic. But um, there are a couple of ranking factors. So there's topicality, quality, the speed of your website, entities, rank brain, which is this complicated concept of like Google analyzing your data and how connected it is to just like the history of the world. You could Google rank brain later and read it. I can't explain it. Structured data, which is an, a neat way of, of adding information, adding metadata to your web pages and saying, hey, this is review content or hi, this is you know, this kind of content. And then freshness, um, which um, is, is just, you know, how, how relevant, how current is the data. Um, I wanna come back to structured data a little bit. I think I shared this in the other example uh, on the tree law, but yeah, the, so the, the asked questions that we had pop down in our search result, that is, that's because we structured the data. We added specific code to our frequently asked questions section in the article, and then Google brings that out um, and, and, and frankly gives us a boost so that we rank first for that, that topic. Okay, so we read this article that kind of broke down what Google, what they're seeing that Google is doing. And so this was the interesting result. And this is why we've decided to expand our content marketing strategy beyond just written content. So this one um, much smarter than me person analyzing data from across a number of websites discovered this interesting factor that let's say a 10 is like excellent, I do it so well, and a one is I'm doing poorly, and four or five is in the middle. So he looked at two web pages on pretty much the same topic and found that if I did mediocre across the board, you know, I got a five across the board, my search result will outrank somebody who does a little bit worse than me across the board, but only better on one thing. So unfortunately, it seems that Google is ranking mediocrity, but I don't think that that's what's actually happening. Um, they're just ranking a wide variety of content. They're rewarding creating a variety of content. And you can see kind of how this comes down in the following tiers. Like, even if you do, even if you write the most amazing, most accurate legal content known to mankind, or you make the most amazing, most accurate video in the world, uh, Google's not going to rank you unless you pay attention to some of the other issues that also affect their search rankings. And so as we've looked at our search rankings, even though it, it might seem silly when we add those images, when we add a video, uh, our rankings instantly improve. Um, and, and we can see it systematically as we continue to do that. Um, yeah, so that after the bidding finishes, these pages then appear. Um, I wanted to get down to this. Candidate result sets compete for page one. So you wanna get on page one of Google. Um, and you know, featured snippets tend to show up first. I wanted to show you a featured snippet example of ours. Then there's web one, two, three. Then it'll show images. And I'm sure many of you are familiar just from searching the web that you'll see kind of this format. Oh, there's a box at the top with some quick info. I'll see some search results, maybe some images, maybe a video. And then the web search results will continue. I'm gonna share with you um, how, how valuable it is to try to use structured data, for example, and, and um, play to this system to get a featured snippet. So one of our keywords that we rank for is K-1 visa processing times. Um, share. So here you can see if somebody Googles K-1 visa processing time 2020, we're the first result. We have the featured snippet about featured snippets. You can read about that here. Then it has a, lot, a bunch of frequently asked questions. 
Uh, and then you can see, um, you know, a bunch of other websites. What's interesting is we don't appear there, but because we've optimized our website and we've uh, done that work, well, we got the featured snippet spot, which is a great spot to get. Um, another interesting spot is Wills in Virginia. So we rank the featured snippet for Wills in Virginia. These are the ads. And again, I think in the younger generation, people don't tend to click on them. Um, but then this is us, the featured snippet before these frequently asked questions. Um, and again, we don't really show up, but because we've optimized our website and provided structured content, we can snatch that first spot. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing that, go back to the presentation. And there was, okay. Um, so why does this matter? Well, one thing is that it does give you consistency in terms of getting clients through the door. Um, you can depend on a flow of clients. Even in the era of COVID-19, right? We, we've definitely, our website has taken a hit. It seems that people don't like to search for information about legal stuff when they're at home watching Netflix. Uh, but you know, it didn't drop off completely. And we've actually seen that even though our traffic overall has dropped, the percentage of quality traffic has actually increased. So that means probably the same people who had urgent legal needs are still searching for urgent, urgent legal solutions. Uh, even though the overall traffic on the internet outside of, you know, Netflix and Disney plus is down. Um, but again, it, it gives you a leg up against other firms. Um, you know, there's the Alexa ranking, which is a tool that's available online. It can show you how your site ranks against other, other firms. Um, and, you know, our, our firm website receives more visits and has a higher online ranking overall than many big firms. So we know we get tons of visits. We know we get tons of leads. Um, and that has led us to the last thing that I want to talk about, my time's running out, is the client cycle. Um, and I wish I could take credit for these five points, but this is where I'll end. Um, this is actually something I learned from a presentation I saw from Seth Godin, who's a marketing guru. Um, but he said that there's five elements of marketing and marketers have generally focused on the last two audience targeting and mass marketing, which is the issue of, of Google search. Right. But he says, what you really want to focus on is one, two, and three creating such a positive experience that your clients will refer you out and creating a cool culture for your firm. And so we've tried to do that. I mean, even though we do the online marketing and we do it well, um, we do it well. Uh, most of our clients do come from referrals. We do our best to create a positive experience. And in terms of culture, we're even doing cooler things like creating t-shirts that say hashtag lawyer up. We give them away to clients. Uh, we'll give them away at consults because we want people to know that, hey, it's fun to come to our office, it's a positive experience. Um, there's more to talk about the client cycle, um, but I wanted to end on that. But one thing you need to realize is this online marketing is geared towards creating a positive client experience. I do see one question, which I guess I'll answer here. Did you also write the facts and the canned answers? Um, not the ones that appear in the Google search results, but the ones that appeared in the structured data for our specific result, we wrote those frequently asked questions. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's my presentation. And thank you everybody for, for listening and watching. Um, there's a lot to, to be gained by implementing a content marketing strategy. And I hope that this has given you a bit of an introduction and um, I'm also happy to talk about it. I love this stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tenjin, so much. Um, so we are now going to go to a lunch break until 12.55. We're actually gonna start five minutes before 1 p.m. Um, and I also just wanna address one thing. If any of the PDF files in the um, chat that I'm sending before each speaker's presentation, if you're not able to download it, I'm gonna send the link in the chat, but we are posting all this material on the Jolt website, um, but you can also feel free to just personally message me, Katherine Schroeder, and I can um, go ahead and email it to you. So thank you everyone, and we will see you back at 12.55.
All right, everyone, I'm going to open up the polling for attendance now, and um, I believe we're getting ready to get started again. I am ready. So I'm going to make a few administrative announcements before we start with Mr. Damian Real. First, uh, just like Mr. Carl Ham said, for polling, if you see the poll pop up, it should pop up and be available for the first 10 minutes. Go ahead and fill that out for your attendance. But if you're on your iPhone and you don't have access to the poll, um, Carl will be putting in in the chat instructions on what to do then. He'll give you a code that you can then go ahead and email to him. Um, but first and foremost, try to fill out the poll that's going to pop up. Um, and then also I'm about to share um, Mr. Reel's outline for this talk, but then I'll also then share uh, the link to the JOLT website. All of our materials are posted on that website for you to access if you for some reason can't download it through Zoom. So now I'd like to introduce Mr. Damian Reel. He is the Managing Director of FastCase, which is a legal research platform, and he's going to be talking with us today about artificial intelligence and how you can be cutting edge in your practice and using AI. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, really good to be with you today. I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, these are uh, strange times, and this is a strange format uh, to, be, uh, to be talking with you, but I will say that uh, technology, uh, this being a technology conference, uh, I love that we are uh, continuing on uh, with technology to be able to move forward. I'm going to be sharing my screen here. Let me know if you're having trouble. All, all as well. All right, so here we go. Uh, so you should be able to see uh, something that says AI for lawyers. Uh, the topic of this is uh, is something that people often care about. Uh, you know, how can I be cutting edge in my litigation practice? Uh, I was a litigator uh, for 15 years. I clerked for uh, chief judges of the state uh, appellate court and federal district court. Um, but I've also been a coder. I've coded since 1985 for the web since 1995. So, uh, so that kind of gives me a bit of perspective uh, to be able to uh, to be able to talk with you, uh, because uh, after I had finished litigating in 2015, I started working for Thomson Reuters. Uh, I pitched them uh, an idea. I said, "Here's software I think can change the legal world. You should build it and hire me." And they they uh, I worked with some really smart people on some really cool tech at Thomson Reuters. Uh, after that, I worked for. Uh, uh, cybersecurity company that, uh, that uh, one of my biggest projects was uh, Facebook had hired uh, me and my company to investigate Cambridge Analytica. Um, I, I can say that because uh, Facebook uh, has issued a press release as such. Uh, so for a long time I spent, uh, was able to work with some of the smartest people in data science and machine learning at one of the largest worldwide companies in data science and machine learning. Uh, to be able to gain insights into some problems. Uh, after I left that project and uh, that company, I started working for FastCase, uh, where today I'm working today uh, with some of the smartest people I've ever worked with uh, in my life on data science and machine learning to be able to uh, help uh, extract the DNA of the law to help legal research go forward. So I at FastCase am in charge of being able to think of where legal research will be in five years and helping that make, uh, make it happen today. Um, so I, as a coder, I've been developing for the, like I said, since uh, 85, for the web since 95. Uh, since uh, that being the case, I, I uh, know some things about AI, and I know also a lot about the practice of the law. So the biggest question is, uh, what is AI? And uh, that, that question uh, generally uh, has a lot of answers depending on who the questioner is and who the answerer is. Um, often people, when they think of AI, they think of magic. <laughs> they think if, if, I, uh, if I, it is amazing to me, therefore it is AI. Uh, but really, uh, when you think about the coders, uh, it's just code. This is just uh, being able to uh, have smart people figure out what the elements that you're looking for. In the AI, they call it feature set and just write it in something like you see in the screen here. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a, a, an example of, of true AI in uh, its base form. So really AI is just code and then coupled with, uh, with numbers. And so if you uh, use quote unquote AI to be able to create a graph on the left-hand side, you can see what are the outliers and what are the really core things that you care about. Um, so this, uh, when you really think about the nuts and bolts of AI, uh, this is what you see on your screen. This here and this here, and uh, it's really not robots uh, because you know what, the way most people think about AI, they say, "Well, do I know how this software works? Um, if I don't, wow, that's really amazing AI. Uh, if I do know how the software works in the way that I just showed you a moment ago, 
uh, it's just software. <laughs> this is just being able to uh, take code, smart people taking code, smart people taking what the user needs and being able to display it in a smart manner. Uh, so really, uh, the, rather than thinking about the way that you create good software, you really have to think about what is the end goal of legal software to be able to make AI and to be able to integrate AI into your practice. If, is the real goal automation? Uh, is the real goal to make a 10 hour task a two minute task or making it you know, even you know, halving or quartering the time? Um, if it makes me better, faster, stronger, um, is it AI or not? Well, it depends on, like I said, who's answering the question. Because if you ask a machine learning person or a data scientist, what is AI? You get something like this graph. AI is really an umbrella term that relates to a whole bunch of different technologies that depending on your end use, uh, that is most applicable for that, uh, that use and what they call in the software world use case. So, uh, so machine learning is something that uh, is taking the world by storm. So this is deep learning. This is being able to figuring out, uh, you know, what using a machine to, uh, you know, use a neural network, for example, to beat somebody in chess or to beat somebody in AlphaGo or something like that. That's machine learning. Natural language processing is taking text and being able to put it in a computational form. So taking unstructured data, judicial opinions, uh, you know, briefs, and then making it structured in a way that makes sense. This natural language processing is what's most important for legal technology uh, and most specifically for legal research. Uh, expert systems, this is something like TurboTax. So this is something like bankruptcy software. So if you are, uh, if you are really focused on being able to uh, if you know a domain really well, like TurboTax knows law, or I'm sorry, knows ta taxes very well, um, you can be able to figure out all of the edge cases and all the things that uh, are really needed to make a, a tax filing work and put it into an expert system. Uh, speech recognition is obvious. That's both speech to text, me speaking and then it outputting into text, and text to speech. Uh, if I input text, being able to read it out loud, that's speech recognition. Vision is, uh, image recognition has taken the world by storm. Uh, the biggest use case for that is uh, in, art, in uh, autonomous vehicles, to be able to figure out what's on the road and knowing whether that's a, a ball going across the road or a child going across the board, road or a deer or just a tumbleweed. Um, that's all image recognition, at least in the Tesla system. Uh, machine vision is a similar idea. Then there's also robotics, of course, of being able to put uh, something in the uh, physical world. Uh, planning, uh, there's some AI to be able to figure out what processes are most automatable and, and most uh, give you the most bang for the buck. And then artificial general intelligence is where the robot overlords take over our world. Uh, that's, that's where uh, robots become self-aware and become as intelligent as a human is. Um, this artificial general intelligence, there's a big debate in the community as to whether we'll ever get to that artificial general intelligence uh, rather than just kind of these point solutions here. So you'll note that here they, uh, they don't mention data science, uh, being able to plot things in a graph, and they don't mention just software. Uh, and that's, uh, that's important because when a lot of lawyers that I talk to talk about AI, they're just talking about software and they're just talking about data science. Uh, because you know, definitions, words matter, as lawyers, uh, we lawyers know. Uh, and so really the question is, uh, does AI definition matter? And, it probably doesn't, unless you want to sound smart. And then I would say, um, if you do want to uh, sound smart, you should speak less about AI and speak about what I can do to help my job, to talk about be making it better, faster, stronger. And using the word AI, um, as you could see in that last screen, probably doesn't, uh, doesn't make as much sense as just figuring out what point solutions in software uh, helps me do my job better, faster, stronger. And this is particularly important because of the duty of tech competence. Uh, under the ABA model rule 1.1, um, the lawyers need to be able to keep abreast with changes in the law in its practice, including both the benefits and risks of relevant technology. This is something that, uh, that is not uh, just a fringe uh, requirement. This is required in um, many, many states. Uh, and Bob Ambrosi has a really good uh, link here, uh, and I have it in my materials to be able to show all the states that have adop adopted this uh, duty of tech competence. So as a lawyer, what do I need to have as a minimum tech competence? And really the, uh, the idea here is there is yesterday's legal tech, there's today's legal tech, and there's tomorrow's legal tech. And so when people ask me the question, what kind of AI should I implement in my practice? Um, I have to assess where the questioner is today. Are they with yesterday's AI? Are they with today's AI? Or are they really looking for tomorrow's AI? Uh, because if you think about yesterday's AI, yesterday's AI, it looks a bit like this. Um, you know, if you had asked somebody in 1993 
to uh, be able to go from New York to New Jersey, uh, they would have driven out the paper map. Uh, but then if you would have showed the MapQuest in 1993, they would have said, that's an amazing AI. Um, but we know today that uh, that isn't amazing AI, it's just software. Um, go forward a few years and then say, I can actually navigate you through the world. And somebody would say, wow, that's amazing AI. Well, it's really not. It's just software. Uh, once you become used to it and you know how it works, it's just software. Um, tomorrow, it's going to look a bit more like this with heads-up displays being able to show you. And then even further yet, you have autonomous vehicles being able to take you forward. So really, when you think about what is AI in quotation marks, you have to think about, okay, uh, do I understand it? Uh, and if I do, it's just software. If I don't, it's AI. Um, so that kind of sheds light on whether the question of do I, should I use AI or not is a silly question or not. Um, because really, the people who work most in this field don't use AI at all. They just use the term uh, smart software. Right? Uh, what, what, are you, what is your goal, and how do you get to your goal, and what software do you use to be able to get there? So that's all framing the context of what lawyers should be thinking about when they consider, you know, when they say, when they ask the question, what AI should I use? And that goes back to my, my idea, should you focus on yesterday's AI, or 2020 AI, or tomorrow's AI? And really, the, after I get a sense of more of where the questioner is coming from and their current status, almost always the answer is that law that lawyer should focus on yesterday's AI, uh, which is uh, today's just software. And so yesterday's AI is Microsoft Word. If you'd shown Microsoft Word to somebody in 1970, they would have said, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You don't have to retype on a typewriter. Oh, right. But we all know that's just software. Microsoft Excel, oh my gosh, you don't have to run a ledger again and uh, hire a whole bunch of accountants to run these things. No, it's just software. Uh, Adobe PDF, <laughs> it's, a, it's just software. Uh, and uh, so really a lot of this disappointing answer uh, that is uh, to a lot of lawyers because they think, well, I wanna, I wanna have the razzle dazzle of tomorrow's practice. Uh, but really in software and in life, I guess we have a crawl, walk, run approach. Uh, before you start running, you need to crawl. And uh, after you start crawling, then you can walk. And then after walk, you run. Uh, really, the focus of the crawl stage is uh, Casey Flaherty's Proceritas. Uh, this is uh, something that he, uh, when he was in-house counsel, for, he was a practicing lawyer, went to in-house uh, for Kia, and then created this to be able to, after he realized that many lawyers have no idea how to use the tools they use every day. Uh, so if you are amongst those that are using Word like his typewriter, maybe you want to uh, be able to use the software in a way that is a lot faster, stronger, better. So being able to do the things that Proceritas walks through uh, is uh, important. If you can't do one or more of these things on the screen right now, uh, learn it today, because that's going to give you way more benefit than learning any quote unquote AI solution. Same thing with uh, Microsoft Excel. Learn how to use Excel in the way that Excel was meant to be used. Use PDFs in the way that PDFs are made to be used. So in that way, that's, that's really the lowest hanging fruit. And I've uh, li been listening to a bunch of uh, these speakers today. And that's really the idea is that uh, you don't have to have the whiz bang solution. Uh, use the tools that you have today that are often you already pay for or are free. Uh, and that will give you the most bang for your buck. If the, this is the question, are you paperless? Um, that is probably the wrong question to ask because even asking that question uh, makes you seem like an old, <laughs> the way the kids use it these days. Uh, anybody who is not paperless today, um, I think needs to get with the program because this is definitely yesterday's AI. Um, if you haven't uh, scanned, uh, you use ScanSnap, uh, Fujitsu, I, I have two of them at my house and I know many offices use them on every desk. Um, this is an amazing piece of software that will uh, that, uh, scan both sides at a time and then automatically OCR it uh, to be able to make it text searchable. Uh, Fujitsu is an amazing way to be able to have yesterday's AI today. Uh, another question is, uh, am I secure, right? What kind of AI do I need to do to be able to create, to be able to make something secure? Uh, and as I said, I, I worked in cybersecurity for a while and uh, I got that question a lot. What kind of cybersecurity, what do I need to do in cybersecurity to be secure? And I thought this analogy is important. Uh, you know, in your home security, you can have the door wide open or you could have Fort Knox. Um, and really, am I secure or not secure is not a binary question. Really, it's a spectrum. Where on that spectrum am I between door wide open and Fort Knox? And, and after I answer the question, where am I on that spectrum? Then you ask that to yourself, uh, where do I want to be on that spectrum? And then the next question is, how much do I want to spend in both in time and actual money to be able to get me more to the right? 
Uh, and then after you've uh, figured out both of those things, where am I, where do I want to be, and how much do I want to spend to get there, you have a much better answer than, quote unquote, am I secure or am I insecure? Because I, as many lawyers uh, answer, that is, uh, the answer is almost always in cybersecurity, much like the law, it depends. Uh, it depends on what you want and where you want to get there. So when you think about what, uh, what do I need to do to make myself more secure, you need to think about where are your most valuable items. Uh, that, of course, uh, that's why Willie Sutton robbed banks, because that's where the money is. Uh, so what, where's the money in your system? What is the most valuable thing that you have in your system uh, to be able to uh, protect? Uh, is it my client's new deal that they're going to be going through uh, in this merger and acquisition? Is it my client's uh, very confidential mental health issues that they're storing? Uh, figure out what your crown jewels are and what your client's crown jewels are in your systems and then be able to protect that as much as possible. Of course, today, uh, a place that we often keep these crown jewels is in the cloud. Uh, and that cloud can be Dropbox, it could be Google Drive, it could be um, Azure, it can be in any number of uh, areas. And there's, a, there's some good case law out there as to how much I need to secure uh, my content in the, in the cloud. And one of them is a, uh, is a uh, case out of the Western District of Virginia where the court said uh, that, uh, so let, let me tell you the background of the case. This is the case where um, uh, somebody used Dropbox uh, pre-litigation to be able to uh, communicate with their clients to be able to see how good the case is or not ca uh, good the case is. And they used an open Dropbox link. So anybody who has that link was able to open that communication. Uh, so this case went to litigation. And ultimately, the, uh, that link ended up in the hands of opposing counsel during the litigation. So opposing counsel clicked on the link, was able to see all of the pre-litigation communications between the client and lawyer. Uh, and then, of course, that, uh, the people that created the link in the first place with that privileged communication um, said to the court, hey, that's privileged. We need to claw that back. And that court said, well, they've conceded that putting that in the cloud using that Dropbox links, or actually it was a box.com link, but the same idea, is equivalent to leaving it in a bench in the public square and then telling the council where they could find it. Having that open Dropbox link where anybody with the link was able to open it, that court said that was essentially equivalent to leaving it that red rope in a public square. So you really need to think about um, how am I using technology in a secure way uh, that is not like leaving it out in a public square on a park bench. So with security, uh, you really think about, okay, there, um, when I was advising people on cybersecurity issues, uh, often as so many things, uh, people, processes, and technology are the three uh, legs of the stool that you have to have all three in place to be able to make sure that uh, the, the, you are secure. Uh, so are you training your people? Uh, are you in implementing the right technology? And then are you implementing the right processes and controls to ensure that the people are using the technology in a right way? Uh, once you get all three of those things together, then uh, that is essentially an AI for security, uh, which uh, as we go through this presentation, you'll realize that much of AI is just smart people doing smart things. So smart things that you can do with uh, cybersecurity is encrypt your devices, update your technology. That's updating is the biggest thing uh, to be able to say that uh, if you have an outdated version of Windows, outdated uh, version of your device, you are opening yourself up to a hack because odds are those have vulnerabilities. Um, use a password manager. Uh, some, uh, so often uh, the breaches that I responded to is where people had bad passwords that could be brute forced uh, and uh, that could be easy or that they reused from other areas. If you use the same password in two different places um, or say, God forbid, 10 different places or 50 different places, if one of those 50 different websites gets hacked, therefore every one of your, um, uh, every one of your accounts could be compromised pretty easily. Because if I'm an attacker and I get a password for one system, I'm gonna use that in all the systems to be able to see if somebody has reused the password. And I'm not gonna do that as a human, I'm gonna do that as a robot, where I'm gonna take the password and automatically try to log into hundreds or thousands of different systems to try to use that password in different ones. So if you as a user are using the same password in different areas, that is a bad, bad idea. Instead, use a password manager where you have unique passwords for every individual case. And not just unique passwords, but strong passwords. Uh, so you can have a 24 character random numbers and letters, but you don't need to remember it because you use one password uh, to be able to get into your password manager. And then that password manager uh, is able to figure out what uh, that password is, unique password is for that website. 
Um, the last is to be able to use multi-factor authentication. Um, that's uh, often called two-factor authentication or MFA. That's where um, everybody's used it, where you enter your username and password, and then it's, uh, the system says, all right, now we've just sent you an email, or now use this, uh, this, your mobile device to be able to log in using this two-factor or multi-factor authentication. Um, if you use that, um, that is going to thwart almost all of them, even the most uh, determined hackers to be able to get in there. So I would say all of these things that we have in here that are in the materials are AI for security as we go forward. Uh, lawyerist, I, I know Sam Glover. Uh, Sam Glover has been a, a friend for uh, many years and uh, his Lawyerist website, I know he spoke earlier today, his Lawyerist website and the uh, small firm roadmap in particular are just joys to read. And I would say that any solo small or even large firm lawyer, uh, this should be mandatory reading. Uh, both the small firm roadmap and the uh, Lawyerist website has a ton of smart, smart uh, ways that you can uh, be able to um, future proof your, uh, your uh, law practice. So up to this point, I've just been talking about yesterday's technology. This is what any, I would argue, minimally competent lawyer should be doing um, going forward. Um, so now what is today's AI? And uh, really, uh, uh, as, uh, as Chad Burton mentioned uh, earlier today, really the focus should be what are the processes? And once you figure out, well, first, what do I need to do? Uh, what are the processes I need to be able to get there? And then third, what's the technology to be able to implement that, uh, that task and those processes? Um, so really, uh, people often jump to the tech right away, where really the focus should be on task plus processes than tech. One of the processes that is relatively low-hanging fruit is a client intake. Uh, as a client comes in, well, first, how do I get the client? And then once I get the client, how do I bring them in? Um, there's many, many different areas uh, out there, including Chad has uh, listed a bunch of them, to be able to have intake uh, in ways that, uh, that make a lot more sense. And... Uh, you know, you might think, okay, this, this website that I'm showing here, is that AI? Um, well, no, this is just software. This is just a website to be able to make uh, intake easier. Uh, but if it takes three assistants' jobs, right, if you used to have three assistants doing intake, and now you replace it with this, um, is that AI? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, um, also, if, uh, if there's a net promoter score, uh, they, uh, people who know net promoter scores, uh, this is how happy your current customers are, uh, your current clients are with your work. Um, if you send out this net promoter score questionnaire and then they're able to tell you uh, how well you're doing, um, does that replace your marketing team or does that replace your assistant who used to do that? Um, is that AI? Probably not. Um, and, you know, just this last presenter was talking about email marketing and, and other uh, web marketing. Of course, that's, uh, that's really not AI. Uh, that's, uh, that's just uh, software. Uh, encryption is something that any minimally competent person these days, I would say, uh, should be using. Um, whether they're using uh, their current uh, uh, ISP, so say you use Comcast for your internet service pro provider, um, or God forbid you're doing research from Starbucks or some other uh, relatively open Wi-Fi, you should be using VPN. And what a VPN is, is essentially a tunnel to be able to uh, uh, prohibit Starbucks uh, and their Wi-Fi to be able to see what client communications you're sending over uh, the system. Uh, so th between VPN and uh, the uh, secure socket layer, that's uh, when you see HTTPS, uh, that S means secure. Uh, so between that secure socket layer and VPN, uh, that's uh, a minimum competency to keep the bad guys from being able to eavesdrop into what you're seeing. In legal research, the, uh, the today's AI uh, is what I'm really spending most of my day uh, being able to talk about and being able to work day to day. Uh, one of the biggest aspects of today's AI for legal research is, and is natural language processing. Uh, in the uh, machine learning folks call it NLP. Uh, and the way that uh, that's used is that you can say, um, what are the elements of a breach of contract claim in Minnesota? Um, what we are using and what most legal research companies like Thomson Reuters and Lexis and Bloomberg and others, uh, what they're doing is they're stripping out the things that matter. So I know that elements is a thing that matters. Breach of contract is a thing that matters. Uh, Minnesota is a thing that matters. And once I can strip that out, uh, then I'm able to collect it and then feed it back to the uh, lawyers that need to do legal research. So now I could be able to show, here are all the cases that relate to a breach of contract claim, or here are all the briefs that list breach of contract claims in them. And we can filter it just to Minnesota, or we can show just the ones that talk about the elements. Um, if you know what the things are, you're able to better use them. In the same way, figuring out that Judge Smith 
uh, and lawyer Jones practice in the Southern District of New York, um, knowing that Judge Smith is a person and that this Judge John Smith is different than that Judge John Smith. Uh, and knowing that this lawyer, Jane Jones, is different than that lawyer, James Jones. Uh, in the natural language processing world, they call that a disambiguation, uh, to be able to take ambiguous terms and be able to figure out, well, this lawyer, Jones, is always in the Southern District of New York, where that lawyer, Jones, is always in the District of Wyoming. Um, so being able to know uh, which lawyer, Jones, is which lawyer, Jones, and which Judge Smith is which Judge Smith, that's something that is, uh, is also pretty decent for NLP. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, it's not just hitting a button and spitting out the answer. Um, it requires humans to be able to figure out, okay, this lawyer Jones, uh, based on the data, is based in Southern District, and that lawyer Jones is based in Wyoming. Um, so in that way, uh, that's, uh, you know, a, a drum that I keep beating is uh, the more you learn about AI and the more you learn about machine learning, the more you realize that there's a lot of humans behind the scenes using smart software to be able to get to the answer. And then to the end user, it seems like magic. Uh, but in the practice, it's really humans uh, being able to use that data in a smart way. And one of the smart ways that we do is, is uh, Docket Alarm is a uh, product from uh, Fastcase. It's, uh, we acquired the company in 2018. And so uh, it's, uh, it's a way that we have essentially taken, uh, we have 365 or so, 365 million documents from courts all over the country, state and federal courts, uh, where we have stripped the things that I just uh, showed you earlier. And then when you search Docket Alarm, you can find, show me all of the cases where this is a party, or this is a lawyer, or this is the status of the case, or this is the breach of contract, or this is the uh, thing, how, this is how many dollars are at stake. Once you've extracted it, you're able to give a nice, uh, decent uh, demonstration of uh, what uh, you're looking for and how to get there. So here's an example of uh, it in, uh, in practice. So if I want to be able to see uh, you know, uh, everything by uh, this firm or by this judge or using the civil cases versus commercial cases versus contract cases versus tort cases, um, you're able to quickly go down to the facets to be able to uh, find the thing you want and be able to go forward. So that's today's technology. Of course, tomorrow's technology, you can imagine uh, that we're working on is uh, even, even more fun than that. Another aspect of today's uh, AI is document assembly. Uh, how can I be able to take something that, uh, you know, I've created this form hundreds of times before, uh, how do I not recreate the wheel to be able to create it again? Uh, Hot Docs has been the 800 pound gorilla for many years on being able to uh, uh, essentially automate processes, uh, but it is a, kind of a, um, it is a system that has uh, been around for a long time and its age has shown a bit. Um, another uh, document assembly product is Templify. Uh, being able to uh, being able to use more of a web-based approach to be able to make uh, them. Um, another that has gotten a lot of good traction is a, a open source software called DocAssemble. And for those who don't know what open source is, that's essentially free, uh, free to the end user to be able to uh, implement in the way that they'd like. Uh, and uh, right now, David Colarusso uh, out of uh, Suffolk University is as, as uh, and uh, Quentin Steenhuis. Uh, is also working on a doc assemble project uh, that is essentially automating all of the uh, District of Massachusetts and all of the Massachusetts courts forms. Uh, so during COVID uh, that uh, people who uh, don't have access to the courts uh, will still have access to justice. And they're using doc assemble in a way to be able to do that. So doc assemble is something that if you haven't heard about it, you should probably check out. Um, as I said before, and I'll say again, uh, Lawyerist is a, a, a great website. Uh, if you want to learn about document assembly, uh, uh, Sam Harden, who is a really smart dude uh, and has done a lot of doc assemble things for law, um, he uh, has a nice do-it-yourself uh, document assembly uh, listing to be able to do that. Um, beyond document assembly, there's also project management. Uh, how do I be able to get my case or how do I get my matter through the pipeline more quickly, more efficiently, and with fewer errors and to be able to actually do it better than before. Um, one way that software developers and more lawyers are being able to do project management is through something called Kanban. Uh, so if, uh, if you think about a uh, regular to-do list, uh, this, that's all Kanban is. So if you have essentially all the things I need to do on the left column, and then if I start doing the thing, I move it to the middle column. And then when I'm done doing the thing, I move it to the right column. So this is, uh, of course, uh, using post-it notes is really helpful if you're in an in-person environment. Uh, but if, even if you're in a software environment, uh, lots of lawyers are using Kanban as a way to be able to uh, know what is going on with my matters. So here's an example of a legal software uh, that is using a Kanban board to say, okay, here's a new business. Now it's going through intake. It's going through planning. Um, now I'm engaged with them. I'm billing them. And now I've closed the case. 
Um, so moving all the way through the system is essentially a Kanban board. And so I, as a senior partner in this law firm, can be able to see all of my matters and be able to see where each of the tasks for that matter is in this process. And if something has been hanging out in doing, for example, for a while, um, and, uh, and has not gone to done, um, I can be able to say, hey, Jane, what's going on with this uh, doing thing? Do you need help? Or John, uh, it looks like you've been spending two days on this thing that should be only taking a day. How can I help you in this? Um, so these kind of Kanban boards through project planning um, can eliminate a lot of emails or a lot of Slack uh, communications or a lot of phone calls uh, and instead be able to just get a high level view of what's going on uh, without having to have meetings or uh, stuff like that. Um, Kanban boards have, uh, these COVID times, uh, taken a new, uh, new different meeting uh, where my wife, unbeknownst to me, started a Kanban board for my seven-year-old, <laughs> where uh, she had, uh, my wife had learned from some neighbors that this is a great way for um, anyone, a seven-year-old, to be able to see, here are the tasks that I need to do today, and to give that seven-year-old the joy of moving the task over to done. Uh, there is some uh, primal uh, joy that comes from moving something from today, uh, doing to done, and uh, giving a seven-year-old is uh, that uh, is something certainly fun to be able to do. Uh, Trello is a, a way that you can use to Kanban boards. Um, some people might use Trello, and this is an example of a way that you can use, okay, here are all the things I need to do in this litigation. Um, I'm waiting for this. The client needs to be able to give me something. Um, now, uh, this is something I need to do right now. I'm doing it, and now I'm done with it. And you can imagine that there's maybe a, a tag on this Trello board is Jane is doing this thing, uh, John is doing that thing, and, uh, and Joe is doing that thing. Uh, Trello and others also permit templates. Uh, so you can imagine that if there is a uh, 100 tasks in a particular matter, um, and those tasks are repeatable for every matter that comes through the door, you need to be able to repeat it. <clears throat> you can create templates. <coughs> excuse me, you can create templates where you're able to say this is a uh, breach of contract motion that needs to be done and then create the card and be able to templify, uh, templatify the Kanban board as well. Practice management is something that is, uh, is of course, uh, even more important, not just from the lead generation sense, but also in doing the work and then billing for the work. And of course, the 800 pound gorilla in the practice management is, uh, space is Clio. Uh, Clio is, uh, you know, gives you a lot for intake. It gives a lot uh, on the calendar of who, who's doing what when. Uh, the tasks, uh, as far as the matter, the things that need to get done, all of your matters, all of your contacts, et cetera. Um, all, having a one-stop shop for such things is, uh, is what Clio does pretty well. Rocket Matter is one of the competitors, of course, that does that uh, similarly. Uh, so, you know, is practice management AI? Well, I guess to, if you showed practice management to someone in uh, 1993, they'd say, oh yeah, totally AI. Uh, but it's really just today's uh, tech. Calendar automation is AI-like, uh, even though it's just smart software. Um, if I use Calendly, for example, and some people may have encountered that, to be able to uh, see John Smith's uh, calendar and see a slot in John Smith's calendar without having to call John Smith or John Smith's assistant, um, that uh, sounds like artificial intelligence, uh, but it's really just smart software. Uh, acuity scheduling is the same way, uh, where you can uh, you be able to schedule appointments much like Calendly. Uh, uh, cloud automation, uh, this is something that, uh, that uh, Chad Burton mentioned is uh, Zapier is a, is a really smart cloud automation where I can just say, okay, take any new email that I get, whether it's from uh, Office 365 or Gmail, et cetera. Um, and then once uh, I get an email that maybe has these, uh, these keywords in it, uh, then make a Trello card that uh, sets it up for the next uh, item. So <clears throat> again, this is not this is just software, this is not AI, uh, but to the end user, it seems like AI because it makes uh, things so much faster uh, than it would have otherwise. Uh, if this then that is another, uh, uh, another item much like, uh, much like Zapier, uh, where uh, you can be able to create cloud-based actions. Voice recognition, this is now, this is going from just software, like if this, then that, and, uh, and uh, other things, but in going into true AI, if you remember the, the graph that we showed earlier, uh, voice recognition is there. And whether you're looking at, uh, at an Apple device or a Google device, Android, or a Microsoft, uh, say Microsoft 365 or Windows or otherwise, um, this is truly AI. So you can use a, the word AI in the truest sense to be able to <clears throat> show, uh, that this is, uh, this is the machine learning people won't snub their noses by uh, calling Siri or, uh, or this AI. An example of a way that, that we as lawyers can use AI in a practice 
and voice recognition is in our practice is uh, Office 365, and so many people use uh, Office and Word these days. You can see in the top right corner, there's something uh, called Dictate. Uh, this is relatively new, but it's incredibly powerful. Uh, where uh, in the past you used to have to use Dragon Naturalist Speaking or some other third party uh, resource to be able to, um, to, be able to uh, get the results that you're, I'm gonna show you in a moment here. Uh, but it's just baked into Word. Uh, so if you subscribe to uh, Office 365, uh, now I guess Microsoft 365, you're able to do cool stuff like this. Uh, you just click on dictate and then you speak. Uh, you can speak things like this is a motion to dismiss, uh, period. Opposing counsel is a bad person who represents bad clients, period. They need to lose, period. Uh, so that's, uh, that's super fast. Uh, and anybody who's dictated and then uh, waited for their assistant to be able to uh, get back to them with the dictation, uh, this is like magic. Uh, this is AI, but it's AI in the truest sense uh, that this will save you a ton of time and you don't have to pay anything extra for it. Um, so uh, there's a, uh, the way that it's uh, able to, and if you've tried Dragon Natural speaking in the past <clears throat> and you've been less than thrilled with results, like I was less than thrilled with results, um, you, you're gonna wanna try this Office 365 because it's, it's really, it doesn't require the training that uh, Dragon Natural speaking used to have. And uh, Microsoft and Google and Facebook and others have taken huge strides in the last two years in voice recognition and in natural language processing that makes this kind of voice recognition possible. So they um, have essentially, Google has created a thing called BERT, B-E-R-T, that has ingested the entire corpus of Wikipedia and the entire corpus of Google Books and then ran it through a machine learning system to figure out how words are used. Uh, so you could see that uh, it knows the system. So anyway, Google open sourced BERT. Uh, so Microsoft is the beneficiary of Google's uh, open source BERT. Facebook is the beneficiary of open source BERT. And now Microsoft and Facebook have built upon BERT to make things even better. So you can see what's going on your screen right now. Um, you can imagine that uh, period could mean punctuation or period could mean uh, a period in a, uh, in a basketball game, the first period, second period, third period. Uh, but through context, it knows that, uh, you know, it initially puts period, but then it knows, okay, that's, that's actually punctuation, not second period or third period. Uh, so in, in that way, it knows how words work in sentences. Therefore, it provides what is actually really good results. Um, so again, this is today's AI that is baked in that you don't have to pay extra money for. Data science is something that a lot of people are saying, well, we need AI to be able to figure out what kind of cases are winners and what kind of cases are losers uh, and how I'm gonna win more often than uh, losing. Uh, and when people use AI in that sense, they're really talking about data science. They're talking about being able to analyze the data and be able to see, this is an example from Docket Alarm, which judge handles the most semiconductor cases and how many they do in any given date. And when they, uh, when they do this, uh, how, how often do they find in front of uh, the plaintiff and how often do they find in the defendant? Um, this is not something where you hit a button with AI and tell you, it tells you what to do but this is actually just analyzing the data. You as a human now have a better visualization of the data to then you as a human make a better decision as to what you need to do and what kind of advice you can give to your clients. This is the essence of data science. And you can do that not only for judges, but you could also say for when I'm against this party or when I'm against this law firm or when I'm against this lawyer, this is how often they win or lose in this type of matter, in this type of judge, in this jurisdiction. Uh, and again, this is not an AI spitting out the answer. This is you using AI tools, uh, data science, to be able to uh, give your lawyers better results or give your clients rather better results. So that's largely today's, uh, uh, today's AI. So when you think about what's coming down the pike for tomorrow, what are we, do, what are we uh, people in the white lab, lab coats thinking about and doing to be able to make life uh, better for tomorrow? Uh, one way to do that is uh, anyone who's, uh, uh, Diagram sentences. I wish we were in person because I could have people raise hand if they uh, the thing you see on your screen is something that is is uh, is actually interesting to you. Uh, diagramming sentences, I loved doing in grade school and, and middle school. Uh, it was one of my favorite tasks, uh, and amazingly, that's what we today in natural language processing do today too. Um, natural language processing is an uh, aspect of being able to figure out that I is the uh, is the um, uh, the the subject. Eight is the verb, and then these are noun phrases, the spaghetti with chopsticks. And this is a prepositional phrase with chopsticks. 
So breaking down a sentence into its component parts is what's called natural language processing. And so if you figure out how these sentences work, uh, then you're able to give much better insights as to um, what the sentences mean and what the words mean. So for example, if you, uh, this is a, a, an output of a natural language processing task. So I as a data scientist and I as a machine learning person can be able to figure out where these points are and then figure out what the groupings are. I can figure out uh, that the, the way that these words are used are used similarly if they're in the same two, three, 2D space. So for example, uh, kitchen, vanity, sink, bathtub, they're both A, used frequently together, and then B, often used in the same way. So once I as a human look at these results, I as a human can group them together and say, okay, these blue things are probably similar. Uh, similarly, uh, refrigerator microwave, those are also appliances, but they're probably in a different group. So I then put a yellow <laughs> circle around there, fan and light on a different one. And then, uh, so in that way, you can see that this is machine learning on the front end and kind of data science on the front end, but then I as a human have to interpret that front end to be able to figure out the back end, uh, what to make sense of it. And you get into some weird edge cases, uh, like you can see that shower, valve, kit, garden hose, sprinkler, um, those are all things that kind of spout water, um, but they spout water in different contexts. So putting a green circle around those things is less uh, cut and dried uh, than it, it might otherwise seem. And there's also a Venn diagram where shower is both uh, in the kitchen. Uh, it's also kitchen bathtub, right? Uh, but it's also like a valve. So this gets into something that, you know, people have talked a lot about AI bias, for example. What is the, what is the bias? And the bias really comes into who is going to decide that the green things go together and the blue things go together and the old yellow things go together. Um, that's humans. Uh, and humans naturally have bias. Uh, and, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, you know, uh, am I biased? Uh, you know, if I choose that these things are together, um, does that mean that I'm biased against spouting uh, versus uh, biased against uh, bathroom appliances? No, it's, I mean, it's, I, yes, I guess the answer is uh, that, uh, but it's not an uh, unreasonable bias. So uh, as people are being able to cluster the results of the machine learning algorithms uh, together, um, that naturally relates to bias. And hopefully the tools that you use and the uh, teams that are building the software that you're using are, are making the right choices to be able to put the cluster of the things in the right areas. So natural language processing is the way that Google, for example, when you do a search and you search for Paris, it knows that Paris, France is different than Paris, Texas is different than Paris Hilton. And it knows that uh, if you say uh, Paris landmarks, um, you're probably talking about Paris, France. Um, if you, and if you say Paris Eiffel Tower, then you're definitely talking about uh, Paris, France. And if you talk about, uh, you know, if you include Texas in it, you know that's that. If you talk about, you know, uh, socialite, uh, then you're probably thinking about Paris Hilton. So um, knowing what language, uh, the context is the most important thing for natural language processing. So in the same way, uh, if I figure out, okay, I want to motion dismiss in Minnesota, if you run that query in a, in a uh, legal research, um, I'm going to want to know that Minnesota is a uh, jurisdiction, California's jurisdiction. And you might want to know that motion to dismiss in Minnesota is the equivalent of demur in California, much like Paris, France, Paris, Texas. Um, you might want to know synonyms are similar to each other and then cluster them similarly. I talked a bit about bias uh, a bit ago. And really, you want to think about, um, you know, what, what is bias and how do I um, identify it in the first place and how do I counteract it in the second place? Uh, and really uh, training data, uh, and we're really focused on machine learning here. This is where you ingest the entire Wikipedia data set or the entire uh, corpus of Google Books and you're able to figure out uh, uh, what things go together. And you come into some problems and you have to think about, okay, do I want to reflect how the world is or do I want to reflect how the world should be? because machine learning just reflects what the world is. And uh, a frequent task for machine learning is if you have king and then you subtract man from king and then you add woman to king, do you ultimately get queen? And this isn't just a hypothetical. This is something that actual machine learning folks in natural language processing run a test through machine learning uh, algorithms to be able to see whether if you take king, subtract man, add woman, do you get queen at the end? Um, and the way that this shows up in graphs looks like this. So you can see that king and queen at the top, um, king goes really, skews really for, far correlated to he, and queen uh, goes further correlated to she. 
of course, you know, there are other queens. Uh, there are drag queens, uh, which is some people might refer to he or some people might refer to she. That's why king is pretty far on the left-hand side and queen isn't quite as far to the right side. Um, so then when you have uh, that, and that's, you know, that's pretty high uh, on the uh, queen woman scale, um, you also have brother, sister, and, uh, you know, heir and heiress, nephew, uncle, right? And these types of things, they're skewed that way. Um, so if you take king and you subtract man, then you should get queen. That's the idea. Um, that's an easy uh, solution. Uh, a harder solution is what about doctor? Um, if you take uh, the machine learning out of the box, say you take the Google Books data set, um, the Google Books data set, if you input doctor, the output is he. And why is it he? <laughs> it's because books from say 1970 backward um, frequently correlated doctor with man, doctor he, doctor his. Uh, so the machine doesn't know any better. It says, okay, doctor is closely correlated with he, therefore I'm going to say that doctor is a man. So now I as, you know, and this is me as the hypothetical I, uh, as a machine learning person, what do I do with that information? I know obviously that doctor he is the wrong result because doctor is not he anymore. That is the way the world was maybe in 1950 backward, but it's not the way the world is, nor is it the way the world should be. So do I, as a researcher um, creating machine learning products, do I then put my thumb on the scale and say, okay, even though the Google algorithm spit out he and man for doctor, um, that's not true. I'm gonna put my thumb on the scale and gonna say uh, doctor equals man or woman equally. Um, now I've just made a decision that's probably the right decision, but it's still a bias. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, am I making the right call there? And I think the answer is yes, I am making the right call. Uh, but that's just one call of hundreds or thousands of calls that people that are doing this work every day need to make. And so this is, a, this is a, a, just one demonstration of uh, the way areas where bias is not um, necessarily a, uh, an evil, uh, bias is a reality uh, that just reflects how these, kind of change, uh, these kinds of uh, decisions need to be made every day. Uh, four minute warning, uh, so I, I have four minutes left. I'm gonna jump through the rest of my slides very quickly. Uh, Another idea is uh, for, uh, people may have heard about the bias in AI for uh, being able to figure out whether somebody should be out on bail or not. Um, the algorithm did not take into account uh, race, uh, at least on the surface, but they did take into account uh, area code. And of course, uh, black, so the question is, should this person be let out on bail? Uh, if they were in a black area code, generally the answer uh, the computer spit out was no. Uh, they should not because uh, they were in this area code. Uh, of course, area code was just a proxy for uh, for uh, proxy for uh, race. So really, even though it's uh, non-malicious, the people coding that system didn't mean to be racist, uh, the result ended up being racist. So that kind of demonstrates the difficulty in uh, eliminating bias from AI systems. Uh, another way is to be able to say, um, if you are really ambitious about tagging things uh, uh, and you get somebody to, uh, to tag things uh, that uh, maybe, you know, the mechanical Turk uh, people may have heard about. Uh, this is a way that humans are being able to tag things. And this is uh, mechanical Turk is a, is a software from, uh, from Amazon that uh, has low paid workers, you know, say minimum wage workers actually doing computer like tasks. So if you have mechanical Turk people tagging things and they have a bad day, that's gonna result in bad data. So even though it's not malicious, it's, it's still a bias uh, that has to be overcome. Uh, biases are everywhere. And so the question is, do we want to be better than our current world or do we want to be better than humans? Um, and really our bias historically from the 1800s, um, there is a bias as to what you get, for example, in legal research results. Um, what opinions get published? Uh, who decides that? The judge, right? I, I worked for two judges, uh, both of whom said, okay, this is a published opinion. And then this is an unpublished opinion. That is a human bias uh, that really determined whether something goes into Westlaw or fast case or anything like that. Um, and that human bias says, well, this case isn't as important or it doesn't break new ground or it doesn't really do this. Um, this is, uh, and one uh, judge uh, I talked to said, uh, I publish a case uh, per term, one for each clerk. So I want each clerk to have a published case under their belt. Uh, that is a human bias, certainly, that doesn't relate uh, to any substantive reason. Um, so anyway, so when you think about AI, you would have to think, okay, what kind of bias uh, should this machine created a, uh, bias be better than? Uh, does it just have to be better than that judge deciding that one for each clerk is a, a, a good way to go about things or should it be another, uh, another method? 
uh, there's a systemic bias. Uh, there's uh, smart uh, people that have run, uh, you know, I've, I've done some analyses and in right now in Docker Alarm, you could be able to see the law firm gender um, of people before this court. And you can see that only 10% for this particular law firm uh, practiced before this court. Um, you could also run analytics to say, um, what are the uh, win-loss records for a woman as compared to a man? And some smart researchers have run the numbers and they say there's about a 10% swing that if female, you are more likely to lose. Um, and you, that, that happens even whether uh, you take into account the gender of the judge uh, or anything. So, um, so if that is true, and I'm not going to posit whether it's true or not, but at least a lot of researchers say that it's true, um, what do we do with that information? Uh, now that the data has borne that out, um, that systemic bias, what do I as a judge do if I know that? I, as a judge, now find uh, against female litigators uh, more often than male litigators, do I put my own thumb on my own scale with that information? Um, and is it, is it better to have that information or not have that information? I would argue much better to have that information to be able to assess our biases and have it laid out in black and white to be able to address them. So if, uh, if uh, so really the question is, do I hold AI to a higher standard than our current system is? Uh, and can AI really uh, put to light these systemic biases that we have today? Do we want uh, the standard to be, is it as good as humans or is slightly worse than humans okay? And a big question for that is autonomous vehicles. Uh, if it has the same death rate as we currently have on our roads, um, is that enough to say, all right, we're gonna be great. Um, it has the same death rate as, oh, I think I may have been muted. Yeah, you were just for a second, I unmuted you. Okay, cool. Uh, and I, just uh, what's what's my time? Uh, and we have uh, how many more minutes? Maybe just one more minute uh, to wrap up, and then we'll get into questions if that's okay. That's so, that's so great. Uh, so uh, I guess largely um, the big question is uh, how often do ever does everybody get it wrong? You have to test to be able to figure out uh, whether somebody got it wrong or not, or whether uh, people uh, computers got it wrong or not. So I guess I'll, I'll finish by saying that uh, these are all really interesting things uh, that you know, AI and tomorrow's AI is a place that I live every day and I feel fortunate to be able to create um, what is going to be the future of legal research and legal practice every day. Um, and, uh, but really, the, as I said in, earlier in the presentation, um, if you are uh, already uh, doing these today's and yesterday's AI, then certainly think about tomorrow's AI. Uh, but if you're not doing today's AI and certainly if you're not doing yesterday's AI, do that first. Uh, don't worry as much about what's coming down the pike and the whiz-bang biases questions that we're having. Um, figure out how to use Word uh, because that's gonna give you the most bang for your buck. Uh, looking at uh, the questions, uh, did I include uh, TurboTax as an example of AI? Uh, based on uh, your criteria, it's only software with accounting functions basically at that. Uh, even at the interview method, nothing is more a different way to fill in the blanks. It really doesn't do uh, any thinking for the user. So that's, I used AI because AI, TurboTax is a, an example of an expert system that is an expert putting together a system to be able to create an output. Uh, and that's, a, it, TurboTax is a common uh, example used by many people as an expert system. Uh, you can imagine that there are many a, uh, expert systems for the law. Uh, we at FastCase have uh, a, a, something called Next Chapter that is bankruptcy software that is much like TurboTax. If I as the user, and in this case, our users are bankruptcy lawyers, not consumers. But if I as a bankruptcy lawyer enter in a, a bunch of uh, answers to questions, it'll spit out the form in the way that is uh, good for that jurisdiction and in a way that is uh, most likely good for that, uh, for that client. So uh, in that way, it's not giving answers to the bankruptcy lawyer, uh, but it's giving a better way to be able to form those answers. So I, I would say that uh, the heart of your question is it's not, I still have to think. Um, it's not doing the thinking for me. And I'd say that's exactly right. And that's kind of the point of my whole presentation is that AI is not hit a button and spit out the answer. AI is just software that lawyers can use to be able to better assess uh, what the answer is. Um, if using the female litigator example, um, AI will tell me what the data is on how many women win or lose, but it's up to me as a judge or as a litigator to do something with that information. Thank you, Mr. Real, so much. We very much appreciate you coming and talking. Um, and so now we're going to go ahead and move along to our next speaker, Ms. Danielle Giraud. She is the uh, a partner at Harmon and Clater, and she's going to be talking about the ethical use of social media and technology. Hi, how are you? Thank you for um, 
virtually hosting me. And after five weeks of quarantine, it's nice to have an excuse to wear something other than sweatpants. Um, as as uh, Catherine just said, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the ethical use of social media and technology. Um, it is uh, a pretty discreet topic, but let me give you some context um, for at least the lens through which I see this information. I am a, um, I'm a I do civil litigation defense. Uh, and it's a wide variety of uh, areas, but mostly products liability, premises liability, um, motor vehicle accidents, uh, personal injury cases, anything really under, under those torts. And so as you can imagine, social media um, has a significant role in that practice because it is a, a gold mine of information. And I have been practicing about 20 years now and um, discovery and investigation has dramatically changed over that time, just um, taking Facebook as an example, I didn't have that when I first started. If I needed to get surveillance on a plaintiff, I would have to hire an investigator. He or she would have to go tra you know, uh, tra trail the plaintiff for a few days, maybe get some video, maybe not. Nowadays, I get free surveillance on the internet. And it is um, unbelievable the amount of information that's out there. I, I typically know so much about a plaintiff in a personal injury case before I ever ask my first question in a deposition. I know so much about the, the potential jurors in the pool before the, the first day of, uh, of trial ever starts. And so we put so much of our, ourselves out there on the internet and oftentimes I think we don't even realize um, who may eventually see it. Um, there are many examples that I could give to you of a litigant in a personal injury case who says one thing about how hurt they are with their abilities to do something, maybe or may not be, that is directly contradicted by their posts on Facebook or um, videos or comments they put on other people's websites. Uh, most people have some kind of social media. Um, and even if you think you're safe because you don't do Facebook or you don't have social media, I'm gonna guess you're probably wrong. Um, even if you don't do social media, there's a really good chance that your spouse, your kids, your employer, someone has posted something about you, excuse me, on Facebook. Uh, and usually I find the best material on a plaintiff on social media sites that don't actually belong to that plaintiff. And they have no idea that it's even out there. But there are pitfalls. And so um, you know, what I am doing in this presentation, here, let me uh, start here. Um, what I'm doing in this presentation is um, showing uh, just you that uh, uh, some of the different pitfalls that can come up. Our, our rules of professional conduct and responsibility um, haven't really caught up quite yet. Um, can everyone see that, that, pres that up there? Uh, not yet. It, it, maybe there try we go. Yeah. Is that, how about now? Sometimes there's a lag, but uh, okay. you, you should be able to click the share button and then select the screen that you want to share and then click share. Uh, try it one more time. We'll do. Let's see. Share. There you go. There we go. All right. And then, yeah, start uh, from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I'm just gonna, my, my time is relatively short. I have about 30, 35 minutes. And so I've chosen some of uh, the, the uh, more common ethical issues that come up in the context of social media and technology. Um, these are going to be specific to the Virginia rules, but really the, the principles apply no matter what jurisdiction you're in. And so the first one I'd like to start with is the duty of competence. And that's rule 1.1 of the Virginia rules of professional conduct. And you can see it there, it's, it's very simple, but basically it says that a lawyer, you, know, you need to be competent, you need to know what you're doing, you have to be educated in order to provide uh, the best representation to your client. Now this rule obviously does not specifically mention social media, it doesn't say anything about technology, but this rule does track the ABA model rule 1.1 and in 2012 the ABA added a comment to that rule that, that specifically referenced that lawyers must be kept abreast of changes in the law and the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. Uh, so you are required to know what social media is and how, you, and how to use social media and technology in your practice. You can't 
push this off to uh, another attorney at your firm, an associate. You can't push this off to a paralegal. You can't say, oh, I'm just not good with computers. This isn't, so, I don't like social media. You have an ethical obligation to at least know the basics. Um, and so I give a, um, I typically give a much longer presentation on this issue where I get into the, the nitty gritty, um, sort of like the technical aspects of how you go about doing searching, how to review emails without changing the metadata, things of that nature. Now, I'm going to touch on just some of the basics right now about what lawyers should know. Um, now, the you should obviously know what are the most popular media sites. Now, it seems like a new one pops up every week or so, but you need to know about Facebook, about Instagram, about Twitter, about LinkedIn. Um, these are the, the biggest ones. But if you have no idea what, what I mean when I say TikTok, you need to learn about that. Maybe ask a teenager to find out what's the latest one that's being used out there. Um, and not only just knowing the, the names of these services, but how they work and what information is available on these sites and what you can get from them and how you can get from them, uh, get, get that information from them. For example, in Facebook, and I see people do this quite often, they'll just go to Facebook and type in someone's name and then oh, nothing showed up, I guess, you know, they don't have Facebook. And most often it's, it, that's not accurate. Uh, it requires a little bit more searching to, to sometimes to find someone's Facebook profile. I'm not an expert on Facebook's logarithms. I don't know why certain names come up, you know, and others don't. Uh, but often when I start to search for a plaintiff, I don't find them. But then later I'll be on their spouse's Facebook page. I look at their friend list and sure enough, there's the plaintiff right there um, on the friend list. And I'll find their Facebook page that way, even though I didn't find it uh, in the search box. You need to first though, obtain, know how to obtain the necessary information in order to search social media effectively. When you first get in the case, and that's when you really should be doing your social media searches on the litigants in the case, both your client as well as the uh, opposing client, um, op opposing party. Uh, but you need to use sites like PeopleMap or Spokio or just to get how, how old is this person? Who are their relatives? Where do they live? What, who's their employer? This type of information is not necessarily something you may have at the beginning of a lawsuit, but it's vital information to help you narrow down those searches, particularly if someone has a very common name. You also need to know the, the language of social media so you can um, figure out what materials you should be asking for in discovery. For example, what are profiles, posts, messages, DMs, forwards, replies, comments, videos, uh, any, any of that status updates, what, what are all those words mean? And, and, and it, they can change depending on which social media site you use. So when you write your interrogatories or your document requests, you need to know what language to ask for because otherwise they may just think you mean their posts, their photographs on, on Facebook and not going to their um, Facebook Messenger, instant messages, DMs, in order to get information that also may be relevant. You also need to know a lot of technical things, like how do you download information on a Facebook page? How do you preserve that information? Um, and what are the legal limitations on you getting information from Facebook? I will tell you, based on my experience, that Facebook, if you send them a subpoena in California, they won't, even if you have a California counsel who will uh, send you, who will assist you with serving that subpoena, um, they will not respond to it. They will say that under the Stored Communications Act, that information has to come from the user uh, of Facebook and not Facebook itself. Even if you have a release signed by that party that gives you the opportunity to, to access their page, uh, Facebook will not respond to that. So you need to know what um, those legal limitations are as well. Another big issue, and, and I'll get to this even more in a little bit, but it's just how to ethically access private information on social media. Generally, courts will allow the discovery of material posted on social networking sites if it is relevant to the litigation and the discovery request is narrowly tailored. So you can't do a phishing expedition. You just can't say, give me everything that you have on Facebook, download your whole page, or give me your, um, your username and your password and let me go into it myself. Um, generally, I would start with a written request uh, an interrogatory or document request um, that asks for any social media evidence that's either where you're talking about or that's relevant to the accident itself or um, to your injuries. That's usually where I start. 
And, you know, it's unfortunate. We don't, in any other respect in cases, we don't rely uh, or trust the other side to decide what is relevant or what is not. There may be photographs on a plaintiff's Facebook page that I think are very relevant to the case that the plaintiff may not see any relevance at all. Uh, but unfortunately, that's where we are right now. We really do have to rely on the other side um, to produce those that, that, that evidence um, that, that is relevant in the case. And, um, and once you have a threshold showing, in other words, once there is some suggestion that a Facebook page uh, may have relevant evidence to your case, it's a lot easier than to go to the court and perhaps ask for more um, authority uh, you know, or permission to uh, get additional information through Facebook, uh, through the user, maybe even accessing their, their Facebook account. You also, as a lawyer, your duty of competence requires you to um, know how to authenticate social media evidence. And again, using Facebook as an example, and although this applies to most social media sites, um, there is no verification process that, that where they check to make sure that you are in fact the person you say you are on Facebook. You can be anybody. Um, they don't require an ID or do a social security check or anything like that. And it is very easy to create a fake fo fo uh, Facebook profile. Um, this is an example of, one, of what one of my partners did uh, in 10 minutes just using paint. This isn't even fancy Photoshop. Um, Everything that you see on this page is fake. It looks like a Facebook page, um, but and these are just all inside jokes with partners at my firm, but no one here, th th these aren't even real Facebook profiles. None of the ads are real. Um, this is all something that he did himself. And the reason why I like to show this is to show how easy something like this can be manipulated. And so uh, if you think you got some good stuff on the opposing party, and you're holding it for trial for impeachment, um, I'd be very careful about that to make sure that you know how to authenticate that evidence. Um, because if you do present it at trial for the first time and you haven't done any groundwork and discovery to verify that it is in fact that person, they may deny it at trial. Um, and, if, and, and then you're stuck. There's not much you can do at that point. Um, so you need to know how to properly authenticate evidence. You just can't um, print out a Facebook page um, and then just show it at, at trial. There's a lot more that you need to do uh, or strategically, um, you know, in discovery, get them to admit that is their page if you're, if you're not intending on using it um, as ambush at trial. So that's, that, these are examples of things that I would get into, very technical issues about um, the, that you need to know with respect to social media. And it can be very complicated. And if you've got an IT person or something that you can work with, there are companies, outside vendors, that do these kind of things that they can assist you if this is something that um, you just don't feel comfortable doing yourself. But you do need to have some basic understanding of how it works, uh, which brings me to, as we just talked about, the duty to preserve evidence. And that brings, and that's Rule 3.4a of the Virginia Rules of Professional Conduct. So it's not just your duty of competence, um, you know, and knowing how to get it, but also how to make sure your own client isn't inadvertently destroying evidence um, that could raise a spoliation issue later. And and here's an, another example of, um, you know, what one of our clients uh, posted and. Um, this was, it wasn't a big case, but it was a, it was a motor vehicle accident and the, the allegation was that he was speeding. I'm not sure this would have been admissible if it had gone to trial, but this is certainly not something you want to see on your client's Facebook page where he's kind of making jokes about speeding on a public Facebook page. Um, so when it's not just about getting uh, evidence to use against the opposing side, but it's also making sure that your own client is not uh, putting anything on Facebook that could eventually um, hurt them later in the lawsuit. So it's very important for you to have a conversation with your client from the get-go about not posting anything on Facebook. Uh, lawyers obviously should never participate in the destruction of evidence or advise a client um, uh, to destroy evidence. And that includes deleting relevant evidence uh, from social media accounts or instructing a client to delete that information. Uh, in fact, lawyers have an affirmative duty to preserve any evidence within their possession and control. Some of you may have already heard about this case, uh, the Lester case here in Virginia. 
Um, it was a wrongful death plaintiff who lost his wife in an accident, but on his Facebook page, um, it had a photo of him holding a beer can and he's with some younger people and he has a t-shirt that says, I heart hot moms. And I guess the, the theory was of the defense in that case, well, this shows that this husband is you know, not a grieving husband or he's not a, as emotionally distressed as, as he had portrayed himself to be. Um, in that case, the, the lawyer for the plaintiff had instructed his paralegal to clean up their client's Facebook page because they didn't want blow ups of this stuff at trial. Uh, and in fact, that plaintiff had been served with discovery requests asking for social media evidence. Um, and what the lawyer had his client say, well, he had his, he had his client deactivate the Facebook account. And then in response to that qu request say, um, I no longer have, I don't have a Facebook account as of the date of these responses, which is not really you know, a forthcoming response. Um, and that was later discovered and the, the court um, sanctioned the, the plaintiff's attorney for over half a million dollars and the plaintiff $180,000. Now that's an extreme example where you know, knowing the lawyer knew exactly that there was evidence on his client's uh, Facebook page and instructed his client to destroy it. We don't usually see that. Uh, often we see people just doing it inadvertently. They don't even, excuse me, think about it. Um, they, they don't have that conversation with their client first about not posting anything that might be incriminating later. Um, and then certainly they forget to have the conversation with their client about not deleting things. Now you can suggest to your client that they activate the privacy settings on Facebook, for example, where they don't need to have their Facebook page open to the public. They don't have to make it easy for the other side to access that information. So they can limit their social media sites to friends and family members only, um, but you still have a duty uh, an obligation to preserve any evidence on your own client's Facebook page that might be potentially relevant in uh, an anticipated lawsuit. Um, now, I also wanna note here that Facebook pages generally are not deleted completely. Uh, even if someone deactivates them, they can always be reactivated. Uh, and so if you do get into discovery and they say they don't have a Facebook page, you have to ask that follow-up question if they ever did. Ask follow-up questions about whether they've changed any privacy settings, if they've, if they've deleted anything from their Facebook page. The only way someone can permanently delete a Facebook account is if the user actually submits an official request to Facebook asking them to do so. And if that happens, it can never come back. But most of the time, it's just, um, it's just deactivated, not deleted. Um, so uh, the next topic that I wanted to talk about, ethical issue as it relates to social media, is communications with represented persons. And that's rule, rule 4.2 of the Virginia Rules of Professional Conduct. Most lawyers know this. You can't talk to as a party, the other party that's that's represented by counsel. That's that's pretty obvious. But how that applies in the social media context sometimes can get complicated. Um, good rule of thumb: if the rules prevent you from doing it in person, the rules prevent you from doing it over the internet. That's that's pretty easy. So it's no different. You don't send a Facebook friend request to an adverse party who's represented by counsel. This constitutes an indirect ex parte communication with the represented party. Um, you can't create a, a fake account and send a opposing party a friend request on Facebook. Um, that would violate rule 8.4C, uh, which talks about dishonesty, fraud, and deceit. Um, so what that means is just you, you can't create like a fake name, a fake account. They don't know it's you that's a lawyer on the other side and try to get that information. Um, and the same thing, whatever you can't do yourself, you can't direct someone else to do for you. So um, you can't tell someone in your office, you can't ask your spouse or a friend to say, hey, you're not a lawyer, um, but why don't you go ahead and send a friend request to this person? Maybe they'll actually accept it and then you can tell me what's on there. You can't do that either. That's in violation of the rules of professional conduct. However, one thing that you can do is if someone is already a friend of the, the, the let's say the plaintiff, on Facebook, you can ask that friend what the plaintiff has posted on their Facebook page. There's that, that's no different than interviewing witnesses who may have knowledge of, uh, of the plaintiff's um, accident or, or, or his or her injuries. Uh, I've had a case before where um, 
the, the plaintiff, it, it was a private Facebook page. I had no way to access that information, but the plaintiff's friend who knew about the lawsuit said that he was posting things on there that were, that were inconsistent with what um, he knew was alleged in the lawsuit. And so that was a way to get information. That, that does not run afoul of any of the rules of, of professional conduct, uh, as long as you have not directed someone to send a friend request uh, to the litigant. If they're already friends, it's okay. Um, and this is sort of similar to, but I wanted to talk about um, jury research, and that falls under uh, Rule 3.5A1 of the Virginia Rules of Professional Conduct, which uh, says that a lawyer cannot, during or before the trial of a case, directly or indirectly communicate with a juror or potential juror. And I want to emphasize the word indirectly there. Um, because that, that becomes important for purposes of social media. Now, although this, this varies from court to court, at least in Virginia, most of the courts will provide you with information about um, the individuals that are in your jury pool. I usually get their name, their age, their race, their address, uh, their employer, sometimes their spouse's employer. And I can find a ton of information about these individuals um, on social media. Um, most of the time, about 70% of the, the potential jurors have some form of social media out there. And I really like to get my information that way because then uh, in voir dire, I don't have to ask the question because that gives the other side the opportunity to also hear the answer because I already know the answer. Uh, but I found it being very, very helpful. I mean, all, all jury selection is is about guessing, but you know, if you have information about, do they like CSI, you know, or uh, NCIS or on Facebook, this is, might be someone that's going to be really into evidence and uh, under, wanting to hear about the experts and the scientific evidence. Um, if you've got a dog bite case, is it a dog lover? That's that's information that might help you um, decide whether you keep one juror or you not. But there are there are ethical limitations on the the jury research that you do. You, very similar to what I said before about contacting um, a represented party. Um, the, the rules of professional conduct also prevent you from um, talking to a potential juror. Uh, and so same, same rules apply there. You can't, when you get your, your jury list, then send friend requests to anyone that's on the, the jury pool. You can't do that. So you are allowed to do jury research using social media for evidence that is uh, publicly available, but you can't submit a friend request to gain access to private information that um, the potential juror has limited to uh, friends and family. Uh, you also can't create a fake account just to hide your identity as a, as a lawyer in a case that for which they may be a juror. And likewise, you can't direct somebody to send a friend request or an invite on your behalf um, to get that juror information for you. But one of the things that I wanted to point out, which not many people are aware of, um, is with LinkedIn, and this goes to the issue of communicating indirectly with a juror. Now this is my Facebook page, and you can see where I have the red arrow there. And, and some of you who use LinkedIn may get these emails from uh, LinkedIn every now and then that say, people are looking at your profile. Do you wanna see? And you get there and they'll give you some of the information, but you need to pay for premium to get all the information. But anyone, even with a basic account, will get these notices when someone has looked at your LinkedIn profile. And sometimes it's all the information about you, your name, your photo, where you're, and where you're employed. Sometimes it'll say someone at this firm um, looked at your, your LinkedIn page. Um, the reason why this is important is that um, if you use LinkedIn to get information on potential jurors or your actual jurors, uh, it may constitute an indirect communication with jurors. And so uh, at the beginning of every trial, every, the judges always tell the jurors, you are not allowed to you know, access information uh, on the internet about this case, about the attorneys, about the parties. The only evidence that you're allowed to hear or know about is that which is in these four walls of the courtroom. Um, and so they are admonished not to go to um, social media in order to find out in some information. But if you access, if you look up a juror on LinkedIn and you don't use um, the settings that would hide this, um, they may see that someone from your firm or maybe even you specifically has looked at their LinkedIn profile. And that may, that may tempt them to click on you know, that notice and go to your LinkedIn profile. And now they've read some information about you. That's not, that's nothing I would say amounts to something nefarious or you know, misconduct, 
but it does constitute indirect communication because they are not supposed to see any information about the lawyers. So um, this would be an example of going back to the duty of competence and knowing what each one of these different social media sites can do and what information that they can give to you um, because uh, you need to know um, that LinkedIn does this and that there are options on LinkedIn that you can access that'll um, hide that information. Again, that, that's nothing you know, sketchy about that. It's just an opportunity for you to look at someone's public LinkedIn profile, but for them not to see that it's you. And that protects you uh, from any allegation that you've had indirect communication with a juror. Um, another issue that comes up with jurors uh, and social media has to do with juror misconduct. And this is, this is pretty rare. Um, but Rule 3.5 talks about C talks about how if a, a lawyer finds out that there's been any kind of misconduct uh, by a, a juror or a potential juror, they have a duty to tell the court about that. Um, often you do most of your jury research before the trial begins, but once you get those jurors in the box, maybe you want to do some additional research as the trial progresses. Uh, and if you were to see on Facebook that all one of your jurors starts talking about the case, um, making comments, that is something that is not proper. They're not supposed to be doing that. And so that might be something that you have to bring um, to, the, to the court's attention. Uh, so just keep that in mind as well, given, given the rule um, 3.5C. Um, the last topic that I wanted to hit on, ethical rule topic, is social media use by attorneys. And this goes to Rule 1.6a of the Rules of uh, Professional Conduct, which is really just talks about, and I, I think, again, this is a sort of common sense rule that just says, hey, you're supposed to keep your attorney-client privileged information confidential. Um, and so that's the same is true with social media. Um, so you shouldn't be commenting on parties, opposing counsel, judges on social media. Now that, and I'm not saying that you can't, um, you know, if you have a, an article about a case or, you know, if you want to, in, in a professional way, criticize perhaps an opinion that a judge has, that, that's not what I'm, that I'm talking about here, but I mean like an ongoing case, you shouldn't um, have that information on social media. Um, even if you want to humble brag on LinkedIn about some big win that you got at a trial or some great opinion that came out, you should really get your client's consent even before you do that because a client may not want um, the public to know that they were sued in the first place, um, even if that outcome is, is positive. So the same rules that apply for advertising or putting on your, your firm's website apply to social media as well. I mean, uh, so just you know, consult with your client first before you publish anything about a case involving them. Um, maybe you can work out a way you know, to talk about the case where it doesn't actually mention your client's information. But you must maintain confidentiality of client information. Um, you don't want to discuss uh, your clients or their cases on social media without their permission, and you certainly don't want to publish any confidential information over social media. Um, now, I think, again, that, that may be obvious to some, but I do see some posts on social media that tend to come pretty close to that line. And what I'm talking about would be an example of on Twitter, legal Twitter, you'll see a lot of uh, posts from people that use pseudonyms. And it's not, their, it's not their picture, it's not their name, but they're talking about cases that are ongoing. And maybe they don't mention their clients, but you know, I always get concerned that perhaps you know, there might be a little bit too much information that they reveal on Twitter um, that um, may not make it too difficult to figure out what case they're talking about or what judge they're talking about. Um, and so just be careful of that. And then also recently, um, what I've seen, uh, as many of us are, are working from home, uh, before you post your quarantine workspace pictures on Instagram, uh, make sure that someone can't expand the photo to see your email on your computer screen or the memo that's on your desk or your bed. Um, or blur it out. Uh, but that would be another example where I, you know, I just caution people um, not to um, just publish anything that relates to their case or be a, you know, very vague to protect um, the client. Um, and then lastly, the, the topic I wanted to speak about that goes under me social media use of, by attorneys is friending judges. 
Um, now I, I am becoming, now that I've been practicing longer and longer, many of my friends or colleagues have become judges and now they're um, on the bench. And all of a sudden it's like, well, what do I do? I mean, I, they, are, they were my Facebook friend before they became a judge, what do I do now? Um, you'll see in my written materials that there are a number of different jurisdictions that have evaluated this issue and various ethics opinions, and they're all over the place. Some say you cannot do it at all. You have to unfriend that judge immediately. Others say, well, it's not improper. Um, so really, you have to use your best judgment. Many judges, when they do take the bench, end up deleting their social media profiles for this reason because they don't want to give the appearance of impropriety. Um, and so, you know, um, I, I, you just don't want to, if, there, if it's a judge that you regularly appear before, the, the best practice is to um, make sure that you're, you're not doing anything that would suggest to the other side that perhaps, you know, you're influenced, you're influencing the judge uh, or the judge is some way influenced uh, by you, the fact that you have this, this friendship. Uh, and so just use your, your best judgment about that. Um, so that, that is really um, it about uh, the, the various topics of ethics that come up in social media. I'm happy to address any questions, but I put my email and phone number up there if, uh, if, you, if things come up in your cases that you would like some information about. But other than that, that's all I have for today. Ms. Danielle, it looks like we have uh, two questions in the chat. One, the first okay. one, Ms. Mr. Jeff Somers. Um, it's a little long-winded. I, I could I could read it for you, but I think it might be more efficient if you were to just take a look at that and and give us your opinion on that. Sure. Let me uh, let me call that up. Uh, there we go. Oh my goodness. Okay. No, so uh, I'm not trying. I'm not suggesting that um, social media has uh, any special place in the world of um, the duty of competence. Um, it, but it is one aspect that I think is important for lawyers uh, to take a look at because of the the comment to the ABA rule in 2012 that specifically references changes in um, technology and the way that cases are presented. And the, the examples that I gave, you know, where, where you have an obligation to preserve evidence or you have an obligation to know what evidence is available so you can adequately represent your client. Um, you need to know, at least they have a basic knowledge of um, what it is that's, that's out there in order for you to uh, request that information from your client. If you don't, if you are just completely cutting off social media, um, you aren't adequately representing your client because there's, a, at least in the context of, um, you know, the type of cases that I do, there's just so much information that is out there. And if you don't know what your client is posting or you don't know what the other side is posting that might be helpful for your case, then your client is at a disadvantage. Uh, and so while you, again, you don't have to be an expert, um, you do need to know what to ask for, uh, what sites to be looking for. So even if you don't do it yourself, you're able to adequately um, instruct your staff or other attorneys in your office to look for that information. But I agree also that it may, it may depend on the size and time available for a case, but it honestly, it doesn't take that, it doesn't take that long at all. Um, to, to do these types of searches. It may require an investment of time on the front end to just learn a little bit about social media, uh, but once you know what's available, it's pretty easy to access. And then the next question, can you discuss how deleted tweets are treated in research? I'm not, sh I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, I don't know, I don't know if you can give me some, give a little bit more information about what it is you're asking. Um, I know you had spoken on um, how Facebook's treatment of deleted profiles and deactive profile, deactivated profiles uh, was actually handled where it may not actually be deleted despite that being the impression. Do you have any individual knowledge about you know, whether or not deleted tweets are stored outside of perhaps like screenshots, like on some yeah. sort of database? You know what, I don't. I don't have that information. Um, uh, 
Twitter is different uh, than Facebook. Um, it may be now, I know that um, the only time that I've seen tweets that have been preserved or through a screenshot, as you've said, um, or you know, if someone had, had downloaded it before they were deleted, but I don't know uh, about Twitter if there's a way for a deleted tweet to be reactivated the same way that um, a Facebook uh, profile could be. Understood. Well, I think that's uh, just about all the time we have for questions. I believe we're scheduled to take a break at 2.25. I don't know if Catherine had any closing comments. No, just that we're going to go ahead um, and take a break until 2.30. So we will see everyone back then. Thank you so much, Ms. Giroux. Thank you. I'm going to open this attendance poll up a little bit early just to get that out of the way, too. All right, everyone, I just want to make a few administrative announcements before we get started. Um, I went ahead and shared Ms. Moyne's final materials. And just to let y'all know, we've had a lot of changes to materials over the last 24 hours. So if you downloaded something earlier in the week, I would suggest you go ahead and go back to our website and re-download it again just to get the most up-to-date version of PowerPoints and speaker materials. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce Ms. Dorna Moyne. She's going to be talking about automating to serve the latent legal market. Um, and she is the founder and CEO of a company called Documate. So welcome this morning. All right, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much, Catherine, for, for the introduction. And what I'm gonna do now is I'll first go ahead and share my slides with you guys so that you can follow along as I'm going along. Just one second. And hopefully you guys can see my slides now. So just let me know if you can't. Yeah. All right, so today I'm gonna to be talking about the latent legal market. So the latent legal market is um, a term that was coined by uh, Richard Susskind and it is referring to kind of that untapped potential of potential legal clients who don't use legal services right now to solve a lot of their legal issues. Um, and as a result, it also means that many of the lawyers today can be creating additional revenue if they could focus on serving that market in new and innovative ways. And one of the ways that we're gonna talk about today is doing that through legal, legal document automation. So um, what we're gonna go through today is we're gonna start by hopefully educating you guys first on why automation is important and how legal service delivery is changing. Then we're gonna talk about how to plan building out a legal product. So giving you some practical advice on a framework for starting a project, actually building a project, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit about that. And then finally, once you have a legal product that you've built based on your, your legal expertise, how do you get that into the world and how do you uh, really maintain it so that it's, it's actually being used and is successful in the market? Um, and then after that, I'll hopefully be inspiring you with some real world examples of, of things that our clients and others in the market are doing. And then um, at the very end, we're actually going to do a little demo and, and I can show you how you can build a, a, no, a, a platform, a legal product without using any kind of code on, on Document. So um, first I wanna tell you a little bit about me and why we started Document and how this relates to automating for this exact uh, latent legal market that, that we're speaking of. Um, so I used to be a lawyer, I practiced for about seven years and during the time that I was practicing, I also did a lot of pro bono work. And my pro bono work was, um, you know, I, in that time I realized that there were many end users of legal services or people who needed legal services who weren't able to access them because they were reliant on um, either a pro bono attorney being available, uh, getting themselves transportation wise to a particular location to get legal assistance. And in general, the legal market in the US, as many of you probably know, uh, is sort of split into two different groups that, that actually are able to access legal services. One is the sort of upper middle class tier of individuals who are able to afford the average lawyer's hourly rate of about $300 an hour here in the US. Um, and then the other is, you know, corporations. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are eligible for legal aid. And um, that qualifying range is very low. 
um, in terms of income. So there's a lot of the middle class that's left out. And even within the low income, income population, there are those barriers that we discussed earlier about transportation and, and getting get, getting childcare and being able to actually make it, um, you know, taking time off work to have access to a legal aid attorney if that's even available to you. So um, originally when we started Documate, we actually just wanted to build a tool for one very specific area of law. So I wanted to build uh, essentially a turbo tax, if you will, uh, for domestic violence survivors, who were the clients that I had in my pro bono practice. So um, I got together with an engineer um, who is now my co-founder and we built out exactly that. We built out a series of questions that led down numerous potential different pathways to guide the user down the right path to generate documents for some of the initial documents that they needed for their um, domestic violence restraining orders. And then we connected to e-filing systems to have them um, automatically channel it into the court. In for that particular case, that was really useful because a lot of our clients were not a, were only having time to even do this at midnight um, when no one else was around and no one, no one else was paying attention to them, other people were sleeping. So it was useful to have an online product, even if those people were able to get um, access to uh, a legal aid attorney. Um, so throughout this process, we realized that we could be building more tools, just like uh, the tool that we had built, which we originally called Help Self Legal, um, for other areas of law, for other legal aid organizations. The two barriers that we had there were one, all the research that you have to do for the area of law and the jurisdiction and the many different local rules that that, that entails. And second is the development work. So we had spent three months on development on this product. We had built it from scratch and uh, we wanted to provide that ease of that, that kind of development tool set to a lawyer who doesn't have uh, access to a developer who doesn't who doesn't have can't afford a developer who, or for, for any reason doesn't want to build spend time building a, a full-fledged develop, development grade uh, or development uh, product. So what we did was we built Documate, and what Documate is is it's a no-code document automation platform that allows you to create client-facing legal products. And we did that because we felt that that was the best way for us to expand our reach and impact. Because now instead of going one by one through different legal areas, we were able to provide our platform and our platform's now being used internationally by lawyers in other languages and other countries and whatever it is that you want to automate. If you are the lawyer with the expertise, you can get on our platform to do that. So that's just a little bit about us. Um, now let's launch into uh, more about how legal services delivery is changing and, um, and what that means for, for the lawyers of the future. So this is a quote that I really like. It's from Richard Tuscan's latest book. It says, more and more legal services will be enabled by the support of new technology. You can say that that is for the technology industry to sort out, or you can be part of the technology industry. So I think this is something that, um, you know, this is a quote I liked even before this COVID-19 crisis that we're in right now, but it's becoming even more relevant during this time when lawyers are realizing that they're needing to, to collaborate online with their clients and think differently about how they are delivering those legal services to their clients. Skipping to the, to the next slide, we have, um, this is a, a chart of um, the, the stages of how law has started to become more commoditized. And it starts with the bespoke legal services. So that's the traditional way that we think of legal services being delivered. You go to an attorney, they, the attorney takes down your exact information um, and drafts a document from scratch for you. That will obviously still always be necessary. There are many areas of law that will continue to need completely bespoke services. And that's really what the rest of this whole this whole platform and the rest of these steps in the process of commoditization are actually enabled, enabling to be done better because once lawyers can standardize, systematize, and externalize their uh, core, the, the routine and process-oriented legal work that they have, that means that they, they can spend more of their time on bespoke work if that's what they prefer. Um, and so it, it goes also to, to lawyer happiness as well. Um, so the next level after bespoke is standardization. And so this is what we think of as um, template, templates. Most law firms have, you know, those 
brackets in, in documents with yellow highlighting and giving instructions to the end user of a template document as to how they can um, generate this document again. Um, so that's the first step of standardization. The next is going over to systematization, which is actually creating, taking those templates and taking those standardized checklists that you may have built in that second stage and turning them into a system putting them into document automation platforms or creating um, online software to, to really make that a computerized um, methodology. And then everything that you see on the right on this chart is the externalization of, of legal services. And that's a little bit of what I wanna talk about today is ways that legal services can be externalized. First, you know, putting information into the commons like a lot of different organizations have done. The most, the most um, popular that, that many of you may know, particularly the students, is the Cornell Law has taken basically every statute and put it onto the internet. So that is law that has become now part of the commons. Um, no charge online tools. So that would be a lot of document, a lot of courts and legal aid organizations are starting to create online workflows that they provide for free to the public. Uh, we're actually working with the Louisiana courts right now and um, in automating all of the different forms that, that exist uh, that they need to be providing to, to users during this time when, when courts are remote. So um, that would be an example of no charge online tools. And then charge online tools is uh, the TurboTax like model where you're taking a platform, you've built it, you're putting it out on the web, clients are able to access it, they're able to pay without ever talking to the attorney, or you can provide additional services on top of that. So the forms that, that this takes, is, the forms that uh, this kind of what is possible through automation to serve more of the middle class, um, and really even take people who are not necessarily in the middle class and, and allow them to access legal services more, more easily. Um, as many, many of the, many people want to go to a supermarket, for example, and they want to do the self checkout. And some people go to the supermarket and they want to use the regular checkout process, but giving them those options is taking people who never would have gone through the regular checkout line and, and allowing them to access your services as lawyers uh, in a different way. So just briefly, there are, internal tools so in the first steps uh the first steps of automation would be using it internally at a law firm so that would be internal automation workflows that lawyers their staff and their paralegals use to generate documents the second is expert systems which has actually been super useful particularly in the um, legal aid context whenever we work with legal aid organizations we've seen that they want to onboard certain attorneys onto a new area of law and they give them all these documents and binders and of information of what you need to do for to, to help a pro bono client at, at a legal aid organization. Uh, but they're starting to do more with expert systems where the attorney can actually go on to a, an automated workflow that has decision tree logic that may branch in multiple different ways and answer questions based on the client's case and be taken, be guided down the path that they would need to guide the client down. Um, so it, it becomes a good training tool as well for lawyers. Um, then after those external tools, we have external facing tools. So that would be intake. Um, I always like to say intake is the gateway drug to document automation because once people start automating their intake process, they realize how much more power uh, the automation process can bring to their own practice. Um, it's not just about gathering data, but it's about having at the very beginning of, for example, a divorce case or even an estate planning case uh, or an estate planning client, having the first set of documents that you would need for that client before you even have to talk to them because they've already filled out that information. It becomes, um, it helps you become a more efficient attorney. Um, it helps eliminate a lot of errors and it, uh, it really improves the, the efficiency of, of the work that you're providing to the client. Um, and then after that, our free to the public tools, subscription based form. So that's a model that's becoming a lot more popular. Uh, attorneys putting a variety of different workflows behind a paywall so that a client can, instead of asking, instead of coming to the attorney every time they need an employee, uh, employer uh, agreement or a contractor agreement, they can just go directly to that site and see, okay, I can pull the most recent updated version. I know that my attorney's updating it. 
um, and I can I can trust it every time and it, it removes some of that friction saves the attorney's time and still allows the attorney to provide a really great service to the, to the end user and then the final one is the the, the, the legal the full-fledged legal tech company that you could build using using these um, you know automation tools so um, we, the next thing we're going to start talk about is that document assembly and the document automation life cycle. So um, what are we going to do before we build? And then after we build the product, what are we going to do to really get it out into the world? This is really a, a really good exercise, whether or not you're building an immediate product for a potential client right now, or whether you're, you're experimenting on prototypes. So automation um, helps us understand a lot of the gaps that may exist in the, in the legal market. Um, experimenting with tools um, helps us understand what legal technology tools exist in the world so that we can, in the future, better, better deliver services to our clients and um, helps us think more practically about legal service delivery. It also, throughout the process of automation, we are able to talk to our users, get feedback and iterate on that process. So that is, that's something that lawyers don't always do um, you know as as a software company founder now I have done a lot of user experience testing um, in in our work and building document but that's something that when I think back on the law firm experience I think that user experience should be something that's part of the services uh, aspect of, of a law firm as well you want to talk to your clients about is the, the methodology and the process that we go through the experience that you're getting as a client on the services side, satisfactory are there ways that we can improve it, and and doing and inserting automation tools is is a good way to and going through this process that we're about to go through is a good way to get feedback from your users. Um, and then all, finally, um, you know, even for those of you who plan to hire a developer to build a legal tech product, using a no code tool is a really good way to to build rapid prototypes, um, so that you can you can iterate on that on that idea quickly and and really cost effectively. So now I want to talk about the um, building process. So what we're going to do first before we build a project. Uh, what's really important before you build is that you define your project um, very, very narrowly and understand the concept and the scope that, that you're going to be building for. So what you really want to do is be realistic about the scope. I think a lot of, a lot of users have really grand ideas and that's that's wonderful to have a really big idea for what you're what you want your end product to look like for your customers but um, at the very beginning you want to start small and it's best to start with some you know even one or two documents that you start automating and then add on complexity as you go through so we we have a lot of clients in the in the family law space and one of the things we see is they'll start with you know some uh, a premarital settlement agreement and then maybe they'll start with uh, they'll do an uncontested divorce and then they'll tack on complexities as they move forward and as they've tested things with their clients um, it's also really important to really hone in on who your users will be it's possible that out of all the clients that you have not all of those clients will be users of a software product um, so you want to you want to have clarity on who they are, what their, you know, what their background is, what their, what the environment is that they're sitting, sitting, in, sitting in, taking advantage of your tool, um, so that you can build around that. And it's it's great to be narrow, as narrow as possible there. And then also, um, you know, making sure that you have pain points that you're addressing and and you're addressing all the different features. Uh, the next thing to do is do some due diligence on the market. So beyond just your project itself, what exists out there like what you're trying to build. I am I'm a big believer that just because there's a product out there that that exists like like what you want to build does not mean that you shouldn't build it but you should have a very clear idea of why you why you want to build it is there some way in which other tools that exist out there have gaps uh, where they're not filling the right pain points um, who, who are the people who are going to benefit maybe you're delivering something a service to a very different market you know there could be the same product that exists for enterprise users and for your uh, you know, small business clients or your or your individual consumer clients and so you may be targeting something that that is different than what already exists out there um, thinking about cost and sustainability upfront is also very important because 
that's actually one of the things that, you know, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about our um, experience with that domestic violence platform that we built. Uh, we had lots of users and our, our users loved it, but they weren't able to pay a lot. And the cost of acquiring those cost, those users, those individual consumer users, uh, was, was very high, given that we were competing against lawyers who were charging huge retainers. And so that's why we, we sort of shifted our, our model. But I think it's really important to think upfront about how, how, your business, how your product is going to be sustainable going forward and the cost that you're putting into it. Um, and then finally, engaging users. So before you build a product, you want to engage potential stakeholders. And I, I like to define stakeholders very broadly here because stakeholders could be the end users who are your clients, but stakeholders also could be an organization who doesn't necessarily do this type of work and is referring clients over to you or, or needs um, this as an add-on product. Um, anyone who could really be promoting or evangelizing um, your product is a stakeholder that, that would be really valuable for you to get feedback from upfront. Um, they're going to be the people who are going to spread your message. Um, legal aid, I found, is, is really useful to, to, to join teams with in this front because a lot of times if, uh, if a, an attorney at a for-profit firm can't, can't take certain types of cases or it doesn't fall within the scope of the project, that you can always have a referral page that refers them to certain legal aid organizations that you may have come to agreements with. Um, and, uh, you know, at upfront, if you are building for a user, there are different types of users that you may be building for. You may be building for your end user that's a consumer, or you may be building something within an organization. Like if you're in a, a larger law firm and you're building for other lawyers, then you're going to want to engage those other lawyers and, and also set expectations for them as to what these first versions will look like so that, um, you know, you have happy, the happy end user at, at the end of the process. Uh, and also during that process, one more thing, you'll want to think about design and accessibility as well, which is something that we think about um, in building out a lot of the, the user facing design and, and making it so that it's, it meets all the accessibility standards. Um, but that's something that's, that's very important. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, the actual, so in a second, I'm going to show you guys how you'll build a legal product by showing you how you can do that on, on our platform and how easy it is to do with a no-code tool. So I'm kind of skipping this middle portion here, but I'm skipping to what happens after you build the product. So after you've built your MVP, you're going to have this pilot beta project, hopefully, that you'll do testing on before you launch it to an even, even broader market. So the first step of that process is doing testing and getting feedback. So you want to um, you get your users sit behind them, watch them go through the process, see where they're getting stuck. Um, you can implement analytics throughout the whole process to see if, you, if you're testing on a more mass scale as opposed to just sitting, sitting with individual users. You can implement analytics to see where are users getting stuck. Are they getting stuck on page three, which is about their bank accounts because they're having to step away and find out all those bank account numbers? Are there ways that you can make it easier? Maybe you remove the requirement for adding the bank account number or you remove the requirement for adding the, um, their tax uh, forms and you ask them for that later on because you're finding that the process would be more seamless if you simplified it. So that's, that's just one example of ways that you might, you might change and iterate based on user testing. Um, and then obviously you wanna test for functionality as well, depending on, on how, how complex and robust your, your legal product is. Then you're gonna launch your product. So uh, I think a lot of times people think, I built a, I built a software pro product, now I get to launch it and I, I can just leave it alone and, and step away. And uh, you know, while it is a lot less, less maintenance than, than picking up phone calls from clients every, every few minutes, um, it still requires support and updates and continuing services to, to make sure that you have a quality product out there in the world, uh, both from an ethical legal perspective, but also from a client satisfaction perspective. So one thing you'll want to do is provide support, you know, make sure that you have the support to provide to your clients if they have technical issues. Um, you probably want to, you may want to draw the line depending on where the attorney-client relationship lands. Um, you also want to have robust documentation about your pro program. So that may be written documentation, or you may want to have videos embedded inside of your workflows. One of the things we allow you to do is embed videos within workflows so that if someone is, for example, on that bank account page and they don't know 
um, they don't understand one of the questions, maybe you have a video that explains the most commonly encountered issues so that they can just press click and, and that takes away the human support they need but provides them uh, uh, a, a very close equivalent. And then finally, in, in the, after, after you launch, you may also wanna tack on services. That's what we most often recommend and what we most often see is that our clients um, do provide software platforms, but they want to be there at the end of the process. They don't want to just have um, a standalone product project necessarily if there are areas that, that are more complex that may not fall within the scope of the product because they want to be able to capture that as a legal service. So, um, and I'll give you some, some examples of that in a, in a second, but um, it helps you build that, that more unbundled practice as well. And then uh, finally, after launch is marketing. So that's really important for sustainability. Um, you probably, you may already have your own channels through your, your legal clients who are, are ready and awaiting channel to, to accept these, these services um, or these, these products. But you may also want to get new users and you're going to want to do that by building credibility, which up to constant updates to your project are very important for building credibility. And I, I usually recommend actually including some sort of indicator on your product that says this has last been updated on you know april 24th 2020 so when users come on they know okay this isn't just something that i found on the web this is something that someone is actively monitoring um putting a, a chat box um and chat box at the bottom of your of your product is, is a really useful way to engage with users as well um, and then those stakeholders the stakeholders that we talked about in the before building process those are going to be really essential to you after you launch your product because they are going to refer people over to you um, and, and really be, be those evangelists. So uh, we've talked a little bit about this before, but I wanna go into a little bit more detail about kind of the new legal service delivery models. So um, historically, you know, we, we all kind of know what we think of when we think of a lawyer-client relationship traditionally, uh, but things are, things are definitely changing and have been changing for, for many, many years. Um, the first step in that, in that process is informational products. So um, we, there are many lawyers and law firms who are putting content out, checklists out. Um, if any of you guys are in the employment arena, you may know of like the Richard Simmons uh, Castle Publications books that have every single form that you could ever want inside of a, inside of a, uh, a booklet um, for any area of employment law. So those have existed for, for quite some time. And that's the first level of, of a new way of taking your, your legal expertise and channeling it towards a, a, a different service. Um, second are internally generated flat fee services that are aided by technology. So that would be um, using these automation tools, but not making them client facing. So the client doesn't necessarily know that you're using automation, but you're able to reduce your fees, be more competitive in the market, or maybe even not reduce your fees and just uh, create more efficiency internally and um, do the automation in-house and, and be able to more efficiently generate documents for clients. Um, data collaboration is the next one. This is becoming so much more important right now when um, clients can't come in for an intake, an in-person intake. They uh, are more willing to fill out things on, online. And um, most, I, I believe, I forget what the, most recent stats are, but I believe it's somewhere around like 80% of uh, Americans have a smartphone with internet access. So even those who may not have Wi-Fi access in their home, like broadband internet, they do have a smartphone and that's a really good way to be able to collaborate with clients. So if you build these tools um, and they can access them from an iPad or an iPhone, um, that, that will be very valuable as well for that collaboration. Um, Subscription form sites, we talked a little bit, bit about those and I'll, I'll show you an example in a second. Uh, the, and then the, the next is the TurboTax model, which is really end-to-end -end technology um, that can be, we talk, we've been talking a lot about document automation, but it can also be decision automation. So guiding someone down um, a pathway to determine whether they qualify for a specific loan or um, you know, someone internally in a firm to decide what, 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 they should, what advice they should give to a client. Um, so it becomes, it can, it can be not just a document automation system, but an expert system itself. And then the last one is that combination technology and advice, um, which is the supporting your, your software product with um, the, the uh, advice as well in the services piece. 
So next, I want to show you some examples. Um, and I'll start with Hello Divorce, which is a really impressive platform um, here in California. And they, they use Documate on the back end as well. And they have multiple levels of memberships. And you can see this on their website. Um, what they've done is they have basically created different tools to cater to different levels of, of, of people who want different access to, a, to an attorney or different levels of computer sophistication. So if someone just wants access to resources to support them in their divorce, they can access that for free on Hello Divorce. And they have a lot of really amazing um, resources, both on the legal side and on the mental health side. And they have a lot of really good, good content out there. Um, the second would be the do-it-yourself divorce. So do it DIY, you go on. That would be sort of like the TurboTax model. They have access to what they call, they give you access to what they call the divorce navigator. It's a monthly fee. Um, and uh, the, the reason I like to mention the fees is because you can think of all different ways of how you can structure yours to be, to be different or, or really be specific to, to the practice that you have. But the, the second one is the do, your do-it-yourself divorce. So that's like the TurboTax-like model. The user gets their forms and the user goes on and, and files them with the court. The third one is um, Divorce Plus. So that's everything is being done internally. Um, and the firm is, is, is preparing that, that process and those documents for them um, because they're, they're obviously a law firm as well. And um, they can prepare all your forms and file them for you. So that caters to a different level of desire for interaction with a computer system, but also has some automation on the back end to, to expedite that process. Um, and then the last one is for the more complicated and complex uh, cases where you need coaching and uh, you know, potentially needing someone to go to court for you and uh, maybe beyond the levels of, of what a, an uncontested divorce is. The next one I want to show you guys is a subscription model. So this one is called um, Fresh Lease. Fresh Lease was born out of a law firm, and um, they are they basically were finding that they had all these landlord clients who were building these leases that had tons of flaws in them. They had um, you know clauses that were not enforceable. They the landlords were not being were not keeping up to date necessarily with the with the most recent law, and you know every day the law is is changing in different jurisdictions. And so it was hard for, for the landlords to keep track and they would have to come back to the firm every time. So what Fresh Lease did was they built out a platform for this and it's really affordable, $250 a year. The user can come on, they sign up and now they have access to updated lease agreements. They can be taken down different paths and, and channel, channels depending on um, what their particular situation is. So that's more of a subscription model. Um, and then the third one is I bring this one up because it's a really good example of how complex you can get and that this doesn't necessarily just have to be a tool for for consumers, but it can actually be an you can build enterprise solutions as well. Um, so LCN Legal, also a law firm, all, all, the, all of these started out from uh, initially a law firm. And, and so LCN Legal is also a law firm. They do, uh, they work in transfer pricing. And um, so very complicated area of law, lots of tax implications lots of different routes that the, that the user may be taken down. Uh, they also needed to provide this service um, in English, in Chinese, and I believe now they're also in, in Portuguese. And so what they did, and they charge quite a bit for each of these different workflows because it's a really sophisticated and complex product. Um, so what they did was they built out a workflow and added all the conditional logic. And they, at the end of the process, the users who are usually financial institutions and accounting firms, they're able to, to generate their documents and, and get decisions at the end of the process. So, so far we've gone through kind of the process of building um, some, some of the ways that legal services are changing and hopefully some ideas that you guys may, may have. We are actually, um, I'm actually in the process right now of, of building out a lot of content specifically in this area. So if you check out, on, check out our blog in the next few weeks, hopefully you'll, you'll see some of that too. Um, if you wanna go into more detail or if you have any requests for content you'd, you'd like, please reach out to me. But the next thing I wanna show you guys is um, the building process. So I'm gonna unshare this screen for a second and share with you guys our 
platform so I can give you a quick demo of that and how if I can find out how to share again. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm not, I'm still sharing, I guess. All right. So let me share another screen with you guys. Okay, perfect. So um, I think you can all see my screen. Uh, so this is, now I wanted to show you everything that we just went through, but practically how can you actually build it and how easy it is to build with, with, without using any code. So what you can do is, I'll give you just a quick, quick um, overview of our system and then um, we'll hopefully launch into some questions as well if you guys have any. So um, the process is twofold. The first piece of the process is that you need to set up all the questions that you wanna gather for, for your end documents. The second piece of the process is setting up all of your documents so that they have all the proper logic and the information flows into the right places and the information that the answers can dictate how your document is generated. So this is um, the main page where you have all the different workflows. The one that I'm gonna show you today is this employee offer letter workflow. Let me first show you what the end product looks like. Let's click run here. I'm gonna be taken to this screen where I can now answer um, all these questions. But these questions are all custom questions that I've built. So the, the workflow that we're building right now is going to be uh, a set of questions that asks about information for, for an employee's offer letter documents. So really basic documents, but kind of shows you the compl how, how complex you can get if you add a, tack on all these features together uh, for a more complex project. And then the very end of the process, it's going to generate an offer letter and other documents that you may be needed for, for your um, employee offer letter packet. So as you can see, this is kind of the end product and the user can go through here and put in their information and, and, and depending on how they answer certain questions, other questions may open up or close up. Um, and that's all based on the logic that we've set up. So that's the end product, but let me show you how you can build it. Because um, what's most important is can, without any te te technology knowledge um, or engineering knowledge, can you build this yourself? So this is the builder platform. And this is where you see those two tabs that I mentioned, the interview tab where you're creating all the questions that are relevant to the documents and the output documents tab where you're loading all of the template documents that you want generated at the end of the process. Here I only have two, but you could generate 10, 20 documents, add all kinds of conditional logic to what is generated as well. Starting with the interview piece, what you're gonna do is similar to Typeform or SurveyMonkey or any of these like, or even Google Forms, which is probably most widely used. Uh, you, can go, you can go onto the platform, you click add question, you can choose any of these different questions to add. And maybe I want to add a text question or maybe a multiple choice question. I can write out that question. So like, you know, what, what is the user's favorite fruit? Every single question is going to get a variable name. The variable name is going to be what you're going to use to identify this question. It's going to be sort of like the identifier for this question that, that you, you'll use for logic and for setting up your documents. So I will use here, you can name it whatever you want, but I recommend using something that's very similar. So I'll use favorite fruit. And then I could give it, I can give choices of pears, apples, and strawberries. So now maybe I wanna add another question and it's gonna be a text question. I wanna ask them, well, what's their favorite type of apple? What's your favorite type of apple? Apple type. And in this case, if they didn't tell me that their favorite fruit was apples, then I probably don't want to ask them about the apples. So what I'll do is I'll add logic. So you can always toggle back and forth between the edit and the logic tab. And here you can say, show if favorite fruit is apples. So now when we actually run this workflow, um, this question 10 will only show up if the favorite fruit chosen was apples. Um, and you can do that within pages as well. So you can add logic to these different pages to have specific um, categories show up or not show up. You can also add um, these repeating item questions, which are really useful. So all of these kind of, it'll help you understand a little bit more about, about programming, even though you're not actually programming as well, because you'll, lawyers already think a little bit in the if then context, because that's how statutes and law is written but now you can put that all into a, into a framework without actually coding. So the repeating items are, in, in programming, it's called loops. And so you would be asking about whether someone has children, and then if they do have children, you might ask about their other children, you'll keep asking them about children until they say they have no more. 
and for each of those items, you'll want to grab how many, you know, what is each child's name and each child's date of birth. So that's the questionnaire side. Um, you can also add signature pages. The next piece is loading the documents. And so um, first you'll create your question. The documents are usually set up inside of Microsoft Word, or if you have fillable PDF forms, you can set, up, set them up there as well. Um, so this process is basically you'll select your workflow in the Word add-in inside of Microsoft Word, and I'm using Word Online, but you can word, use Word for PC, Word for Mac, whatever you have. And uh, you'll choose the workflow that you want to work from. You can add simple variables, which are really basic. That's basically like mail merge. So if I, if I want to insert the employee's name here, I'll select from my variables, which are variables that I have set up myself. So and I'll click insert and it'll insert the variable employee name here. Maybe I want to insert an address block up here. I can insert the variable employee name and maybe I'll put their city state zip here as well. Um, that's basic uh, mail merge type functionality, but what's really going to be powerful for building these legal products is adding conditional logic to your actual documents. Um, conditional logic calculations, date calculations, and then adding on those repeating items in whatever format you want. So for example, let's say I only want this particular paragraph to appear if, um, no, let me say if payment is annually. I can set, set this in the side panel and then click insert condition and it will insert this logic for me. So while this is inserting some syntax and kind of teaches you a little bit about what the if statement is, uh, you don't need to learn any of this code and it is human readable just as if payment is annually. Um, similarly, you can add nested logic. So if you wanted to do have nested logic here where you have this particular phrase appear if two other conditions were true, you could do that as well. Um, another thing I wanna show you is numerical calculations. So you can do any level of numerical calculation. So let's say you're asking about someone's income or expenses for a fee waiver. You could add all the expenses or add all the um, income and the assets and subtract all the expenses and give them different numbers instead of asking for them to do the calculations themselves. So it eliminates errors internally and externally. Date calculations are, are really useful as well. That allows you to calculate dates. So let's say someone gives you their date of birth and you want to calculate their age, or let's say you have, you've been given a date and you want to tell the user, oh, well, because your accident was on, you know, January of 20, you know, 2002, the statute of limitations is run because the last statute of limitations was three years. So you can do those kinds of calculations to give, give feedback to a user on whether or not they qualify for certain services or um, insert certain logic inside of the document. And then repeating item just allows you to insert any of those repeating items that we used, for example, the children in different formats. So in a table with commas in between, with an Oxford comma in between. Um, this is most frequently we've seen used in the estate planning context, actually, where there's lots of different assets and children and, and, and things that need to be listed. So I, um, just a bird's eye view really quickly again. So the process for building anything is setting up questions, setting up documents, and then um, you're, you can set additional conditions to documents and choose kind of output workflows as well and set additional settings for styling as well. Um, but that is basically the whole process. So it's really simple to put together uh, a, an offer letter, something that's, that's, that's short and concise, and you can always tack on more complexity as you move forward. So with that, I'm gonna stop there and um, allow you guys to um, ask any questions. Please type your questions into the chat box and um, we will moderate them that way. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Moini. Yes, thank you all. I know uh, silence is uncomfortable for many of us. So uh, just wanna say that was an amazing uh, presentation and. Um, Congrats um, for building this wonderful software. Definitely. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, um, we'd love to help a lot of them. One of the most frequent questions we do get in, in our regular day to day is people asking us about how they can be thinking about user facing tools and how they can be structuring different pricing models for clients. Um, so that's something we're always happy to brainstorm on. So if anyone wants to either now or later on, um, contact us about just brainstorming, not even, you know, not um, necessarily using our, our software even, we're happy to do that as well. And we're trying to create more content there. Um, and I think there's a question that just came in. Is document sold as a package like Microsoft? So we, um, our 
platform is all completely web-based and so we do a subscription model um, and we do have a free trial and if any of you guys want a free trial we can extend we usually do a seven-day free trial but we can extend that if you need us to um, and so it's a it's a monthly fee because we put every single one of our clients on their own server you'll have your own subdomain and that will be accessible by your clients so what you can do is create a um, a workflow that you then have your clients sign into so that your clients can store their data. Um, so let's say you have a, uh, an estate planning intake and you don't know if the, the person is probably not gonna be able to fill it out all in one day. Um, what you can do is you can put that through and they can sign in, create a user. You can actually decide whether or not you wanna log their information on your end so you can have a full dashboard of every client and whether they've gone through the whole process um, and, and move forward with that. So let me know if um, that answered the question about the package. Um, our word add-in is actually, you can just download that from the word store and that doesn't cost anything. Um, There's another question that was sent to me privately, but it's, it's a, a viewable now. Um, how would your platform adapt to domestic violence protective order? So excellent question, because that's actually what we started with. That was, that was the first product that we built and that was what we are constant, every feature that we, we added at the very beginning was, to make sure that we contemplated everything that we would want to build for our domestic violence restraining order. You guys may call them protective orders in other states, we call them restraining orders here in California. Um, so what it would do is you would basically add all the layers of different logic. And one of the things that we did in our initial platform that you may think about doing or not is we actually, it, for the declaration piece of the domestic violence restraining order, we inserted language into the declaration based on how the user asked questions. So we asked questions that were very targeted at the law. So we said, you know, have you, do you feel like you're in imminent um, fear for your life or for bodily, bodily injury? That was a question that a lawyer would ask the client because they know they're trying to elicit the right types of information. But the client may, might not think when they're writing a declaration to write that information, to write that they're in fear or that they've had injuries. They might not think to write all that down on a document. And so they're they're not able to communicate to that, that to the judge if they're doing it on their own. So there are ways that you can guide a user, um, both through logic, but also through just crafting questions in the right way so that you can build them a tool that is factually accurate, but also tracks the law. So let me know if um, I've answered that question or if you have any follow-up questions on that as well. Well, I have a quick question. I was wondering if, um you find attorneys use this kind of document on automation in their pro bono work within their yes, practice. Definitely. Um, so there are sort of two main ways that we see that happen. One is internally within a firm. So um, we were actually working with a firm who's building out like an asylum platform for the attorney because the attorney has a few different things that they need to do. Like they may need to file some papers with the immigration court to even say that they're the attorney. Um, there may be some in initial documentation that they need to gather from the from the client we what this firm has done for that pro bono process is they've standardized it so that every attorney who starts on a pro bono case for um, this particular asylum they are asked certain questions and if they've met the check boxes then they can move forward if they haven't they're, then they're led down um, the path to generate the right documents to file um, so that's one way the other way is in the clinic setting so uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, legal aid clinics, and I guess now they're, they're I, don't, I actually need to find out exactly how they're doing that now that clinics aren't happening in person, but they could still kind of access them remotely. But we've seen a lot of clinics um, expanding the number of people that they can serve. So for example, we have uh, an organization here in Los Angeles who was doing name and gender change forms inside of the clinic platform, and they had several attorneys who were assisting clients that, through the whole process. But uh, it's actually funny how they, they ended up automating it is because they put out a tweet at, talking about their clinic and they got so much more demand than they expected that they realized for these next clinics, we need to actually have some kind of software that helps us help. I mean, it's wonderful to have 100 people showing up to your clinic, but you want to make sure you have the staff to support that. So what they did was they built an, uh, a tool so that either the attorney or the client can start entering data and then the attorney at the very end of the process will review those forms and and help them file it and do take take care of the, all the administrative back end um but it you know instead of serving 10 people they can serve 100 people in the same amount of time 
Thank you. We'll go ahead and leave questions open for just another minute. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and introduce the next speaker. Wonderful. Anybody has one last question. Well, if anyone wants to reach out to me in, in, independently after this, um, my email is Dorna, D-O-R-N-A, at documate.org. Um, and then we also, you know, you can always reach me there and happy, happy to chat about any of these issues. I, I love talking about new um, legal service delivery models. So always happy to chat. Thank you, Ms. Moyni, so much. It was really a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you, everyone, for attending. So now we're going to introduce the next speaker, uh, Mr. Matthew Steubenberg. He is the Associate Director of Legal Technology at the Access to Justice Lab at Harvard Law. Um, and he's going to be talking about technology and the legal aid of the future. So Mr. Steubenberg, you can begin whenever you are ready. All right, let me just share my screen here. Is that working? Do you just see the yeah, my future, desktop back? Future of A2J. Yeah, all right, perfect. Uh, okay, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, I work for the Access to Justice Lab and the Access to Justice Lab uh, at Harvard Law School. What we do is we run randomized controlled trials on various legal interventions. So if you're a nonprofit legal service provider or a court and you have a new uh, let's say a new brochure, a new program, a new tech tool, and you want to see if it actually works, what you do is you come to the uh, Access to Justice Lab and we'll help you set up a randomized controlled trial to see if that new brochure, that new intervention, that new drug court is actually having the impact that you anticipate it will and to what degree. But what I'm going to be talking about today is how technology is going to impact access to justice and to some degree, legal service providers in general, not just nonprofit ones, and what I think the impact of that change will be. So I just want to start with currently what's possible, and a lot of this will revolve around intake and case management systems. So I want to talk about kind of automated intake or enhanced intake uh, based around the technology that we currently have that's doable for many nonprofit legal service providers. So a lot of this revolves around web scrapers, and I'm sure this being a technology conference, many people know what a web scraper is, but just in case there's a few out there who don't have an idea, I just want to quickly go over it. So uh, this is how you use the internet in general, right? You load up a web browser, you go to Google, you type in a search, and the Google server will search its own servers and return to you HTML about the results. That HTML will be uh, uh, deciphered by your web browser and displayed into the nice kind of web image with links and colors that, that we've all known to, to grow and love. So then what is a web scraper? Well, a web, web scraper cancels out the actual browser component of what we just looked at. So the browser doesn't do anything special. All it does is it takes your clicks, your inputs, uh, and the text that you type in and navigate to what options you select and compiles it and compresses it into computer code that is sent to the server. Well, you can bypass the browser. You can just make the computer code yourself. And so that can go to the server. The server can't tell that it's coming from uh, a web scraper or coming from a real person. And so it returns just what it's been trained to return, which is HTML. Once you have that HTML, it can't be displayed in a browser because we're not using a browser. So you build something that can parse through all this HTML to actually get to what you're looking for. And then you can save that information into a database or you can do something else with it. So web scrapers are, are incredibly powerful. And some of the biggest groups out there use web scrapers, right? Google is the obvious big one, right? They scrape the entire internet. That's how they're able to identify all the cool things you want to look up. All the, the travel websites use web scrapers to identify the cheapest flights or the hotels that have available rooms. Uh, even Venmo, when you log in uh, and you want to connect Venmo to your bank account, Venmo has a web scraper that actually logs into your bank account to move funds in and out. So what is the legal kind of relationship to web scrapers? Well, one of the most prevalent ones and the most useful ones currently is to look up case information with a web scraper. So in Maryland, uh, where I'm originally from, we have a court website, a case lookup website from the court 
where you can type in a case number or a person's name and it'll give you limited information about that case. Uh, it's free, there's no login, it's just open to the public. And so you can type in a case number and get all this information about a criminal case. Well, all of that can be automated and a web scraper can be built to replicate your typing in a name, typing in an address, typing in a, a case number and pulling all that information. And then a parser, which kind of goes hand in hand with a web scraper, can be developed to pull out the specific information you want. So you're interested in a criminal case disposition, or the charges, or the defendant's address. The parser can pull that information out and put that into a database. So how do we wind up using this in kind of a realistic setting? Well, you build web scrapers into your intake system to create kind of an enhanced or automated intake process. So you can imagine a system where a client walks into your office or a client applies online for services. As soon as they type in enough information to be able to run an algorithm or run a, a web scraper, your case management system can use that pre-developed script to type to automatically go to the court case lookup website, type in the case number or their name and date of birth, find the information related to that case, bring it back and put it into all the relevant fields for your case management system. And many of these case management systems have processes that allow for third party apps or code injection uh, to kind of add this functionality to their intake process. So what this allows you to do is speed up the intake process dramatically and in the process to gather more accurate information. You don't have to rely on what the client's telling you and then later on look it up and realize that they, you know, they weren't sure of the actual disposition and they got it wrong. So you can think for an example, right, a, a client's being sued for failure to pay rent. The enhanced intake system could automatically scrape all the information about their case into your case management system. So now all of that is done instantaneously and you've saved time, you have more accurate data. Now, if, if you like what you just heard and you're kind of looking at areas where this might be of, of benefit to you, um, you want to think about legal areas where obviously the data is online and in a place that's usually easily accessible, right? It's on a nice government public website. There's no paywalls or logins. Um, and you want to think about cases that have lots of data related to it. So property is a great one. There's lots of property information out there, right? There's property tax websites. There's information about water bills, about uh, citations to your property. There's, there's all kinds of information related to property. So if you deal with a lot of property, that might be one specific area that you want to build web scrapers for to increase the efficiency of your case management system. Um, and then especially areas where uh, the, the clients get the terminology wrong. And we realize this in criminal cases where defendants will mistakenly think they were found not guilty but in reality, uh, their case was thrown out by the state. They received a null process. And to the, the client, the difference isn't all that great. But to, you know, if, depending on what you're, you're trying to do legally, that distinction can be really important. So now you have these data scrapers or these web scrapers, and you're collecting all this additional data. What else can we do with the current technology that's kind of within the realm of possibility for legal service providers? And this goes with for nonprofit legal service providers like legal aid groups, but also um, uh, law firms as well. So creating basic expert systems, right? These are just very simple systems designed to determine uh, certain legal outcomes or legal issues based on the data that you've now been able to scrape. So you get some uh, basic data from a data scraper, and then maybe you have one or two elements that you ask from the client, and you can have a basic system to uh, determine if the legal case they're looking at is worth taking or if it has some issue. So for instance, right, a client wants to appeal their loss of a civil case, right? They had some credit card debt they lost, they want to appeal. Your system can use a web scraper automatically built into the case management system to pull information about that civil case out of the court uh, lookup website. And then a simple expert system can determine if, you know, let's say the, the time from disposition uh, is is too to today is too too long. The client's already missed out on their opportunity to appeal. So you already have a legal determination to give to the client at that time. So there's a really a lot of really low hanging fruit in this area, right? There's lots of laws that have a lot of objectivity to them, right? Timeline requirements, uh, a certain order that documents have to be filed in. 
in order for the case to proceed correctly. All of these areas uh, can be automated with extra data from online and then a basic uh, kind of expert system designed to, to just crunch those few numbers. Where areas where this doesn't work, where you kind of want to avoid it are things like whether someone has is or is a threat to the community or whether or not somebody has been you know, rehabilitated. Those are very kind of subjective definitions and, and really difficult to build into some kind of algorithm, especially for low hanging fruit. So here's an example that I built when I worked at the Maryland Volunteer Lawyer Service. So if you're a new client, you come in, you apply online or you call the, the phone line and you want to get a criminal record expunged. Well, what the program will do is it'll use the name of the client and the date of birth and it'll use web scrapers to search all the, the criminal cases that person has had. That data is brought back. The whole criminal record is then brought back, parsed into the specific data elements needed for, our, for, ne for the next step, which is the expungement algorithm. The expungement algorithm runs through all the data points, right? They've received, in this case, a not guilty, you know, in 2015, and they haven't received anything since then. And it can identify which cases are eligible for expungement instantaneously without actually asking the client any information. Um, and this, is, this has sped up the process dramatically because previous to that, uh, each case would have to be looked up individually. The paralegals who answered the phone could do uh, very basic expungement determination, but a lot of it had to be done by an attorney later down. Uh, and then, you know, you could get to the end of the road and realize the client doesn't have any expungible cases. And we've just spent all of this time processing them as a client and looking up their record and passing it between different people. So the, the time savings can be really dramatic on something like this. Okay, right, this is a tech talk. Every tech talk has to mention artificial intelligence at least once. And so I want to try to identify in the near future, while maybe technically feasible today, I don't see it happening anytime soon, uh, but kind of in the near future, maybe five years, 10 years down the road, how legal service providers, both nonprofit and for-profit, may use AI in their intake system. So now that we have all of this data that's been scraped from various uh, court websites, we've built this kind of wealth of data, right? Uh, every client that's, that we've had, um, we've been able to scrape information on. And this is kind of a, a key interesting point is there's a, um, a real economy here to just running the scrapers on every client. So normally a client comes in asking for uh, expungement or eviction help. And for that specific client, you say, okay, let's go grab your criminal record to see if it's eligible. Well, what you realize is that you can actually run that web scraper on every client who comes in with any legal issue because running a web scraper is, uh, has a negligible cost. And so what you do is you start to build up this wealth of data about everybody's criminal record or everybody's property status or everybody's uh, you know, eviction status uh, and save it all into your case management system. And then your case management system has a whole bunch of really valuable information that you've added to it. Things about the case like how the case, uh, the outcome of the case, how different hearings wound up, different time frames associated with each one of those cases. Uh, and all of that data combined creates some really interesting possibilities. Because now what you can do, right, anytime you hear lots of data, the next words almost every time are AI. And so now you can use AI on this data in a very limited sense to try to figure out which cases um, uh, you can detect that a legal issue is in. And so you have all of the eviction cases you've ever handled. You know all these data points about them. You know when they, you know, they moved out of their house. You know uh, when their landlord filed for eviction. You know uh, when they called you. You have all these, this really important information. And you can compare all those eviction cases with all, say, you know, a handful of uh, cases that had nothing to do with eviction. And the AI program can try to identify the relevant differences between the two and create a program that can identify when somebody is facing that particular legal issue. And of course, this is very basic. So you, you know, there's a lot of hand holding that goes on with, uh, you know, where, where the attorneys or subject matter experts can come in and kind of tweak things as they go along. So here's an example. Uh, you know, you have somebody apply for legal assistance. Uh, you know, maybe they're looking for eviction help, or maybe they need. Uh, some kind of benefits claims help. 
So they type in, they go to the intake site, right? It's all online and they type in their name and date of birth. With just that information, we don't know why they're calling, we don't know anything else. We're able to search all these different websites using web scrapers, pull in all this information, and then ask the AI engine to compare that with other cases, right? And so we take a look at what the web scrapers brought back and there's people look up websites. So now we have a list of their prior addresses and some cities have uh, really interesting data points that are available. For instance, in Baltimore City, uh, your water bill is actually publicly available online. And so maybe, we, you know, the, the web scrapers identified there's a drop in the water bill. Uh, you can actually get cell phone location data, not for, usually for specific phones, but general activity in an area. And so if you can see that activity has gone down, maybe there's court records that show she was, you know, married four years ago. And, um, and the web scraper searched her Facebook profile picture and, and there's a picture of a child. And so all of those things combined compared uh, with the AI processing that has already happened, the AI program is able to, uh, without knowing anything else about this client, able to say there's an 85% chance of a divorce or a custody matter that this person either has or is here for. So what are the areas that are first going to be automated through this kind of basic AI system? So it's legal areas where there's like really telltale signs of a legal issue, right? And that could be for family law matters, right? If you can identify when uh, a married couple starts living separately, right? That's usually a really telltale sign. Now it's not always that obvious. Sometimes you get lucky, you can find some kind of uh, website where you can identify, you know, different addresses to, to a very accurate degree and that might give you some information. But sometimes you have to get uh, creative. And so there might be uh, data that suggests or gives inferences towards this, uh, you know, that there might be some kind of living separation issue that's just happened. Uh, and that can, you know, if you have enough of those kind of incidental data points, you can start to build a picture of what's going on. And it's important to remember this doesn't have to be 100%. It's not, the, the basic AI system doesn't take its uh, determination and then immediately start filing paperwork. All it needs to do is be confident enough to alert either the user to get some more information or the attorney to do some more investigating. And it needs to have a not, you know, it needs to be accurate enough that you're not wasting the attorney's time or the user's time, you know, finding all these false positives um, in order to be effective. So where does that naturally lead? Well, once we get the basic AI system under wraps, kind of the really low hanging fruit, I think we're gonna see kind of a, a, a loop happen here where it builds upon itself very quickly. So uh, once you start having this basic AI system works, attorneys are gonna see the benefit of continuing to build new scrapers, gather new data, figure out new ways to identify, you know, some of the factors in the AI that, that uh, tend to throw up the most false, false, false positives. Uh, and so you're going to start to fine tune these AI systems uh, in order to give kind of a grade of predictive power. And then eventually you're going to be able to give outcome prediction as well. So it's not only you have a child custody case probably, but also you stand a good chance of winning the child custody case. And I think these systems are closer than we think. I don't think we're going to see them, you know, uh, in the next five or 10 years. But I think after that, definitely within our lifetimes, uh, legal service providers are going to be using systems like this in limited areas to really identify when somebody applies for services, the legal issue they have and the chances of them actually winning that, that suit. So where does this kind of go from there, right? Once legal service providers realize that clients who come to them, they can use this tool on and identify not only what the legal issue they're probably here for, but any other legal issues that they may have that they don't even know about, right? Maybe you have expungeable cases from a long time ago and you don't even know, remember those criminal cases. And so people are gonna realize that you can actually turn this tool around and instead of scanning just people who come requesting help from you, you can actually scan the entire population as a whole trying to find those legal issues or clients that have those legal issues. And so this is going to create uh, kind of, you know, maps like this, where you can identify people to some degree, right? It's never going to be hundred percent with specific legal issues. So what's the, what's the next step after that? Once you identify this, the problem is you're going to have thousands of possible results, right? If you try to find everybody who's 
uh, potentially about to go through a child custody case where one side is represented one side isn't, right? That's a case usually that legal service providers will take on. Well, you're going to find thousands and thousands of people like that. So what's going to be the consequence of that is you're going to have to narrow down those results. And the easiest way to narrow them down are those that are easily winnable, the cases that have the highest chance of winning for the least amount of work, right? Well, that's going to result in helping the most people. Uh, and you're also going to have to try to be creative with your outreach, right? So you've identified these 1,000 people that have this eviction problem. And out of these 1,000 people, you've identified the 100 that have a clear case, easy to win, the landlord clearly broke the law, whatever it may be. Now you have to find a way to reach them. And so that's going to be tailored down even more, where you find the 100 easiest cases and the 100 easiest cases that have the easiest possibility to actually find those people people for whom you know, there's a cell phone number available, their address is consistent, whatever it may be. So after we've kind of turned this tool around, we've started identifying uh, potential clients that legal service providers will go after, what's the impact of this tool going to be? So when it comes to the intake process for legal service providers, uh, there's gonna be a a big focus on, on helping people who need help rather than helping those who are reaching out for help. And so you can, you can imagine a dramatic shift from having you know, large phone banks where paralegals answer and do intake and uh, you know, long lines at a physical kind of intake location for people kind of come in uh, with a cold kind of request and sit down with an attorney and explain what's going on. The much more kind of uh, uh, seductive approach is going to be, well, we need to have these thousand people we know we can help. Let's go try to find them because that's going to be a lot more fruitful than trying to wait for those thousand people to come in. So I anticipate that there'll be a switch from finding people with legal issues rather than helping people who come in requesting specific legal help. Uh, there's going to be a big focus on the easy to win cases and those people who are easiest to reach. Uh, and I, what this is going to cause is you're going to have a lot of cases that fit a similar mold, right? You know, whether it be uh, eviction or expungement or child custody, you're going to start handling a lot of cases that are, are very similar to each other. And this is going to create kind of uh, workflows. And workflows are going to kind of allow a case to go through the legal service provider in a very organized fashion. And it's going, you know, here's step one, you have to file this, and step two, you have to do this. That way you can streamline it very quickly without actually having to spend a lot of time re-looking up everything. You know, it's been a long time since you handled this type of case. What is the next thing you have to, to handle? Uh, and then there's going to be a lot of really interesting increased specific targeting uh, to find people who are, uh, the, who the program identifies. I think legal service providers are going to get very creative with this and uh, abilities to send out text messages, send out letters, uh, working with community organizations to find those people. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting how legal service providers work at trying to get those people. So how is all this going to get funded, right? This, this building AI programs and web scrapers and data is all very expensive. Well, my prediction is funders are going to love this they're gonna see an increase in the number of people being helped and a, uh, a decrease in the amount per client that it costs to help them, right? As you find the people with winnable cases, you're, you're able to boost those numbers of, of people you helped over the year. Uh, you're able to help increase the number of people that you helped. It's, the funders are gonna love this and it's gonna be a, a continuous loop where the more a legal service provider focuses on their AI program and finds easy to win cases, the more funding they get. And so naturally, the year after that, they're going to try to uh, continue down that road. And legal service providers that are perhaps kind of slow to the jump are going to realize that a lot of their funding is now headed to these groups that are using technology really efficiently to find people who need uh, legal assistance. Now, this is kind of very specific for nonprofit legal service providers in the access to justice realm. Uh, but I think you're going to find uh, something similar in the for-profit realm, where law firms that are able to identify people that need legal assistance and reach out to them before anybody else has any idea that that person needs legal help or before that person has reached out to anybody are going to get a lot more business very quickly. And instead of having to parse through all the clients who 
some who have winnable cases, some who don't, you're going to be able to reach out to the people that you have a, you know, a 90% confidence in have a legal case that's winnable. And so I think you're going to see private law firms uh, jump on board with this as well, just a different funding mechanism. So how is this going to affect staffing at legal service providers and I think at, um, at for-profit law firms as well? Well, once you start to get these workflows going and handling you know, lots and lots of cases with very procedural-like steps, going outside of that workflow is going to be very uh, costly. You're gonna have to get a subject matter expert in there to review exactly what you're trying to do. Uh, it's going to slow down the whole process. So there's going to be an incentive to, to get more cases that fit into this uh, workflow and to not kind of mess with, uh, mess with success. What this will mean is there's going to be less and less kind of legal thinking that goes into a case. It's going to be a very kind of a workflow or a tree diagram of what to do next, where uh, a non-attorney legal professional like a paralegal will be able to follow these flow charts and identify what the next step is or if they fall out of the workflow. So I think that what this is gonna cause is a bigger reliance on paralegals and a smaller reliance on attorneys. You're still gonna to get top subject matter experts who will be in demand, because they're gonna they're going to have to be brought on to help build some of these algorithms and these expert systems that are needed to run the AI kind of engine and the workflows here. But for the most part, uh, a regular attorney won't be needed quite as much. Um, and as this goes on, there's going to be identified certain areas in legal cases where there has to be some small interaction with the court. Maybe it's just a simple motion, you know, to compel something or show cause order that needs to be filed. And legal service providers are going to realize that that one piece of the court case doesn't actually need to be handled by an attorney. A paralegal can do that. And so I think there's going to be increased pressure from nonprofit legal service providers to put pressure on the court to allow paralegals to practice in more limited areas. Uh, and they're going to have some very good arguments of, you know, it's, this is an area that's very difficult to, to, to go wrong in. The consequences are very limited and can always be corrected. And there'll be some attorney in a tower somewhere who oversees everybody. Uh, and I think the courts are going to be compelled to do this because in the end, it's going to help more people and it's going to save money. Uh, and then finally, I think you're going to see more and more IT staff at legal service providers. You're going to have to build these algorithms, build these, this outreach software, build all the kind of connections that have to be made. And so while most legal service providers, especially nonprofit, where I'm most familiar, have you know, maybe one or two IT people, and their main job is just to make sure the case management system doesn't fall down, make sure everyone's Zoom account works. Um, but I think you're going to see a lot more IT staff brought on to build some of these creative tools and, and do some more out of the very basic necessi uh, IT necessary uh, kind of items that they normally do. The overall outcome, I think, is going to be less attorneys and more paralegals at uh, not only at nonprofit legal service providers. I think that's where it's going to be most prevalent. But I can also see something similar happening, happening at uh, for profit law firms. You can think of kind of the 2008 mortgage. Uh, mills that occurred, where you know uh, law firms would process you know thousands of foreclosure uh, documents every day, and I think you're going to see something like that, but in almost every area of law, and you're not going to need attorneys for each one of those steps, and so it's going to be less and less handled by attorneys, more and more handled by paralegals, which is just going to inevitably result in uh, less attorneys, more paralegals. So right, I, I've kind of gone over a lot of of potentially where this could go. And I just want to kind of recap with who I think some of the winners will be and who some of the losers will be. So uh, first I'll start with the winners. Paralegals, I think they're going to be much more in demand. I think they're going to be given more responsibility. Uh, and, and just overall, they're going to be much more needed. Uh, low income people with easy legal issues, I think are going to be one of the main winners for this. If you're a low-income person, you've been evicted, you don't know who to reach out to, you don't know what the process is, you don't even know you have a legal issue, um, these AI systems are gonna be able to identify you before you even know you have a problem and be able to reach out, the LSPs will be able to reach out and help you with your legal issue 
uh, without you having to do uh, very much. And so I think those people are definitely going to be one of the big winners in this system. Uh, IT staff and especially tech savvy attorneys, if you're an attorney and you can identify what can be automated, what can't be, how you can increase efficiency, I think you're going to uh, be in demand. There's always going to be work for you. And then, of course, you know, if you are a utilitarian, I think the population as a whole is going to benefit because you're going to help more people with more issues at the same cost or just slightly more than, than what you're doing now. So from a utilitarian perspective, I think there's going to be a, a big boost. Now, unfortunately, it's not only winners. Uh, here's some of the people that I think are going to lose out in this new technology access to justice world. Uh, low income people with difficult legal issues, there's going to be less and less room to help these people. I think there's always going to be an attorney for nonprofit legal service providers who are there to help, you know, the person with the really complicated case. But, uh, you know, that person's going to have 100 cases and, th and they're going to be very difficult to, to add to that stack. Uh, I think regular hired attorneys, these are attorneys, you know, maybe five or 10 years out of law school who, uh, you know, they know what they're doing. They're not necessarily subject matter experts. Um, but, the, you know, they go in, they, they, help their clients and they, they go home at the end of the day, I think they're gonna find it difficult unless they adapt to this new kind of automated system of helping clients. Uh, there's just not gonna be as much of a demand for uh, kind of a regular attorney using their critical thinking to, to help a legal issue. Privacy, I think is gonna go uh, you know, kind of out the window, right? You're gonna have all these people who have predictive scores on whether or not they're about to face a child custody case and you're going to send letters asking you know is this person you know we look we think you might be facing a one-sided representation divorce proceeding you know can we help you out with that uh lots of ethical issues that need to be dealt with but i think privacy is going to take a hit no matter what and then finally face-to-face -face interactions uh, i think are going to going to go down it's just kind of a consequence of automation and workflows is you need less and less from the client so there's less and less reason to meet with them uh and so if 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 you're a big proponent of kind of physically meeting with your attorney, I think that's gonna definitely take a hit. So I'll stop there and see if there's any questions uh, that anybody has, if anybody has any concerns about anything I said, or if, or if you wanna push back and say, you know, uh, that, that aided access to justice is on a totally different track and we're gonna see something totally different in, in two years. Might be a little quiet while people type a question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and if you're interested, uh, you can always uh, shoot me an email or on Twitter send um, send me a a message. I'm always happy to talk about legal tech stuff and interesting stuff like that. <laughs> I do like the comment in the chat box that says "Yay, IT staff." I, uh, I don't think IT staff are going away anytime soon. And what kind of while, you know, if anybody has any questions while you're uh, typing them in there, uh, I, I do believe we're going to see smaller law firms that aren't able to automate as some of these, this technology might be really expensive, uh, start to go by the wayside. There's going to be less and less uh, kind of the meat that small law firms rely on to go around. And uh, the, the law firms that are able to identify kind of that low hanging fruit, like wills and estates, stuff like that are gonna be able to identify and target those people before they ever come to kind of the small law firm that couldn't keep up technologically. So I think just by being in this uh, conference or the symposium, you're, you're already a step ahead of, of, of the game here. I think we have one question here. Um, do you foresee the need for changes to the rules of professional conduct regarding the solicitation of clients? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's a very gray, area right now and it one thing i've noticed is a lot of those rules don't apply for nonprofit legal service providers so i think there'll be less of a change uh, for access to justice nonprofits trying to reach out to clients but even even with them i think we're going to see some change uh, and and i think a lot of groups are going to take kind of the uber model of just you know especially if you're helping poor people just do it now and you know, we're going to ask for forgiveness and hope that, the, you know, the courts don't come after us because we're trying to find people who have legal issues that need our help. 
Uh, but yes, I, at some point, there's going to have to be an actual rule change. I think we're slowly headed that route. Um, but I, I also see it as almost inevitable, right? I mean, the, the rules to reach out and for solicitation were written so long ago that they don't quite make sense in the age of, uh, you know, sending a message via Twitter and, and all these other ways to reach out to people. And so, uh, it, yes, I, I see the change coming. Well, Mr. Stubenberg, we are at 3.55. Um, so thank you very much for joining us and giving us that presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next Access to Justice speaker, uh, Ms. Amanda Brown. I'm very excited to have her as we are both from Louisiana. Um, and she's the founder of Lanyap Law in Louisiana. And she's going to give a talk about how uh, Lanyap Law has used technology um, to reach a broader population and increase access to justice. So Ms. Brown. Let me unmute myself <laughs> uh, and give me a second to share my screen. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm sure you guys are tired of hearing that by now. <laughs> but it's the last presentation of the day. First off, thank you guys so much for having me. I've been on most of the day and this has really been a high quality um, symposium. So I'm really honored to be participating on this. Thanks to all the attendees for kind of hanging in there while, uh, while we get through this last a bit, but as Catherine said, my name is Amanda Brown. I'm the founder and executive director of Lanyap Law Lab, which is a Louisiana-based legal aid technology nonprofit. Um, we really work closely with legal aid organizations, access, just, access to justice commissions, courts, and other nonprofits that are um, dealing with legal or quasi-legal issues to help them implement technology. Um, so today, because of some of the work that I'm doing in Louisiana through the Justice for All project, I wanted to talk to you guys today about strategic planning and really the importance of that as a mechanism for facilitating not just access to justice, but for kind of transforming your own law firm um, into a tech enabled law firm. So we're going to talk really intensely, I think, about strategic planning and prioritization. I'm going to share some um, frameworks that you can use in your own firm, or if you're in a state, um, look at those for, for being able to strategically plan and prioritize legal technology initiatives in your firm or state. And then the second part, we will talk about some of the implementation, which can be a little bit more um, fun. I know when people hear strategic planning, it's not necessarily um, the sexiest topic, but I promise you, um, hopefully what I provide today will make it a little bit easier and more palatable for you and just give you a sense of direction about how you can do all the great things that these wonderful presenters have been talking about today. So to kick us off, of course, we're going to talk about strategic planning. And really, the key here is that it's super important. I'm not saying by any means that you can't test the water with different applications and um, try out technology implementations on an ad hoc basis. But to make a really meaningful and lasting impact, um, no matter in an access to justice context or in your own firm's context, you really do have to plan. You need to be planning on a project basis, of course, but having a bigger vision um, and strategic planning will really take you a lot further. Um, so, of course, we want to start with why. Why do you really want to strategically plan? Um, of course, law firms are already doing that um, just for their business purposes. But when we think about technology, of course, it's super important to be strategic in planning. Number one, for those typical reasons of resourcing, be it financial or human capital, um, those are kind of what you expect whenever you hear strategic planning. But for technology, there are a few other added benefits of doing that. Um, 
the first one is that I like to say you don't know what you don't know. And doing strategic planning really gives you an opportunity to figure that out. I've heard um, other presenters today talk about, you know, kind of looking and using what you already have in your firm, but especially if you're a bigger firm, you don't know perhaps what all of your attorneys are doing, what kind of workflows they're using, how, what, how they're using technology to enable their work. So this is a really good opportunity to find that out. Um, and another super important benefit of this is the change management aspect and the buy-in that's required to truly and meaningfully adopt technology in a law firm context. This is, I, I would have to say, one of the most critical pieces of technology in general is making sure that you have that buy-in because if you can imagine a scenario where you're spending thousands hundreds of thousands of dollars on technology for your firm, but you didn't consult anyone that you work with on how it might work best for them, they're not going to use it and it's going to be another failure. Um, I know that that happens in small law firms, it happens in big law firms, it happens in in-house, it happens in access to justice commissions, it happens everywhere. Um, and you've heard again through a numerous presentations today, the importance of getting the buy-in and feedback from people that you work with. And those are really keys to making it, making it a success. And that's one, one thing that strategic planning is really good about. And then finally, another really important reason is to just have a guiding star for your technology goals and for your team. Overall, I think just having a clear purpose and a plan for what is actually going on in the firm is really just gonna get people on board with the whole process. So in Louisiana, because I work in the access to justice space, um, strategic planning for us is done through this Justice for All initiative. So of course, some things in the Justice for All framework may not apply to private law firms, but really the three main buckets of work that are happening in this process absolutely do. If you think about it, we are foundationally providing the same services. We're providing legal services to the public. So it really is about, um, it's built around evaluating a lot of the core competencies of the civil justice system or insert law firm here and examining those gaps to help you build out an actual strategic plan. So really the key here is that we've, we're identifying the essential functions and capacities of our access to justice system or a law firm. That way we can evaluate it and ultimately improve it through the use of technology. Now, of course, Justice for All is not ex exclusively limited to technology and I'm continually calling back to the great points that have been made throughout the day um, that you may, it may not be a technology solution that you need for every single problem. And um, just keeping that in mind, that's another one of these benefits. So, but mostly all this means is understanding what you do and how you do it and where there are holes in it. So you can kind of strategically fill in those gaps. Um, through the Justice for All project, we kind of put our work into the three main buckets. So our first one is assessment. And for us, that really looked like formal surveys, some community listening sessions, and what I've kind of coined as a stakeholder summit, maybe for psychological reasons to get people excited about it. But um, this is really the place where you're figuring out what you don't know. For, for law firms, you may want to do a formal firm-wide firm -wide survey to understand what your employees' pain points are. And you could repurpose community listening sessions into smaller focus groups that are based on practice area or different staff levels or, you know, you kind of name it. You can slice and dice this a number of ways and whatever makes sense for you. Um, and then a stakeholder summit um, it might look more like a committee meeting in a law firm setting with someone that can really help you build a conversation around your goals and helping you fully assess where you are and what the gaps are and what 
challenges you are really facing in your firm or your um, access to justice ecosystem. But really an important piece of this is that you are actively and intentionally seeking out the opinions of those people that you work for and inventorying the tools and things that you already have in place. That way you're starting to generate that buy-in with the people that you're working with. And you're also kind of tucking away for um, later steps in the process, all of that good information about what systems you already have in place, what tools you have so that you can use those if you already have them. There's no sense in kind of reinventing the wheel when you have something already available to you that you can just tweak and modify and make a real big impact. There are a couple things here that I want to highlight. Um, I don't think it can be stressed enough that it's really important to have diversity in the stakeholders that you're serving. I, I say that because I think as law, law firms or lawyers, we tend to um, get stuck on lawyers and that's who we seek opinions of because they're just like us and they're gonna have different viewpoints, of course, but the reality is that um, as Ms. Vasley said earlier in the day, there are so many people that are a part of the process that really make the law firm go around from your support staff to your paralegals and um, your and even stakeholders that are outside the firm that you engage with. So it's really important to have that diversity. So you're getting a wide view of the issues and now we can actively and accurately um, plan better. And finally, the one comment I have on the stakeholder summit, I really don't want to imply that this is the only time that you're going to meet. Um, if you're going through this exercise, you're definitely going to be meeting more than once. Rather, I wanted it to be something that showcases that it's kind of a pivotal moment in an event where all the pieces are starting to come together and really gearing you up for the next phase of work, which is where kind of the meat of all this happens in actual strategic planning and prioritization exercises. Um, of course, the second stakeholder summit implies the same thing, where in this phase, we're really doing that kind of fun work where we're brainstorming. We've, we've started identifying what the problems are already in the assessment phase. And now we want to have some fun and see what kind of solutions we can come up with. And really, um, this is where things start taking shape, where it looks like we're actually going to make some progress on this and we're going to use technology. Um, so that's where that second summit comes in. This will probably look like another workshop with someone that can help facilitate the right kind of conversation. And in this phase, a lot of people use something that's called design thinking. I'm not sure. Um, I know some people are familiar with that as a concept, but in general, it's a way to kind of systematize um, problem solving. It runs through a, another kind of flow where you're kind of identifying the problem, brainstorming the actual solutions, and then iterating and prototyping on that. Um, I have provided a worksheet, and we will talk um, more deeply about this piece after I finish kind of capping, recapping the overall process, um, because that's really where the bulk of the work is happening. And then, Finally, in the implementation phase, this is where the, honestly, the real actual work begins. Um, this is where you're really starting to leverage all that buy-in that you've hopefully been creating in the assessment and the strategic planning phases and um, start to really plan and make actual changes. We're not going to talk too much about this, but at the end, we will do a little um, overview of some, a case study of some of the work that I've done and some of the tools that are really helpful in this space. So as I mentioned, as my, yes, we are in this phase where we're kind of identifying potential solutions and starting to prioritize our work. Um, I have these broken out because it's one thing to identify a bunch of issues, which honestly can start to feel a little overwhelming because you see, um, the magnitude of, I'll say opportunity, but just as important as it is to start pulling those out, it is as it is to prioritize them in a way that makes sense. Um, and that's actually effective and that creates impact for your firm. 
And I've kind of broken that out into four additional buckets of um, four different concepts. If you can tell, I think we all like buckets here in the legal tech space. Um, but just starting with the problem. Does it, did my slide advance? There we go. Okay, so the problem, this is really the heart of this evaluation framework. And the kind of key point here is that you wanna get really comfortable with the problem itself. Don't be scared of it. We want to dig really, really deep. That way we have a super narrow focus on what we actually need to solve. So um, in this evaluation framework, it is included in the materials that I've provided. Your topic really should be a broader bucket in which your, that function of your law firm falls into. So for example, one topic could be client engagement. And then you want to break that down even more into a smaller topic so a subtopic of client engagement could be intake or marketing. So this right here is a really important, um, this is why it's really important to identify your business's essential functions and however you might group those together. Um, but overall, the problem kind of phase of this exercise really requires you uh, writing down your own understanding of the problem, but also seeking out um, the opinions of other people. So that's reaching out to staff and those people that are doing the work every single day to get their thoughts. Because if you think about in a committee setting, sure, we've done this kind of survey and we know that this is a problem just generally. So um, you may come to that with your own kind of preconceived notions about what's causing that problem or what the hang up is. Um, so reaching out to those people on your staff that are doing that work is essential here. And then from there, of course, you've also heard, um, you really do want to try and document the current process as it is and not necessarily how you think it should be just yet. Um, that way you're, you have kind of this concrete idea of what the process is and it really gives you a lens into any inefficiencies that are there or, or redundancies that might be kind of problematic in um, creating waste or reducing efficiency overall. So, and, and that's also one of the reasons if you do that, you may understand that you don't necessarily need a technology solution. You might just really need a slight tweak in your process, you know, shift who's doing what, from a resourcing perspective. Um, so that those getting comfortable with the problem can really highlight um, what the actual issue is. And it may be something that you didn't actually think it was. It may morph as time goes on through this. And one thing that I did not add to this and I'm kind of kicking myself for not is that you should also try and look at look out for data sources that can give you insight into what the problem is and help inform your decision and prioritization later. So these really will highlight um, or and give you benchmarks and metrics later once you've kind of hopefully resolved the problem to to objectively compare that and make sure that your tool or your process improvement or whatever is actually doing what you think it should. Now in that next bucket of um, the solution, this is where the fun happens. It, I, I like to say it's really where you're starting to do your due diligence, but it's also about um, having people get into that kind of creative mode where they're trying to problem solve and develop that ideal solution. Um, so I really challenge people to either research before or after what exists out there. Um, you know, on what it could be said on one hand, if you research beforehand and try and figure out how other people are solving the specific problem that you've identified, it may kind of cloud your own judgment as to what a good solution is. Um, and then, but on the other hand, if you're doing brainstorming and you make it like super attached to your idea and your um, solution that researching what other people have, have done um, could be almost a little painful. So I'm not gonna make any recommendations one way or the other. I think that's up to you, but I do challenge people to, 
look outside and see what other firms are doing because chances are um, you're not the first person with this problem and it's really helpful to kind of see what other people are doing even if it's not something that you ultimately land on. Now in the execution phase this is really about um, nailing down the logistics of how your project might get done. So this stakeholders are going to have a major impact on the reality of any project. Again, we talked kind of ad nauseum about getting buy-in and making sure that people are on board with your technology solutions or whatever your changes may be because people are really kind of wedded to the way that they're doing things. And if they don't see it as being a problem, someone swooping in and saying, this is a problem and trying to change it just doesn't really go over well. So in this phase, I really do challenge people to try and think thoroughly about um, who's affected by this project, not just the immediate impact or the people that have to use your tool or be a part of this new workflow that you're designing, but um, those people that are affected by it, maybe they're just inconvenienced by it. So it's really thinking broadly about all the players and all the people that are impacted by it, because in the end, those are the people that you're gonna have to convince to try and um, get to make adoption a real success. So of course you wanna think really long and hard about who the project affects. And then you also need to set realistic expectations about resourcing, how the project can be funded, who is available to do the work, um, how long it will take, because all of those things are gonna be super important when you think about prioritizing down the road. Which brings me to the last piece of prioritization. So I, this piece is, is obviously very heavily influenced and informed by all the work that you've done already through those other phases. So I know it sounds like a lot, but um, realistically speaking, you're going to need to ask yourself these questions. And it's really about looking at how technically complex something is. Is this something that you can do with a no-code solution or are you really getting into the weeds um, and needing a, a completely custom solution because that's gonna affect the human resourcing that it takes to manage the project and it's gonna impact the financial commitment that you have. So I've kind of created this rating scale that's just a visual snapshot of all these different factors um, and, and from an implementation perspective this is really about change management and how how easily or how difficult you think it's going to be to get people to adopt this new way of work and sustainability is also extremely important in this so if you think from a project-based perspective you're going to have people working on the project while it lives but what happens once it's over who's going to keep managing it who's going to keep updating it or um, getting feedback and incorporating it or just uh, there's a, there are a number of things that can impact whether a project is sustainable and and that's going to play into whether you think it's worth it or not. In the end of the day this is all about balancing the feasibility of this project with kind of um, objective data points with the with the actual impact that it's, it's going to have. You don't want to sink a bunch of a bunch of time and resources into something that's not going to have a huge impact on the way that you're doing that specific task or that specific work. Okay, so now that you've kind of got a lens on what the strategic planning process can look like, um, of course, I will never say that there's one way to do anything. So if you see something in the previous um, discussion on strategic planning that's helpful that's great but if you think there's some parts that you need to modify that's good that all I want you to do is kind of put that hat on and realize how important strategic planning really is to um, long, long term sustainability and the success and adoption of technology projects because I think time and time again you hear that people set in their ways are really reluctant to change that. So you have to invest some time up front and to make that a reality. But 
now we've kind of got the strategic planning out of the way. Part of the fun, again, is implementation and prototyping. So in a technology space, um, prototyping is really important. And I, th I think it's more of a psychological shift than anything for attorneys because we are so, um, just based on the work that we have to do, we're kind of expecting everything has to be perfect once it's done. Um, you heard that with Chad Burton's waterfall methodology versus kind of the agile methodology and things definitely are shifting away from this kind of idea that everything has to be perfect before it can be released. So prototyping gives you space to be comfortable with that, with the knowledge that you're going to have to come back and you're going to have to make changes. So um, building something that's minimal, minimally viable to test your theory is really an essential piece to me of a successful implementation. You could kind of look at this as a lower risk version of your final product. Um, so of course, prototypes do not have to be technology. They could be new workflows, like we've said before. Um, you might find that a tweak in process might do just as much help as a technology solution would. So um, I encourage you to remember that and try that when it is appropriate. Um, and then in other cases, there may be some existing products that are super easy to onboard and then are really appropriate for you to just go ahead and you know, onboard, launch, and see what happens and see if you can custom configure it to yourself. Um, but for those that are more about developing technology-enabled workflows or designing specific experiences for people, there really are some good no-code solutions for you to test things out. And this is, I, I don't know, if you couldn't tell that I'm a planner, I will say that if you do prototyping well, a good chunk of the planning does happen up front. So that means later when you're hiring someone to develop your technology, um, it's going to be a lot easier because you've kind of fleshed out the details versus having to go back and forth with that developer on your final product while you're still trying to just validate whether the concept even works. So again, this is kind of a lower risk way of accomplishing what you want to, and you can always build upon it and expand it as you go. Um, but overall, kind of the reason that I'm a proponent of prototyping is it's number one, it's kind of in the ethos of technology, but number two, when you think about the bottom line, overall, higher, you're going to have higher costs if you're kind of going back and forth with the developer versus trying to figure some of the business requirements and some of the experience out yourself. And that's, you know, going to save a lot of time and frustration if you do it up front and do it well. So I'm going to use one of my own projects as a case study on this. Um, for a little bit over a year, I've been working with the Louisiana Bar Foundation to build out a civil legal aid triage system that we've called the Louisiana Civil Legal Navigator. And this is, I know in Matt's um, conversation, he was talking about internal expert systems where people can are guided down paths and getting the right kind of information. That's pretty much what this is all about, except it's for the general public. So really what we're trying to do is put a map on top of the wealth of legal information that is out there in Louisiana on Louisiana laws. We have a lot of really great content, but it's really hard to navigate that, number one, if you're already stressed about it, but number two, if you have no familiarity with a legal concept whatsoever, and what are the factors that might influence your case. So that's what this project is really all about. Um, and I would say the process for implementing and prototyping this is would be similar to something that you would do on a smaller scale on a law firm for let's just say, for example, kind of redesigning your intake process, which we heard also, um, and document automation. Um, as we go through this, keep in mind that I'm not a developer by any stretch of the imagination, but I have done all of this, you know, self-sufficiently um, with no code tools as a means to get something out there that we can start testing with the public, make sure that we're delivering helpful and useful information to people and ultimately expanding their access and understanding of the law. But again, as you'll see, there's kind of a good bit of planning that goes into this. 
So first, for any type of document automation, for any process improvement or any really other experience design period, it does really help to document your expected experience and all the different possibilities that might come out of that in some type of flowchart. I use Lucidchart. Um, it's fine. Uh, it's what I it's what I use. Uh, it's a little glitchy sometimes, but there are tons of other charting softwares out there um, that you can use. And I think there's something valuable about the visual aspects of it that really bring kind of your ideas to life. And you can really start seeing yourself and putting yourself in the shoes of the user through the use of visual aids like a flowchart. Um, so you do want to use that to document all the kind of decision points and the activities that people are going through. Um, and then, especially in document automation or other experience design, um, documenting those questions and how they might answer and how that impacts where they go in the entire experience. So I would just say, overall, I, I recommend um, visually mapping out your, your workflows. And that even can be said about um, you know, your existing workflows. You should do this as well, but also for the newer ones once you've kind of started that planning process. And I would say if this is too scary for you, you really can use an Excel sheet and kind of document your questions, your answer, and what that really does. Um, but it can get a little complicated for you know, bigger processes or user experiences. And it can be a little challenging to translate into some of those no code solutions like Document that you saw. Um, so having a visual aid compared with a, a great tool like Document will really speed up the process for you. So the key point that I'm really trying to make here is that you do a lot of the planning up front, build your proof of concept and everything will be great. <laughs> So the next piece after kind of building that logic flow was to put an interface on top of that. You can see here, this is not super glamorous or design heavy, um, but it works. All we want to do in our experience is ask questions and provide relevant legal information. And this might be the same goals that you have for employee training or a help desk or a number of different things. So there's no reason that those kind of things can't be at least tested with these um, kind of free or low cost, no code software. I do typically use a software called Community Lawyer. Um, that's just kind of what my first experience was. I think they're awesome, but Documate is obviously also an excellent tool. Um, that it's just great options. The point is that you want to easily, without any code, be able to um, put an interface on top of that kind of flowchart that you've built. So you can really start seeing that experience come to life in a technology um, project. And again, this helps you kind of validate the concept. You can share these with your internal team, start making tweaks to the questions if they're not eliciting the right kinds of information, make tweaks to the output all that stuff. So it really is helpful to do that and um, have a, a baseline understanding of what you need. That way you can take it to a developer and say, we've done all the hard work, can you please build this? Um, it's gonna save a lot of time and money on that, for that aspect. And then for us, because we are having multiple experiences, I use something called um, Webflow to help just build a simple front end and a website for our project. That way, when people click on the, the um, area that they need help with, they can go to the automated workflow that we've already created, but you get a full a sense of the entire end-to-end -end process that someone's experiencing before we go out and spend a bunch of money. So I know I'm coming up on time, but I am almost done. Um, overall, I think you kind of get the point that Planning up front is really important and building lightweight proof of concepts um, is, I think, one of the biggest pieces that ensures the success of legal technology projects, either from the perspective of your internal team or in my case, through the public and all of the stakeholders that I work with in Louisiana. Um, it does take, I know it does sound like a lot of work up front, and I'm not going to lie to you that there is a significant lift, especially because it's such a large project, but getting that feedback and incorporating it at this stage can really help you figure out what you actually need, 
get that buy-in and really make sure that your project is as successful and as long standing as possible. And all of that will save you money. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much, Ms. Brown. We'll leave it open for another minute to see if anyone has any questions. Well, Ms. Brown, thank you very much for coming to talk with us thank today. You. Um, and so this concludes the symposium. I just want to give um, a big round of applause to our speakers. I mean, they are from all over the country and really are on the cutting edge of implementing technology into the business practice of law, uh, whether it's public interest or a small law firm, um, really all over the place. So thank you so much to all our speakers. I'm very grateful to them for sticking with us with the date change and going virtual. Um, thank you to Carl Ham, our IT guru, who had, if it wasn't for him, this wouldn't have been able to be put on like this. Um, and thank you to thanks, all our attendees. Thanks, Catherine, and thanks to Jolt for blazing the trail as always. Thank you, and thank you to it for our attendees for sticking with us. Um, we will be sending out information on CLE um, credits. We're still in a back and forth conversation with the Virginia State Bar. Things have been a little delayed. Um, due to the circumstances. So we will be sending out forms for any credits we get um, accredited for. And again, thank you so much everyone for joining. I hope you have a wonderful weekend.